Cathedral, Academy of Ancients, Book Two, written by Avery Cross, narrated by Jack Ainsworth. Chapter One, Zack. My cell phone's vibrations on my nightstand woke me from a restless night of sleep. Nothing worse than cell phones buzzing on wooden furniture when you were trying to sleep. Not that I'd had a peaceful sleep since leaving campus for home over winter break. Every night for the past three weeks was the same. I'd see the dead coming toward me in briar, the fire catching, and both of us nearly dying. And then Hook ordered me to stay away from her for the final few weeks of the fall semester, and after we returned for the spring semester. No more mentoring her or teaching her about the spirit element. No more being with her. For the first time in years, I found a girl who I felt comfortable with, and although she drove me crazy at times, it was a good crazy. And now we'd both be thrown in the crypts if we were found even talking to each other, at least on campus. Not that my mom allowed me to see her at all during the winter break, threatened to magically ward me here if I even tried. Warding. Pretty much what being grounded was to human teens. Except for magic types like us. It was a lot more complicated. Warding was a spell that locked us in or out of a place. Mom said it was because of my own actions. But I sensed she was not so quietly voicing her dislike of Briar. Groggy, I flung my arm out of my covers, searching for my cell as it went off again. The sun's rays peeked through the dark curtain in my bedroom back home. It had to be late morning, but surprisingly Mom had been letting me keep to myself ever since getting home. She was worried about me after what had happened, that's what she said. Worried Dad's death hit me harder than she thought, and I was slipping. If that's what she wanted to think, fine. I refused to give her the full details of the past few weeks or the attack in the library. Hook had told her plenty, the rest I keep to myself. The people I needed, my brothers, were all off somewhere, somewhere that I couldn't reach them, still. I checked my cell and grinned, two messages from Briar. She had stayed on campus through the break, not wanting to head back to Texas. I offered her a chance to come with me, but she refused, worrying she'd make things worse for me at home. She was probably right, but it didn't stop me from regretting not just tossing her in the back seat of the car and taking off to get her away from Hook's watchful gaze. Her first message was a picture of Herbert sitting at the window, watching snowflakes fall. The second was her wanting to know why the hell there was snow inside the mountain. I laughed quietly to myself and texted her back that it was just snow. She should go out and play in it. The stream of annoyed faces she sent back had me laughing louder and wanting to get back there so I could... Could do what? The second we came near each other, I had no doubt Ivan would appear out of nowhere to haul one or both of us off to the crypts. I groaned, sinking back to my bed and glaring at the ceiling. One semester. I had to get through one semester before we didn't have to worry about Hook. Or at least, I didn't have to. But she had three years left at the Academy of Ancients. Three years on that campus. Alone. Zach, you up? Mom knocked on my door. I made breakfast. Or, well, lunch at this point. I grabbed my pillow and flattened it over my face for a few seconds, before I called back, Yeah, I'm up. Be out in a few minutes. You only have a few days left to break. I'd like to see your face a bit more, young man. I cringed, but I promised I'd be right down, and heard her walking away. I texted Briar again, telling her I'd be back in a few days. Nothing came in reply to that, and I wondered if maybe texting through the break had been a good idea after all. If we could just break it off, whatever this was, and both go our separate ways. That train of thought left me feeling empty, and my gut ached for two reasons. We found something down in those catacombs. We did, and we'd been almost killed for it. And two, two, I was not about to give up on a chance to be with Briar, the girl who set her feet on fire when we kissed. I was smiling as I grabbed some jeans and a shirt slammed my feet into shoes, ran my fingers through my hair, and left my room. The house was quiet, what with just me and Mom in it. 
Usually I'd spend most of the day with her, hanging out, fixing things around the house, talking about my military career that I'd be starting next fall, after graduation. The second I got home this time, she asked if I'd needed to talk to a shrink. Seriously? I was constantly waiting for another lecture. Even Christmas had been an overly quiet and dull affair, instead of loud and happy like it usually was. That day had ended with half a lecture before I'd left the room. Mom was famous for them, being a diplomat and all. Though by the end of the lectures, her voice wasn't all that calm. She'd said nothing to me about Briar most times, but as soon as I stepped into the kitchen, I wished I would have stayed upstairs a bit longer. She was drinking her coffee at the table, eyeing me like she was worried I was about to run out the door, screaming like a mad person. So, you ready to go back? She asked as I joined her at the table. I poured syrup on my stack of pancakes. Ready to get it over with, I muttered. And what about your finals? Did you study enough for the makeup exams? I was ready before. Hook didn't have to postpone them. She sighed, setting her coffee down and giving me that overworried mom look. Zack, you went through a pretty traumatic experience. Headmaster Hook did you a favor. I suggest you thank him for it instead of being angry with him. Hard not to be. They told me what happened, remember? And I have to say, I agree with the headmaster's decision. That girl, she's unstable. And the last thing I want to hear is how you were hurt because she was being careless. I slammed my fork down on my plate. Briar was not being careless, and she's far from unstable. Not what I heard. And who told you, huh? I worked with her every day, mother. I know exactly what she's capable of. I know how stable she really was. But the fire was caused by something out of her control. And out of mine, I cut her off sharply. I kept the majority of the details from Mom, but Hook had filled her in on the story he spread around campus. Briar and I were down in the catacombs, participating in inappropriate behavior, and her powers got away from her. It was total bullshit, but nearly everyone believed him. Hunter and Nyala were the only two still talking to Briar. Between the so-called attack on Carter and the fire in the library, she was public enemy number one right now, and she was there alone. I do not want you around her. Don't worry, Hook already made a new set of rules just for us. I shoved my plate away, no longer hungry. You finished lecturing me? Don't you need to get to the embassy? I thought I'd take your last few days off so we could talk. I rolled my eyes and huffed. Great, more time spent with her talking to me like I was five and not about to graduate from academy. I'm fine, Mom, really. You should get to work. She slammed her mug down, and inwardly I kicked myself. Zachary Pierce, you are going to drop this attitude of yours right now. In all your years of schooling, you have never gotten yourself into trouble. Never. Then this girl comes along, and now I'm getting phone calls from Hook, saying you're disruptive, that you're having a relationship with a student you're supposed to be mentoring. She ranted on, no longer trying to hide her anger. And if that's not enough, you two are found at the scene of the worst accident to ever happen on campus. Worst accident that you know of, I whispered. What was that? Nothing, Mom. It's nothing. She tapped her fingers on her mug, and a gust of air whipped around the kitchen, knocking glasses off the counter and blowing my hair around my face. The sound of glass breaking seemed to pull her from her anger, and the wind stopped immediately. You have one semester left, Zack. One. I would have thought you'd want to do your father proud and graduate at the top of your class. My jaw dropped, then I was on my feet. Don't use dad against me, I snapped. Don't you dare. I did nothing wrong this semester. Nothing. And I don't want to hear you talking about Briar anymore, all right? I'm 21, Mom. I'm not a kid. I know what the hell I'm doing. I stormed out of the kitchen. You get back here right now! No. I walked faster and charged out the front door, marched around the side of the house, then straight across the empty field that stretched out behind our house. I expected Mom to follow, but she stayed inside. 
Our house was on a large plot of land in the middle of nowhere, safer from Mom and Dad's summoning, well, mostly because of their tempers, and the grounds were warded for her safety because of her job and Dad's, not that his safety was anyone's concern anymore. I kicked at clumps of dirt as I went, my angry puffs of air fogging around my face. It was freezing, and I hadn't grabbed a coat. I shut my eyes for a second to clear my head, then let the spirit I summoned cover my body like a second skin. It wasn't warm like a fire, like Briar's fire, but it'd keep me from getting frostbite, at least. I found myself at the door of the greenhouse and stepped into the humid air, letting the second skin fall away as I slowly warmed back up. This place used to be filled with color, plants growing so large they burst out of their pots and hung over the edge of the raised beds. But it had been Dad's project, and Mom never found the heart to bring herself out here to keep it going. My brothers and I weren't home enough to take care of it, so now it was filled with half-dead plants, cracked and broken pots, and dingy glass windows that hadn't been seen through in a few years. I walked to the back where an old stone bench was crumbling around the edges and plopped down. Where the hell are you guys? I muttered as I pulled myself from my pocket and texted all three of my brothers, again. It was my daily ritual. At some point, I'd figured they'd get sick of my blowing up their phones, but so far they'd been silent. I'd asked Mom a few times if she knew where they were, but all she did was give me that worried look. I leaned my head back and closed my eyes, breathing the muggy air in. Just a few more days, and I'd be away from this hellhole and back in another one. My cell vibrated in my hand, and when I saw Briar's message, I clutched my cell in my fist so hard I expected it to break. Carter was up and walking around. He hadn't spoken to her, but he eyed her in the corridor for a few minutes, she told me, with a creepy-ass smile on his face. Carter, whom we'd both seen dead down in the catacombs. We hadn't risked it all break, just in case Hook considered this as being with her. But I called her now, imagining her freaking out alone in her quarters. Zack, she answered on the first ring, sounding out of breath. Hey, are you all right? Yeah, fine, just... He freaked me out is all. Standing out there, alone. And Hook? Or Ivan? She sighed, and I heard the creak of her desk chair. They're around, but they've left me alone. Everyone has, actually. It's like I have the plague. They'll get over it. Will they? Zack, they all think I tried to kill Carter and destroy the entire library. It's like I'm a time bomb walking around on campus, she said bitterly. I've spent the past few weeks texting you and talking to Herbert, feeling like a damned insane asylum patient. I got up and walked around the greenhouse needing to do something since I couldn't be right there with her. Absently, I started weeding an overgrown bed, digging around to find the actual plant that was meant to be there. Hydrangeas, I thought. You're not that crazy yet, I teased, hoping to hear her laugh. You have your moments. Set your feet on fire lately? Just a few, usually when I'm thinking about you. My chest grew tight, and I hung my head. Listen, I'm heading back to campus early, I decided suddenly. What? Why? Because you're going nuts there, and I don't like that Carter's just wandering around the halls when we both know it's not him. What is he, then? He's dead, right? She whispered. Won't his body start, I don't know, rotting away? I'm not exactly an expert on necromancy. And I'm banned from the library until the semester starts she informed me. And even then, I have to have a professor with me. Hook hasn't given you a new mentor, I asked, hoping I didn't sound jealous. Her laugh told me I failed. Not yet, but don't worry. I'm not the girl to fall for every mentor thrown her way. Damned right you're not. She burst out laughing harder, and I relaxed. I miss you. Pretty boring here with no one to mess with. Watching you scowl? And then try to give me a lecture, and then scowl again? I have scowling down to a science. Yeah, yeah, you do. Silence fell over the air, filled with all the words I wanted to say, but couldn't seem to get out of my mouth. 
The next few months were going to be the hardest of my academy career, and I had a feeling what we started last semester, finding those files, was far from over. I'm still coming back early. To do what? We can't exactly be seen together. And I might be okay with being considered a screw-up, but I'm not taking you down with me. I'll take my chances. No, don't you put that on me, she argued. You're about to graduate, and I... I gave you enough trouble. Maybe this is all for the best in the end. Her voice was strained, but I could tell she'd been thinking about it all break. Not happening, Shroud, so knock off that kind of talk right now. But no, not listening. We started this together, and I am not even close to being okay with just dropping our relationship because Hook thinks you're unstable. She mumbled something under her breath, but I missed it. When I asked, she said it was nothing, but I sensed a hint of fear in her words. Look, I just want to make sure you at least graduate and can move on with your career and whatever else you do in this magical world. I can take care of myself. Been doing it for a long-ass time. Yeah, and maybe it's time you let someone help you out. You sure you want to be seen with a psycho who plays with fire and breaks into people's heads? Who said I care about what people think? We'll figure it out, I promise. I'm not giving up on us yet, so don't you do it either. Promise? She kept quiet. I gripped my phone harder. Shroud, you're killing me here. I'm sorry, you're right. Promise, she said but there was a hint of uncertainty in her tone. I'll see you soon then. Stay away from Carter. Don't need to tell me twice. She trailed off, and I heard her chair creak. Hold on. Shroud? I waited anxiously, but there was no sound on the other end of the line. I paced up and down the plant beds, waiting for her to come back on the line, when I heard a door thrown open and something smashing into the wall. Shroud, what are you doing? A door slammed shut, and then she was back on the line, swearing in a way that made me smile, or would have, if I wasn't worried about what just happened. Sorry, heard something outside my door. Thought it was Carter, but the hall's empty. I was moving for the door to the greenhouse before she even stopped talking. I'm heading back right now. Stay in your room if you can. Zack, if you're going to argue with me, save your breath. No, I was just going to say, be careful, please. My hand paused as I reached for the door. I will, Shroud. Don't worry about me. I'm your mentor, right? I'm supposed to watch out for you. Ex-mentor. In title only. I take my duties very seriously. She chuckled. Don't I know it. All right, see you soon then. Somehow. Leave it to me. I wanted to say more, but there was nothing left to say. Going through several traumatic experiences with Briar made me really look at how I felt about her. But the last thing I wanted was for us to move too fast and realize it was all adrenaline from this craziness we found ourselves in. Text you when I get there. I finished lamely and hung up. Back at the house, Mom was nowhere to be found, and there was a note taped to my bedroom door. She went into work after all, and she said she'd see me later so we could have a more in-depth discussion about my future. Not if I'm not here. I jotted down my own note before I ducked into my bedroom to pack. Four and a half months. I had to survive through four and a half months, and then I'd be out of academy, and Hook couldn't tell me to do a damned thing. But that also meant my time was limited to solve the mystery of the missing students, and who the Briar doppelganger was. It was a tall order, but I'd never been so motivated to get answers in my life. If only my brothers could see me now. I was pretty sure they'd be proud of all the shit I was about to stir up. Chapter 2 Briar Please tell me you did not spend all break talking to Herbert. I spun around at the sound and saw Nyala in the doorway and rushed to hug her. You have no idea how boring it's been. Another human! Are you real? I lifted her hair and studied it closely. Oh my god, you are real! I'm saved! It couldn't have been that bad. She laughed and dumped her bag on my bed. Eh, on the bright side, I finally caught up on all the readings Zach gave me last semester. That's good, she agreed. What else with you and Zach? She waggled her eyebrows. 
but when I plopped on my bed with an aggravated groan, she frowned. What's wrong? Nothing, it's just... He came back a few days early, and I can't actually see him. I can't believe Hook is forcing you to a part like this. Feels like that goes against some moral code or something. Student welfare and whatnot. Sadly, not. Herbert flew about the room until he landed on my shoulder. All I'd managed to do was see Zack outside the dorm building when he first arrived. His eyes had found mine like they were drawn to me. Then he'd smiled. But that was it. He was on the top floor of this building. So close. But the first day when I attempted to go see him, I found Ivan lurking in the corridor outside Zack's quarters. I'd had to hightail it back to my room before he saw me and told Hook. They're watching us, I whispered. You're serious? She glanced at the door, then back to me. This is terrible. You didn't start that fire. Not what they say, and not what everyone else believes. But that was several weeks ago, and it's not like you burned down Academy while we were all away on winter break, right? She joined me on my bed, and Herbert flew off to land on her open palm. Anything else going on while I was gone? I tilted my head back and forth, debating on telling her, but she'd find out sooner or later. Carter's up and walking around. She shuddered, and I shared her sentiment. After the incident in the library and being told I couldn't talk to Zack, I'd recounted every last detail about the attack to Nyala, leaving out my conversation with General Derek Morris. At first I'd worried about dragging her any deeper into this dangerous situation, but I had to confide in someone who believed me. She'd even tried to get back down to the catacombs to see if anything was left, but the entire lower level was blocked off. Over break, she promised to do some digging and researching of the names I could remember, but after a week she'd texted me and related stuff I already knew. None of the names yielded any information. Nothing at all. Like they didn't even exist. Worst of all, I had no idea who that girl was who looked exactly like me. We had to be related. After General Morris's reaction when I asked him about kids, the notion that I was his daughter stuck with me. Briar, feet, Nyala said absentmindedly. I glanced at my feet, currently covered with flames writhing and making a vine, and I grunted as I pulled the fire back into me. Sorry, that's been happening a lot lately. Don't get mad when I say this, but if you want everyone to start believing you're stable, you might want to get a better handle on starting fires when you're a bit emotional, she advised, getting up to unpack her bag. No, I know. I nibbled my bottom lip, not sure if I should tell her what was really bothering me, or at least bothering me more than just not being able to see Zack. General Morris was still here, living on campus as Hook's guest. His threat hung over my head every day he stayed. Each time I texted Zack, I almost told him, but he was stressed out enough. That, and I had the feeling he might do something stupid, like confront the general himself. Zack and I had both changed since the beginning of my first semester here, and his protective instincts were pretty obvious to me now. He would do anything to protect me, but I wasn't willing to let him fall any lower because of me. All right, spill, Nyala demanded, standing right in front of me. What's bugging you? You know what? No, there's something else. What are you trying to hide? And don't lie to me, please. I feel we both have a little more respect for each other than to resort to lying. I avoided her intense stare for a whole thirty seconds before she started tapping her toe annoyingly loud. All right, all right, fine. But what I tell you cannot leave this room, got it? And you can't tell Zack. Not a word. Her brow furrowed at the harshness of my words. Pryor, what else happened to you? When I was recovering in the infirmary, I started. Hook came in and talked to me. Yeah, I know that part. And you saw that General Morris guy. I cringed. I might have asked him outright if he had any kids, which pissed him off. Why would you do that? I thought you guys were worried about the wrong people finding out about those files. The girl's last name is Morris Nyala. The question just sort of came out. That, and I might have been trying to get back at him. For what? For threatening to take me away for some military experiment if I stepped out of bounds. Her mouth fell open, and she stared at me in disbelief. They can't do that! That's what I said, too, but I was informed otherwise. 
Not like I have a family who's going to ask questions if I disappear, I reminded her. He and Hook made it very clear that if they were going to throw me out of academy for attacking another student or breaking his damned rules about me and Zack, he'd hand me over to Morris, no questions asked. Apparently, I went on, nervously pulling a thread on my blanket, they find my ability to astral project into someone's mind extremely appealing. Nyala cursed, something she rarely did. I smiled. Why are you smiling? This isn't funny. No, it's not. But realizing how much I rubbed off on you is... She puffed out her cheeks, then broke into a grin, too. You couldn't have just come here and been normal like the rest of us, huh? Guess not. Just making waves and best friends wherever I go. Really, though, why haven't you told Zack? His family's big in the military. I doubt he would let you vanish without a trace, she assured me. I texted him all break, and he hasn't heard back from any of his brothers. I glanced at my phone on my nightstand now, hating that was the only way I could communicate with him. And from the tiny bit I wheedled out of him, his mom is far from happy with my influence over her son. Seems to think I should have stayed in Texas. Too much of a rebel for her liking. Nice. Pissing off the mom of your boyfriend already. Good job. She patted me on the shoulder. I rolled my eyes. We're not exactly a couple. You aren't? Huh. Could have fooled me. How are we supposed to be a couple when we can't even be in the same room together? So? You have a long-distance relationship while you're, what, three floors apart? I stared at her blankly. What? It's going to be fine. Look, do we need to start having those optimistic conversations again so you don't brood the entire semester? I can't see Zach, and I might be carted off for secret military experiments. Not a lot to be positive about. Nyala's smile fell, and I realized this whole time she'd been keeping up the happy mood for my sake. I won't let them take you away, and Zach won't either. You have to tell him, and you have to do it soon. No. No? Briar, you're scared. Hell, I'm scared for you. Tell him, please. I'd been scared since I woke up in that infirmary and realized Zack wasn't there. He left Academy without even saying goodbye, leaving me alone in this place. Yeah, I'd been scared shitless that first week. Jake had begged me to come home to Texas for the winter, saying he was worried about me. But I'd lied and told him everything was working out great at my new school. Jake? He seemed like a distant memory now. We'd been roommates in our foster home, roommates and best friends. I'd had a crush on him, unrequited, naturally. But now, looking at my feelings for Zach, I realized that what I'd felt for Jake was puppy love. Kids stuff. I'd kept a secret from everyone. The part about Hook and Morris giving me strict instructions that I was on lockdown. Hadn't told anyone that, and I wasn't going to. I went to bed those first few nights, wondering if I would be in the same place when I woke up, or if government summoners were going to steal me away, or worse, the dead were going to find me and finish the job they started in the library. To say I was scared was an understatement, but I never showed fear. It was a weakness. I was the unbreakable briar shroud, and that was exactly who I was going to be right now. If I feel like the situation's getting out of hand, I will. Yeah, because it's not already out of hand. Nyala, don't tell him. Please? I clasped my hands together and pouted, giving her the saddest eyes I could, until she sagged, giving in. Fine, but you at least have to tell me everything. Someone has to know if there's a chance you're going to disappear. She muttered, digging around in her bag, then pulling out her toiletry bag. I'm going to take a shower, and then you and I are grabbing some food. I'm starving. Being around the rest of the students wasn't exactly the top of my to-do list, and I groaned in protest, falling back onto my bed and burying my head under my pillow. You have to go back to your classes eventually, she sang as she went out the door. Doesn't mean I have to like it, I yelled after her, but she was already gone. I threw my pillow to the foot of my bed, and watched Herbert flying around the ceiling until Nyala eventually made it back from the bathroom, all done up and looking cute as always. She asked if I was going to change out of my typical jeans and black t-shirt, Zach's sweatshirt in hand, but I was walking to the door with a grimace on my face. 
Just thought you might want to change it up a bit. We chatted through the dorms and across the lawn, with me complaining about the few inches of snow covering the ground. I had no coat and had to make do with wearing the hoodie I still had from Zach. Nyella made a doe-eyed, lovey-dovey face when I pulled it on, but thankfully dropped the matter after I gave her a look. If I couldn't be around Zach, at least I had this to keep me warm. I mentally cringed, realizing how sappy that was, but it was the only real comfort I had at the moment. The second we stepped into the dining hall, a hush fell over the tables. I started to back away, but Nyala grabbed my arm, not slowing down our conversation at all, and dragged me to our usual spot. I sat down, and everyone scooted away. This is going to be hell, I muttered, glaring down at my plate. Who cares what they think, right? You know what really happened, and that's what matters. You're right. Doesn't make it any easier. Nyala loaded up my plate with potatoes, steak, and corn before she did the same to her own and talked as if not a thing in the world was wrong. I really did not deserve a friend like her. Dinner wasn't as bad as I expected, and being looked at like I was going to suddenly try to set the place on fire was almost entertaining. A couple of girls, first years like me, ones who'd hung out with Carter last semester, kept whispering behind their hands. They sat at another table, right in my line of sight. I shouldn't have done it, but what can I say? I was looking for a tiny bit of fun. I lifted my gaze, so my eyes locked onto one of the girls. I winked, and with one hand under the table and out of sight, I snapped my fingers. The roll in her hand sparked, and she dropped it with a yelp. Everyone turned to stare at her as she pointed at me, but I dug into my food, ignoring everyone. Nyala kicked me under the table. What? I said, failing to hold back my laughter as the girls stormed out of the hall. She tried to look angry, but then she burst out laughing too. I see you spent the whole break practicing your summoning. Had nothing else to do. Fire's coming pretty easy now. It's the other one I'm a bit scared to use. And without Zach to guide me this semester, I highly doubted I was going to get anywhere with those lessons. Professor Woods is pretty great, or at least that's what I've heard. Hmm, I'm sure he'll be just fine. He just wasn't Zack. He wasn't the one who pushed me until I found my center and started to realize the possibilities I had within me. No one ever pushed me like that before. Ever. Jake had given me encouragement, but that was about it. Zack showed me how strong I was on my own. We finished dinner and left the dining hall, with me looking for Zack the whole time. You'll see him around, Nyala said quietly, as we were ready to leave the main building. Hook and Ivan can't keep an eye on the two of you all the time. Something tells me he can. Oh shit, sorry, I muttered as I walked right into a very solid body. Always causing trouble, Shroud. Zack. My heart pounded in my chest and his hands lingered on my arms. Our eyes met and I was more than ready to tell Hook to go screw his rules and throw myself in Zack's arms. But then he blinked, and his relieved smile disappeared. His gaze darkened, and he walked away as fast as he could toward the dining hall. I turned to watch him, and my blood ran cold to catch Ivan there, watching Zack enter the hall, before Ivan turned that glare on me. I almost flipped him off, but Nyala grabbed my arm and dragged me away. Okay, maybe you're right she muttered. They can't really expect you both to just stay away from each other every single day. Hook has everyone convinced I'm unstable and that being with Zack makes it worse. That's crap. If anything, he makes you better. That's what I said. I sighed. But I'm not the Academy's headmaster, just the crazy girl with gifts she doesn't understand yet. Whatever. Zack graduates at the end of the semester. You can't hold out that long. Neither of you can. What choice do we have? I stared back over the lawn before we entered our dorm building, thinking about how the next few months were going to hit me harder than almost anything else in my life had. I'd gotten used to a mom who didn't give a shit, and a dad who wasn't there. Friends who weren't really my friends. I'd gotten used to just being Briar, alone, all the time. And then along came Zach. I sighed. I let myself get comfortable with having that person in my life I could talk to as a friend, but was more than just a friend. And now, now when my life was starting to go to crazy town, 
I was told I couldn't be around him. Yeah, the next few months were going to suck, but I was not going to let Hook or Ivan or the man who might be my dad know just how bad they were all getting to me. I was an unbreakable force, right? Time to prove it. I watched at my window until I saw Zack and Hunter finally leave the main building. All right, Herbert, I said to the paper crane as he fluttered around my face. You know what to do. I opened the window enough for him to slip out. His small white body dove toward Zack. Herbert flew around Zack's head, and he stopped, smiling at the side of the paper crane. I rested against the window, wishing I could be out there instead of Herbert, but I wanted Zack to know how much I was thinking of him. Herbert landed on his shoulder and rested his small head against Zack's neck for a few seconds. Zack's lips moved, then Herbert took flight again and came back toward the window. Zack's cerulean gaze followed Herbert, and when his eyes met mine, he pressed his fingers to his lips and winked. I opened the window again as Herbert reached it, and he landed on my shoulder. I'll be right there, Briar. Zack's whispered voice came from Herbert. I jumped at first, startled. Then I sagged against the wall by the window. It wasn't the embrace I wanted, but damn, did those words make me feel better. I watched him until he and his best friend and roommate, Hunter, entered the building. I had to hold on to the windowsill so I wouldn't run out there and try to bump into him again. Tomorrow was the start of the second semester. I had more to prove this time around than I did the first few months I was here. Hook and Morris were waiting for me to mess up. I would have to be the perfect pupil, so neither one had reason to keep a constant watch on me. Yeah, because I was so used to not being the rebellious kind. Chapter 3 Zack I'd taken care of my makeup finals when I came back early, using them as my excuse to be there. Hook obviously saw through my intentions, but so far hadn't said anything to me about last semester's events. The first few days of classes were more difficult than I anticipated, and the end of January slipped into February. I used to look forward to seeing Briar in the afternoon and helping her with her summoning, but now I had to watch from the trees as Professor Woods picked up the instruction. I leaned against a tree, admiring her almost perfect meditation posture now. At least in the stone circle, there was no snow, so she could sit down and be comfortable and not freeze her ass off. Earlier during her fire training, she'd done spectacularly, and soon she'd probably be one at the top in her class. But as Professor Woods started in on their first real lesson, Briar stumbled, her shoulders sagging, and from the way he flinched, she was probably cursing quite vividly. I grinned, wondering when the fires would start to appear around her. She's come a long way, hasn't she? My body went rigid at the sound of that voice, familiar and yet not familiar at the same time. His voice was off, and I gritted my teeth as he moved into view. Carter. I read his aura, and then read it again. That wasn't right. It couldn't be. I uncrossed my arms as I pushed off the tree to face him fully. He was watching Briar with a strange, detached gaze. His eyes were almost vacant if I looked right in them, and for a few seconds I wasn't even sure he'd realized I'd shifted so I was blocking his view of Briar. Then his cold eyes flicked my way, and I planted my feet, not about to back down. He leered at me suddenly and casually shoved his hands in his pockets. Don't worry, Zachary. I'm not going to try and steal her away from you. Not that you can really have her anyway, right? What with Hook's new rules and all. Pity, really. She's a great catch. What do you want? I snapped. What do I want? Funny question, isn't it? What do I want? I tried to read his aura again, but each time the results were the same. His aura was a stark white against a stark black, something I'd never seen before. It just wasn't possible. You can keep reading it, but it won't change, he whispered and leaned in and winked. What are you? I asked but he shifted his gaze back to Briar. I considered taking him out right there, but the goal was not to attract attention this semester, so Briar and I could get through it in one piece. He flattened a hand to his chest, mockingly feigning shock. I have no idea what you're talking about. 
I'm probably still just recovering from what your girlfriend did to me. You know, throwing herself inside my mind and all. She's dangerous, Zachary. Really, I think you should second-guess your relationship with her. How about you take a walk? He smirked and bowed his head. As you wish, my Lord Pierce. Don't worry. I'll be around to look after her when you graduate. He waved over his shoulder as he strode away, whistling as if he hadn't a care in the world. How could Hook not realize that was not Carter? Not the real Carter, anyway. I was too busy watching him walk away, then making sure he didn't come back to spy on Briar again. I didn't notice Professor Woods standing right beside me, until he cleared his throat loudly, making me jump. If I were any other professor, I might not be so understanding, he stated. Yeah, I know, I muttered, turning around in time to witness Briar leaving the stone circle. She spotted me, her lips twitching in a smile, before she hurried across the lawn and out of sight. I sighed, and Woods patted me on the shoulder. You know this is all horseshit, right? What Hook's saying about her? Woods scratched at his frizzled white and gray beard that hung to his chest. The rest of his head was bald. He said it helped him connect better with spirit, but I knew it was because he'd had a horrible receding hairline and got tired of seeing it. He'd confessed that to me one time when I'd asked if I should shave my head or not, as a joke, and he had dark eyes, like a storm brewing. They always seemed friendly at first glance, but there was a calculating look if they were observed close enough. Always thinking, that's the type of man he was. All I know is what the other professors and I were told, he started. I opened my mouth to argue, but he held up his hand. However, I also know you quite well, he continued. And? He pursed his lips as he adjusted his heavy fleece jacket. It's horse shit. You think you could talk to Hook? Ha! <laughs> and what would an old geezer like me say to him that'd make him change his mind, huh? Headmaster Hook is very well liked, Zack and he's got the thickest skull of any man I've ever met. Woods tugged on his beard, shaking his head. I'm afraid the two of you are just going to have to play this out. Yeah, not exactly what I was wanting to hear. Just be careful, Zack. Woods warned quietly. I heard a tinge of worry in his voice. Of Hook or Ivan? They're not the only ones at Academy you need to be on the lookout for, he said as he nodded, staring out across the courtyard. I followed his gaze to see Headmaster Hook walking along the lawns, accompanied by a man in a black military long coat, three red stripes and three silver pins on each shoulder. I frowned. General? What's he doing here? General Morris, I believe is his name, Woods told me. And I'm not exactly sure. He's been here all winter break, and from what I've heard, he has no intention of leaving any time soon. I'll see you bright and early for your training. Though there's not much left to teach you. There is always something to learn, I murmured quietly to myself after he'd walked away. In about an hour, Briar would be headed to the hall to eat, and I planned on being there at the same time. But when I was close to the dorm building, Ivan stepped around the corner. Headmaster Hook would like a word with you. Right now? I thought he was busy with General Morris. Anything going on we all need to know about? Having a general on campus was usually a big deal, and often meant they were looking for recruits, or those with special talents, to discuss options for their two years of required service. The military was always trying to steal away the best and brightest. But Hook hadn't made any mention at the start of term that we'd have a military officer staying with us for any length of time. After the untimely death of General Thomas Addy, the military has seen fit to place a high-ranking official at every higher learning institution for a time. Ivan explained shortly, his tone indicating I wouldn't get anything else out of him on the matter. And Headmaster Hook will meet you in one hour at the Spirit Summoning Circle. Out here? Why not his office? But Ivan turned and stalked away. Fine, keep your secrets, you brute bastard. I muttered and trudged inside. When I reached Briar's floor, I decided to cut through it to get to the other stairwell. I searched for her amongst the crowd of students heading back to their rooms or out to the dining hall for dinner. I was almost at the stairs without having seen her, when Herbert flew in front of my face. He zipped and dove to get my attention, and I spun around. Briar was only twenty feet away, watching me as she talked to Nyala. 
She smiled brightly, and I returned it. There was no Ivan or Hook around, but Carter, as well as several other mentors, who were closer to Hook than they were to me, were also in the hall. If I made a move toward her, someone would tell Hook. Instead, I held my hand out for Herbert, and he landed on my palm. Your fire's looking damned good, but you might want to keep working on your meditating. I whispered to Herbert, then sent him back to her, waiting for the look I was sure to get. The paper crane rested on her shoulder, and the second she heard my message, her eyes narrowed, and she scowled at me, but only for a few seconds before she burst out laughing and flipped me off. I smirked and continued toward the stairs. There's gotta be a way around this, Hunter told me the second I stepped into our rooms. Way around what? You're kidding, right? You look miserable. You both do. Have you thought about sneaking out to see her at night? I have, but I doubt Hook wouldn't think of that, too. Hunter shrugged. Won't know till you try, right? Guess not. Have to go meet with a man himself in an hour, anyway. What the hell for? You haven't done anything. He ranted. Had to love Hunter. When the fire happened, he was one of the few friends who told off a number of students who believed Briar and I had started the fire because things got a bit out of hand in our relationship department. I didn't care what they all thought about me. But Briar. I did not want them talking about her. Not that way. He was almost more pissed off than I was about the whole situation. Dunno. But I did notice a certain General Morris walking around campus. There's a general here? He scratched his head, then paused. Morris? Wasn't that the last name of the girl you said looks exactly like Briar? Yeah, and he's here to keep up some sort of military presence after Addie's murder, or at least that's what Ivan said. There had to be more to it than that. I knew he was here at the end of last semester to investigate the fire and what happened with Carter, but I expected him to go home. I never spoke to him, and Briar never said a word about seeing him either. Just another mystery to add to the pile. I checked my cell, texting my brothers again, because damn, there was still no word from them. And then I waited anxiously until the time came to see Hook. Hunter left me for the dining hall once we were outside, and I made my way toward the summoning circle. There was no sign of Hook yet, so I stepped inside and cleared my mind the best I could. The first couple of weeks back had been uneventful, and gave me false expectations that maybe this semester wouldn't be as bad as I assumed. But then, seeing Carter today, and seeing his aura, well, I couldn't even begin to explain how impossible that was. White and black, no intermingling, no other colors, just two stark opposites. That just didn't happen. It just didn't. Mind cleared as much as I could get it, I held out my hands toward the willow tree I was facing and pushed out with the spirit flowing through my body and out my palms. The branches twitched then and fluttered with movement. I shifted my hands to the right, and the tree mirrored my actions, until I pivoted and faced another tree, and finally the third one, until all the branches swayed and moved as if a steady wind blew across the lawn. I always did admire the beauty of this element, Hook said from behind me. I immediately pulled the spirit back to form an invisible shield around me. His brow arched at the move, but he said nothing about it, didn't even enter the circle. Alas, I was chosen by fire. Fire can be beautiful when it's not destructive, I said, knowing how much I enjoyed watching Briar use her fire. Something Miss Shroud still needs to learn. I kept my mouth clamped shut so I wouldn't say something I'd regret. Spirit has a fluidity, almost like air, but there's so much more to it, a focus of the mind to move objects without even lifting a finger, or to shield yourself. Was there something I could help you with, Headmaster Hook? I urged him to get to the point quicker. I've been following your rules, as has Briar. We've been focusing on our classes. Is there something I missed? Hook walked around the stones, his hands clasped behind his back. No, I merely wanted to check in, and ensure your first weeks back are going well, and simply to remind you of the rules. Everything is just fine. Oh, I'm sure it is, but I've heard whispers of you watching over Briar. 
You know Professor Woods is going to take over role of mentor, so there is no need for you to worry yourself. I was simply out taking a walk. And your talk with Carter? I tilted my head, trying and apparently failing to look innocent. He came up to me, not the other way round. We were having a friendly chat. Hook stopped and faced me directly. That's not how he says it. Seriously? Yes, and I'm afraid I'm adding one more rule to your list. Do not interact with Carter. Understood? Yeah, fine, not a problem. I crossed my arms. Good. I'm happy we understand one another. I would hate for your family to see you like this, tarnishing the Pierce name over a simple misunderstanding. He started to leave when I called him back. Yes, Zachary? Is General Morris going to be speaking with me? Hook frowned. I'm afraid I don't understand your question. If there's a general at Academy, usually it's to speak with students about serving their two years with the military. I was just curious when he was going to start speaking with all the prospective candidates. The seconds ticked by, and the tension between us grew heavy. Tiny flames appeared in the depths of his eyes, and I was surprised. Out of all the years I'd known Hook, and my brothers had known him, not once had any of us ever mentioned his coming remotely close to losing control. Right now, as he stared me down, I sensed he was very, very close. I'm afraid General Morris is here on other business, he finally stated, and that is all I will say on the matter. Good evening, Zachary, and remember what I told you. I said nothing as he walked away. General Morris was here for a reason, and I was going to figure it out sooner or later. Hook and Ivan could lie all they wanted, but I'd never take anything they told me at face value. Not any more. I stayed in the stone circle a while longer, practicing my summoning as an excuse to be alone and to give myself time to think. To plan. The catacombs were gone, burned away in the attack. But those files couldn't be the only proof around here. If I were my brothers, I'd be plotting my next point of attack, finding their weakness to get what I needed. There were several restricted areas on campus, even from upperclassmen. I'd avoided them for the past three and a half years, never giving a second thought to what was behind those closed doors. I thought it was high time I took a page from my brother's books. A building near the rear of Academy, behind the main building, had been boarded up since I started here. I had no clue why, but they called it the Cathedral. Back then, fourth years had teased us first-year students that it was haunted, and they would dare us to try to break in and spend the night. The few who tried and were caught stepping foot inside were sent to the crypts. None got in past the first step into the area. No one actually knew what was in the cathedral. Hell, I wasn't even sure if anyone knew why it was called the cathedral. I wondered if its name had something to do with its prior use. It did resemble a cathedral in shape, somewhat. I'd have to see if Hunter was up to a nightly excursion with me, after I attempted a different type tonight. I waited until my cell said two in the morning, then crawled out of bed, fully dressed, and left our quarters. Hunter was right. There had to be a way for Briar and me to see each other, and there was no chance Hook or Ivan were going to be patrolling the dorms all night long, every night. The stairs were empty of any students, and I pushed open the door leading to Briar's floor to come face to face with one of the red-eyed demon statues. They were supposed to be outside the dorm, guarding the building. But this one was inside. I swallowed hard as those eyes flared brighter when I tried to step around it. Its stone wings groaned as they shifted, and just as I was about to get around it, they spread wide, blocking my path. I need to get by, I stated, but it said nothing in reply. I peered over its shoulder, down the hall, to see a second one at the other end. Hook. This was all him. What had he done to these statues to make them able to trace Briar and me? I considered forcing it out of the way, but its hand fell to the sword sheathed at its hip, and I held my hands up. Fine. Message received. Heading back to my room. 
I waited a few beats, but it remained firmly planted where it was. I made my way back to my floor, but curiosity got the best of me, so I crept back down again to Briar's floor and cracked open the door. The statue was right where I left it, its wings closed now, and its eyes dim. They obviously weren't here too long into the morning. I hadn't heard any of the students muttering about the statues in the halls yet. Where were you? Hunter asked after I stepped inside our quarters, scaring the shit out of me. Really? He grinned as I shoved him. Did you see, Briar? Uh, no, not exactly. Why not? The statues are guarding her hallway. His grin fell immediately. The statues? He's using them to keep you two apart? That's just cold, man. Why? I don't know, but something tells me it has a lot more to do with than his simply being concerned for Briar's safety, or that of the other students. Hook's hiding something. I mused as I grabbed a bottle of water from the mini-fridge. Leaning against the counter, I asked him, Do you know anything about that boarded-up building? Hunter sank onto the couch. The cathedral? He shrugged. Same as what everyone else knows, I guess. You know, it's haunted and such. We both know it's not. So, it's probably just used for storage now. Yeah, probably, I said quietly, tapping my fingers on my water bottle. What are you planning? Not sure yet, but you want in? He placed his hands behind his head and grinned. It's our last semester. Last chance to get into some trouble. Might as well go out with a bang, right? That was definitely how the semester was going to end. I told him I was going back to bed and heard him close his door a few minutes after I did. I picked up my cell and texted Briar, not expecting her to reply, but when she did, asking what was wrong, I simply called her. Hey, she whispered. You all right? Tried to sneak down to your room, I admitted. There was a slight problem. What, Ivan? No way. No, no, not exactly. Take a look if you can. Hold on, she replied. I heard some muffled sounds, then the sound of a door opening, before I heard it click closed again, and she was back. What the hell are they doing inside? Stopping us from getting to each other. Did they see you? Yeah, sadly, but I'm fine, I told her quickly. Look, Hook wouldn't do this just to keep us apart because he thinks your summoning is unstable. What do you mean? I mean he's trying to keep us apart for another reason. And General Morris is here still. She sucked in air and cursed under her breath. Briar? Sorry, it's nothing. I thought I woke Nyala up. Why did that sound like a lie? Has he talked to you again? No, no, and neither is Huck. I'm sure he will soon enough. He pulled me aside today to chat and wouldn't give up anything on why Morris is here. But he told me to stay away from Carter. Him? Why? I wasn't sure if I should tell her Carter was playing a creeper today, watching her train, but she'd see him soon enough if he kept it up. I told her what happened, and she was cursing more. His aura. It's white and black, I informed her. That's not possible, though, right? It doesn't make sense, but he's got one. White auras usually refer to protection of some kind, but it was the black within it that worried me. There were a few positive aspects to a black aura, but going off what happened and what Briar said when she was inside his head, I was going with the evil indication. Whoever this Carter was now, I would have bet almost anything that he was connected to the same person who messed with the real Carter. I still had a hard time believing this was the same Carter we saw catch fire in the catacombs. And his eyes, they were cold, almost vacant. But he was talking, right? Coherent? Yeah. You don't think someone's controlling him, do you? She asked, pulling the words right out of my head. That's what I'm leaning toward. Did you study up on necromancy while you stayed here during the winter break? I asked, impressed. The few times I managed to sneak into the library to get books, yeah, I kept myself busy. It'd be nice to know who's behind all of this. She sighed. I felt her annoyance through the cell connection. I hate this. A lot. I grimaced, though she couldn't see it. Same. I, uh, I still have your sweatshirt, she told me. 
Good. Keep it warm for me. Zach, I know I brought this up before, but you're sure you don't want to just call it all off between us, at least until you graduate? And give Hook the satisfaction of seeing us apart? Hell no. And before you say it, I find I like a little trouble in my life these days. It's been a bit too perfect the last few years. So just keep doing your studies. Get to know Professor Woods, too. He's on our side, at least. The one and only, she muttered and yawned. Get some sleep. I'll see you around tomorrow. You sure? Yeah. Nightbriar. She waited a few beats, then said, Night, Zack, and hung up. I stared at the ceiling for about an hour after that call. It had only been a few weeks, and felt like it had been months since I had a chance to hug her. Or kiss her. Damn. Whatever Hook was planning, I was going to find out, and then I was going to call him out on the truth of all those missing students, and why that fire really started. All I needed was time and patience, both of which I felt I was quickly running out of. Chapter 4 Briar Carter was everywhere. I didn't even have to look around anymore to feel those cold eyes watching me from across the dining hall or the lawns. I no longer needed a training partner, at least for my fire summoning, but he kept close all the same, always surrounded by his friends and that gaggle of girls I'd scared on the first day back. Each time I swore he was going to come over and say something, but then another week passed and another, until we were nearing the end of February before I even realized it. Every time, he would stare. Just stare. I avoided returning his stare, but sometimes I found myself turning toward him without thinking, and then I'd curse when his lips would curl up in a creepy sneer that made my hair stand on end. But Carter wasn't the only one keeping a close eye on me, and by the end of my first month back to classes, I was worn out just from trying not to act like myself and go full-on rebellious briar on Carter or General Morris. It was unnerving seeing him, knowing he was the father of Bethany Morris, the girl who was my spitting image, or, as Zach once said, my doppelganger. My gut told me Morris was my dad, but I wasn't about to try to call him on it again. With my luck, he'd take me off to some military lab immediately, and that would be the end of it. No more Briar Shroud, or Morris, or whoever the hell I was. Morris watched me like a damned hawk stalking its next kill, making it hard to concentrate any time he suddenly appeared in my view. He would show up mostly in the afternoon, when I was training with Professor Woods, which meant I was failing with moving my spirit summoning forward at all. You're not focusing, Woods said on a Tuesday afternoon when I was supposed to be meditating preparing for an attempt to astral project for the first time. Now I know where Zack gets that phrase from. I glanced past Woods to the man pacing just outside the circle formed by the willows. Morris was wearing that same black coat and that same damned scowl as he watched me. I sat up straighter and closed my eyes. I thought of Zack and our past few late-night phone calls and the messages he sent to me through Herbert. These were the only things that had gotten me through my days, but that damned man was going to drive me to crazy town if he didn't pace somewhere else. Even with my eyes closed, I felt Morris, cutting into my concentration. I can't, I just can't, I muttered a few seconds later, as tiny fires sprang to life around me. Woods tugged on his beard, his eyes swiveling around as I patted out the fires in the grass. Headmaster Hook needs to get control of his guest. Yeah, that'd be nice, I agreed, smothering the last tiny flame. Sorry, Professor. No, we can't work like this. Excuse me for a moment. He climbed to his feet, left the stone circle, and confronted Morris. You, sir. Yes, you. What do you think you're doing? I'm keeping a close watch on a troublemaker. Is that so? And what trouble has she caused? She started the... No! Woods cut him off. What trouble has she caused since you've arrived at our lovely academy? Please, enlighten me. Morris squared his shoulders and stared Woods down, but the professor barely blinked. You will watch your tone with me, sir. I am here to ensure that there's not another incident, such as the one that occurred last semester. 
Is that so? Yes, it is. Right. And do you recall that this so called incident was caused by another student attacking my student, throwing her off balance, making her emotionally distraught? I grimaced at how he described my going after Carter in self defense. I do, yes. I was told all of the details, Morris replied slowly. Then you will understand why I must insist you stop harassing my student during her training sessions, especially on a day like today. What does the day have to do with it? He snapped. Woods grinned as he leaned in. She's astral projecting today, so unless you want her ending up inside your head, you will do well to watch her from very, very far away. Perhaps inside. For safety reasons, of course. Morris's face turned several shades of red. He shot a look my way, and I flinched at the clear hatred in those eyes. He muttered something under his breath that made Woods blink a few times. Woods burst into laughter after the general had stormed off. He came back to the circle and sat down across from me, falling easily into his meditation position. Focus, Briar, Woods said, as if he hadn't just told off a general. Right, and, uh, thanks for that, I added. He bobbed his head slightly. I shut my eyes. Without feeling Morris close by, I was able to slip into a very calm and peaceful state of mind quickly. I sense you are in your happy place, Woods said quietly. I nodded. Good. Then let's begin. Are you sure this is a good idea? What if I end up in your head? I have created fortifications against such an intrusion. Trust me, you won't be getting inside my head he assured me. Now, keeping your eyes closed, I want you to picture yourself standing to my right. Understand? I breathed in deeply through my nose and out through my mouth before I said I got it. Just as we discussed, feel spirit drawing from deep within your center. Use that center to push it outward and take you where you want to go. Nice and slow. I felt that wet sensation spreading over my body, starting at my gut this time, and then imagined myself standing away from my body, next to Professor Woods. I'd be staring at myself sitting here on the grass that thankfully was not covered in snow. My breathing paused for a second, and it was like I sank in on myself. But when I opened my eyes, I really was standing by Professor Woods. Holy crap! He turned from his seated position. Holy crap indeed! You have successfully astrally projected, Briar. Well done. Well done indeed. This is awesome, I whispered, and I held my hands out in front of me. I looked whole, but my real body was sitting on the ground, head hanging and eyes closed. How long can I stay like this? When you're first starting out. You may be able to hold... His words cut off as I blinked and then was sucking in air, lifting my head and blinking against the light hitting my eyes. For ten seconds, maybe thirty. Woods finished saying, As you progress in your training, the time will increase. However, remember that any time you're away from your body, you are vulnerable. It is not recommended to ever do this for longer than a few minutes, even when your skills do advance. Why not? I asked, feeling very stiff from sitting so long. Your mind may start to confuse itself with where it truly is. Which body, I mean. Can we go again? I asked eagerly. We have some time. Try my other side. I shut my eyes again and focused as I did before. After a few deep breaths in and out, I felt myself fall inward, then opened my eyes to find myself standing on Wood's other side. I did it! You are quite talented, Woods agreed. I think someone else would agree, too. I frowned at his words, but when I looked up, I saw Zack watching from across the lawn, seemingly talking to Hunter. His eyes, however, were fixated on me, and they were filled with pride. And they should be. Woods was an excellent teacher, but my happy place was beside Zack, and he was the one who got me started in this training. If it hadn't been for Carter, or whoever was messing with him, he'd be the one I stood beside right now. I waved at him briefly before I blinked and then was back in my body. We tried two more times before Woods called it quits. But I'm still good to go. I promised. His brow rose. Is that so? Stand up without falling over. I laughed quietly as I started to get to my feet, 
then proceeded to sink back to the ground, my knees shaking hard. My whole body was trembling, and I felt like I'd run a marathon. Astral projection wears out the body, without one even realizing it. I'll keep that in mind. I stood slower this time, stretching out my arms and legs, and having to take it really, really slow until I was finally upright again. Are we going to try again tomorrow? If you're recovered enough, he said with a grin. Despite the fact that I was upset Zack wasn't my mentor or teacher anymore, Woods wasn't that bad. He was friendly and was definitely on our side in this mess. I felt like I could trust him and knew that would be helpful later if Zack and I ever got another shot at what was going on here at Academy. Woods said he would see me tomorrow. I gathered up Zack's sweatshirt, pulled it on fast against the cold outside of the circle, and had just picked up my tote bag when a piece of paper fluttered toward my face, unfurling and making me pause. Okay, then, I muttered, reading the message written in scrawling handwriting. Great. Headmaster Hook wanted to see me in his office. Now. I stunk from my intense fire training and wore my yoga pants and Zack's sweatshirt, but who was I to say no to the headmaster? He'd have to deal with my sweaty, stinky self for a few minutes. With any luck, he'd end this unwelcome, weird meeting early. I walked as slow as I could across the lawn to the main building and down the long corridor where Hook's office was. I expected to be staring at the alcove with no way to get inside, but was surprised to find it already open. I'd hoped I could have used that as an excuse not to see Hook, but too late now. I was standing right at the end of the short hall and could see Hook waiting for me, sitting at his desk. I bounced on the balls of my feet for a few minutes, then told myself to suck it up and get it over with. Couldn't be that bad, right? But the second I was inside the very same office I'd found so magical the first time, I stiffened and wished I could come up with an excuse to turn around and go. Miss Shroud, standing beside Hook, General Morris cleared his throat loudly. I hadn't been able to see him from my angle until I'd taken a couple of steps. I faced them both again. We won't keep you long, Hook assured me. General Morris here tells me your spirit summoning seems to be progressing quite nicely. I shrugged one shoulder without looking at the man in question. I managed to astral project. That is excellent news, Hook exclaimed. It was only a few feet for like ten seconds, nothing that exciting. It's progress, and that's what we hope for, Hook said, waving off my lack of excitement. Soon enough you'll be showing us exactly what you're capable of. I expect great things from you, Miss Shroud. Morris's eyes narrowed on me at Hook's words, and I swore there was a look of almost sad disappointment on his face before he noticed I was watching him closely. Morris glared. I would like to see quicker progress, however. Quicker? Yes. You must understand. Your talents are rare, Miss Shroud. I know this training wouldn't probably come until your later years, but I'm going to request Professor Woods and Professor Tapps begin working with you on how to combine your two elements. Is that really a good idea? I snapped, and they both stared at me like I'd lost it. Sorry, but I accidentally hurt someone last semester, remember? What were they playing at? I could barely do anything with spirit, and though, yeah, my fire summoning was great, I was nowhere near ready to start using them together, and I had no idea what it would do to me if I tried too soon. Morris straightened in annoyance. If I say it's a good idea, then it's a good idea. You're not my professor, I reminded him hotly and turned to leave. Miss Shroud, we are not finished with our meeting. I was about to keep walking and ignore Hook, but the alcove door closed and cut off my escape. I ground my teeth as I turned around and crossed my arms, glaring them both down. You will sit down and be respectful to General Morris. Or what? Or you'll find yourself spending every weekend from here until the end of semester in the crypts, Hook threatened. I clamped my mouth shut. That's what I thought. The crypts. Zack had finally described to me exactly what they were over winter break. The place was exactly that, he told me. Crypts filled with the dead and buried from ages and ages ago. Some even more recent. Students were made to stay down in the damp, dim crypts and clean the tombs, chase off or kill the rats they came across, and oh yeah, eat and drink only bread crusts and water for the entire time down there, and no summoning. 
There were wards in place to stop anyone from using magic. It wasn't the worst punishment in the world, but after seeing those undead in the library, the last thing I wanted was to be surrounded by bodies that might suddenly decide to come to life. Now then, General Morris has informed me how invested he has become in your training as you move on. Hook continued, as if he hadn't just essentially told me off. Therefore, he will be working with your professors, and if he feels you are ready to move ahead of your classmates, then you will do so. I said nothing. Hook's frown deepened. Miss Shroud, I hope you understand this type of opportunity doesn't come around very often. Certainly not for someone like yourself. What the hell is that supposed to mean? I shook my head as I chewed my cheek, trying to stop myself from cursing them both out. What, because I was born to a shitty mom? I emphasized that word, noticing how Morris shifted on his feet slightly. Or that I should be grateful I was told I might be taken away by the military for some damned experiment. You were given a full ride here at Academy. And yes, you are being offered an exceptional chance to work with someone as distinguished as General Morris. Hook folded his hands on his desk, shaking his head. Honestly, Miss Shroud, you're damned lucky I allowed you to remain here after what you'd done to your fellow classmate and the library, not to mention having a relationship with your mentor. Whatever, I whispered. What was that? Nothing, you're right, I said as brightly as I could manage, earning a worse glare from them both. You're absolutely right. The military will be good for you. Whatever you say, Headmaster Hook. If his eyes narrowed any more, they'd disappear entirely, but I wasn't about to back down or let them both know how freaked out I was that they were interested in my abilities. Should I stop being so good at it? Mess up some more? No, with any luck, that would just give Morris the excuse he needed to take me sooner. Now, Morris stated, I would also like you to attempt astral projecting into another person's mind again, and I would like that attempt to be sooner rather than later. Your spring break is toward the end of March? Let's make it our goal that after you return from a week of rest, you make your attempt. You're kidding, right? I laughed sharply. The last time I did that, I damaged Carter's head. You reacted. This time you'll be instructed. I was already shaking my head. No, not a chance in hell. I'm not getting into someone's mind again, and you can't make me. That is where you're wrong. You'll find that I can. What are you talking about? I demanded. I mean, I'm not the only one intrigued by your summoning, he said shortly. There are a few others in my unit who are expecting results. I'm not one of your soldiers, and I'm not a damned experiment. Not yet, you're not. But if you fail to show us the results we seek here, then I'll feel that your training needs to change, Morris said lightly. But I knew exactly what that meant. I refused to let them know how defeated I felt in that moment. But inside, I was sulking wanting to go hide in a corner somewhere and pretend this was all a bad dream. How had I gotten myself into this shit? I should have stayed in Texas. Then none of this would have happened. But then I wouldn't have met Zack. And I wouldn't be sitting across from the man who I was pretty damn sure was my dad. The one who got Mom pregnant and left me to fend for myself. Do we understand one another, Miss Stroud? Why can't you pick on someone else? I asked quietly. You should feel lucky to have so much attention from me and my peers, Morris stated proudly, as if the more they used the word lucky, the more I would start to buy that line of crap. You could very well turn out to be an exceptional addition to our unit. A weapon. All they wanted was to see if they could succeed in turning me into a weapon. Why did I have to be chosen by two elements? And why had someone felt the need to mess with Carter's head in the first place? Now he was dead and that imitation of him was wandering around. Had they done this on purpose? I studied Morris closely as he leaned in and whispered something to Hook. Was he involved in the disappearances and the necromancy too? My money was still on Ivan being our main bad guy. Hook, I felt, was just letting himself be manipulated. But Morris, where did he really fit into all this? If he was my dad, and he did actually know about me, was there any chance at all that he caused everything to happen to me just to see what I was really capable of? And that blood relationships meant nothing to him? Miss Shroud, you are free to go, Hook suddenly said. Just like that. Yes. Oh, but there is one more minor thing, Hook said as I stood. Stay away from Carter. 
Sure, could you tell him the same thing about not being creepy stalker? I'm sure he's doing no such thing, but I will tell him the same thing I have told you. Fair? He waved his hand and the alcove opened so I could leave. Have a nice evening. I spun sharply and stormed out of the office, not stopping until I was out of the main building and back in the dorms. As soon as I was alone in the stairwell, I sank against the closest wall, cursing my shaking knees and hands. I'd been through worse shit than this, right? Like Mom and her gaggle of boyfriends, living on the streets, countless terrible foster homes. Not sure if I was going to make it or not. Get it together, I muttered to myself. You got this. You're strong, remember? That's your center. But as I climbed the stairs up to my floor, I started to worry that maybe Zach and I had been wrong about that one little detail. By the time I reached my quarters, my hands were shaking so bad I had trouble flattening my hand against the door to get inside. Nyala wasn't there, and I tossed my toad on the floor before I crawled up into my bed, pressing my back into the corner as far as it would go. Herbert flew down to rest on my knees, which I'd pulled up to my chin. I felt like a kid all over again, wondering what was going to happen tomorrow. And the next day. And the next. Morris said there were others interested in me. I closed my eyes and pictured myself ending up in a sterile white room of some kind, being forced to try to astral project into someone's head over and over again until I broke them. Or I went a little mad myself. What if they tried to brainwash me, turned me into some mindless soldier, a killer of some kind? People always assumed I was mean, but that was really just the face I put on so I wouldn't have to deal with people's constant pity when they learned about my life. If I stayed angry, no one bothered me. I pictured myself wearing a uniform and walking around, finishing people off. Or worse, if Morris was involved in the necromancy we witnessed, what was to stop them from turning me into a zombie? I was still new to this world, and without really understanding everything that was possible, my imagination ran away from me fast. At first when I was told I was a witch and that I had powers, I felt an entirely new path open up to me. So many possibilities, so many new directions my life could go. Now I was back to being the scared little girl, hiding from the rest of the world that made it quite clear from a young age I wasn't wanted in it. I tucked my head lower and tried to block out the room around me. Not even Herbert could get me to smile. Briar? Huh? My head shot up and I jumped when Nyala turned up the gas lamps in our room. Why are you sitting in the dark? I missed you at dinner. Are you okay? She asked and sank down beside me. Briar, what happened? I must have fallen asleep at some point. When I went to wipe my face, I found my cheeks were wet. Had I been crying? Then I remembered my fears and shuddered. I am. Uh, I had a meeting with Hook and Morris, I whispered. Wait, they're not taking you now, are they? She asked in panic. No, but the threat was there. And it gets worse. I swallowed hard and spilled everything that Hook and Morris said. The longer I talked to her, the more my voice grew small until I was speaking in barely a whisper. But it's going to be fine. I mean, I'll figure out how to get out of this. That's what I do. Can you fake being bad? Thought about it, but Morris warned that if I wasn't making a decent amount of progress here, then he'd take me somewhere else to be trained. They can't do this, she argued. They just can't. You have rights. It's not like your property. I'm not so sure. Those contracts we signed? What exactly does it say in them? Her face paled. I have a feeling that if I tried to find a way out of this, they'd point to that. Or hell, Morris just has to claim I'm too dangerous and unstable to be unleashed into the world, I yelled, throwing my hands into the air as I got up quickly, unable to sit still any longer. Nyala stayed on my bed, eyes calculating. We're going to find a way out of this, I promise. You're a good friend. Have I told you that lately? Yeah, too many times. Just take a deep breath and try not to catch anything on fire besides your feet. I glanced down, but surprisingly there were no flames sprouting to life. Think I'm going to take a shower and try to clear my head a bit. Nothing bad has happened so far, right? So no need to panic. Yet. As I stepped out of my room, my fears rushed right back to me. Oh yeah, there was definitely a need to panic. At least I managed to hold the flames at bay until I was in the shower so the water could douse them for me as my limited options ran through my head. 
Running away was starting to look like my best option. But how far would I get? And where the hell would I go? Chapter 5 Zack The snow melted on the ground, and the flowers began to bud as the simulated outdoors inside the mountain's cave transitioned to spring. Another week dragged by, and I was throwing myself into my studies as hard as I could. Too bad nothing I did made the time go by any faster, and I was still figuring out a plan to sneak into the cathedral with Hunter. Why was that old abandoned building on campus called a cathedral? And then there was the joy of having my ever-present shadow around. Ivan, it now seemed, was my personal bodyguard. He followed me around, not even trying to hide it anymore. I guess because of my attempt to get to Briar's room the other night. Hook told him to keep a closer eye on me. He was there outside every class and watched me while I trained out on the lawns with Woods. I managed to ignore him for the most part, but he wasn't the one who ticked me off every day. Morris. Morris was always around when Briar was working on her fire or spirit. I'd see him watching from a distance, eyes focused on her as if he was judging her capability for whatever horrible notion he had in mind. Another long day was coming to an end, and I hadn't been able to try to get a message to Briar. Texts just weren't cutting it lately. Ivan walked as far as the dorm building with me, but thankfully stayed outside. I rushed into the stairwell and cut through Briar's floor, but she wasn't anywhere around. There was a chance I'd see her at dinner at least. Hunter, I said as soon as I opened the door to our quarters, we really need to get a move on with our- Oh! I stopped when I saw Nyala and quickly glanced around. Briar's not here. Trust me, she tried, she muttered. One of those damned statues came flying in the window on the stairwell and stopped her. Damn, they're tracking us somehow, I muttered. Wait, why are you here then? What's wrong? She hesitated, but then started talking and didn't stop for about ten minutes. When she was finished, I was sitting on the couch, holding my head in my hands and glaring at the floor. My heart pounded in my chest, and every instinct screamed at me to go protect Briar from Morris and Hook and whatever they were planning, but my hands were tied. Hook was a damned strong warlock, and if he wanted to keep us apart, then he would find any way he could to do it. Why were they so interested in her abilities? I knew it was rare for fire and spirit to be combined, and I guessed no one had astral projected into another's mind recently. But still, she was a first-year student, and they were talking about her like she was ready to jump into the army feet first. Look, there's something else, Nyala said quietly, wringing her hands. Briar didn't want me to tell you this part, but it's got her freaked out, and honestly, I'm scared too. What could be worse than having Morris wanting her to train beyond her abilities? I asked. It's about what Morris threatened her with after she woke up in the infirmary and what he threatened her with again a few weeks ago. She's a... She hasn't exactly been herself, Nyala rambled. Set our room on fire three times the past few days. Nyala. Right, sorry, Morris. Morris threatened to take her away from here if she messed up in any way this semester, she blurted. But it gets worse. What the hell is worse than that? I yelled. She was told during their last meeting that if she doesn't make enough progress for Morris and his peers or whatever, then he'll take her from here to a more efficient training facility. Either way, she's in a lot of trouble, and she's freaking out, thinking they're going to take her away in the middle of the night, and no one will know. I glanced at Hunter over her shoulder. His face darkened. They can't do that, though, right? They can't just take her. I wish I could say no, I muttered. You're serious? She asked loudly. Crap! Hunter crossed his arms, shaking his head. It's part of the contract we signed at the beginning of the first year here. If a student shows certain traits deemed extraordinary by the government or the military, either one is allowed to recruit said student before they graduate. Recruit though, right? Not just take, Nyala argued. Briar is different, though, I sighed, trying to keep hold of my anger. They also have the right to forcefully recruit a student who may be a danger or an extreme asset to the military if we are in dire need. But we're not. There's no war going on right now. I pushed off the couch, running a hand through my hair, furiously. 
depends on who you ask. Meaning what? Meaning most generals feel there's always a war going on, Hunter explained. If Morris has enough cause to take Briar away from Academy of Ancients, he can. No questions asked. Sometimes I really hated the way our world of magic worked. It shouldn't be possible to do this to a student, especially one who was new to how our government and military functioned. But unless someone way higher up the food chain than Morris stepped in, Briar could be in more trouble than I first assumed. We have to stop this from happening, Nyala pleaded. There's not much we can do. You need to tell Briar to keep doing what she's doing without pissing either one of them off. I said, feeling helpless. I was still a student. I had no power to do anything except stand by and watch and follow my own set of strict rules that Hook had laid out for me this semester. Why don't you tell her yourself? Nyala asked curiously. I, uh, I would. But she hasn't exactly been responding to my texts lately or answering when I call. I told her, and she frowned. I didn't want to talk about it to either of them, but I felt like Briar was pulling away from me, to try to keep me out of this, keep me safe. I was the fourth year, the mentor, and she was trying to keep me safe like I didn't know how to protect myself. Just pass along the message for me. I will, Nyella said, uncertain. But she doesn't always listen to me either. With those final words, Nyala left. Nice to know this entire mess wasn't changing Briar's personality. If anything, it was making her revert back to how she'd been when she first arrived. Closed off, angry, not wanting to open up to anyone about anything. I walked around our shared living quarters as my mind raced, trying to come up with any semblance of a plan. We need to get inside that damned cathedral, I finally decided. And what is that going to do to help Briar? Hunter asked. Not sure yet, but if there's something in there Hook doesn't want us to see, then maybe we can use it against him and Morris. It could keep Briar out of their grasp. Well, then we should start doing some snooping around. There's a way in, I'm sure. I mumbled something in reply, too busy picturing Briar alone in her room, scared to go to her lessons in case Morris deemed it necessary to take her away from here one day. I'd never see her again if that happened. But if she was his daughter, or at least we assumed she was, why would he do this to her? I needed a way to talk to Briar face to face. What if you two staged a public fight? Hunter suggested after a while. You know, convince Hook you guys don't want to be together. Think he'd lift the rule? Doubt it. He's too smart for that. I don't know what else to tell you, man. I patted him on the shoulder. It's fine. Something will come to me, but for right now, let's go get some food before the kitchen runs out. After a few days passed, I sent a text every few hours to my brothers. The fact that none of them replied was starting to make me worry more than piss me off. They were always hard to reach, but eventually one of them would always get back to me, and at least let me know they were alive. This complete radio silence was annoying. I'd even broken down and called Mom to see if she'd heard anything. I spent my entire time back at Academy, only answering her calls and voicemails with texts. I should have known better. When she answered, I ended up getting a half-hour-long lecture about how I left, and that I'd better not be planning to do anything stupid during my final semester there. I told her she was more than welcome to call Hook and check on me, then hung up, just as she sucked in a breath to go another few rounds. As I'd set my cell down, I couldn't help but grin as I realized where I got my ability to lecture so well from. Briar would have found that little fact amusing, if she were still talking to me. I checked in with Nyala every day, but it was the same. Briar was shutting herself off, only focusing on her studies, and appeared to only be in their quarters when she was sleeping. Otherwise, she was in one of the study alcoves somewhere on campus, or at the spirit summoning circle when I wasn't there with Woods. He told me every morning how well she was progressing, just as he had this morning. She's moving at a quick pace. But I worry if she goes too fast, Morris is going to find a reason to take her from Academy before she's ready, he confided quietly. I told Woods I knew all about the threat hanging over Briar's head, so he could talk openly to me about whatever he knew on the matter, too. Have you tried telling her to take it slower, maybe mess up now and then? 
She messes up plenty, just like any other student. But as for the progression, I don't think she can slow it down. She's a natural spirit summoner, and every time she astral projects, she's able to stay out of her body longer. It's quite impressive, really. Woods supplied. That's not what I want to hear, I muttered. He chuckled bitterly. Don't I know it. Her fire is the same. Soon we'll be teaching her how to combine them. Already? Hook can't allow that. She could seriously hurt herself, I argued. I think it's safe to say Hook has been hooked, Woods said. His hands are tied just like the rest of ours. Meaning? I asked quietly, leaning in. Meaning Morris is not the only one giving orders. I saw another general on campus two days ago, higher rank than Morris. They talked briefly, but from the stern looks he gave Morris, they are not happy with the slow progress of their new pet project. She's not a project, I seethed, curling my hands into fists and forgetting I was supposed to be meditating. Did you hear what else Morris expects of her? He asked lightly. Do I want to know? Perhaps. Morris expects her to attempt to astral project into another's mind when we return from spring break. I counted off the days in my head. That's in three weeks. He can't be serious. I'm afraid he is. No wonder she wasn't talking to me or Nyala. She was probably being swallowed by her guilt over what happened to Carter, and wondering if that was going to happen again to someone else. I struggled to maintain any sort of focus after he dropped that bombshell, but my training wasn't over yet. My spirit summoning had been lacking the past few days because of my unstable emotional state. I appreciated Woods' candidness with me about Briar, but there was something else I wanted to ask him. Another interesting topic of conversation I hoped he wouldn't hold back from answering a few questions about. The abandoned building behind the main. I asked slowly. Any idea why it's been boarded up? I heard the cathedral wasn't structurally sound anymore, he replied simply. It's the oldest building on campus, after all. Can never be too careful. My brow furrowed as I repeated those words in my head. Was there a double meaning anywhere in them? Why is it called the cathedral? He raised a brow. Focus, Zack. You wouldn't want Hook thinking you're slipping in your lessons. No, that would be tragic. He smiled before we both settled back into the lesson for the morning. I was going to be tested on my ability to use my spirit summoning defensively, offensively, and of course see how well I could read people's auras. Unlike Briar, I had no astral projecting ability, but my focus was on being able to read people to know if they were a threat or not. People like me were handy when weeding out would-be assassins, or other threats to our military or government officials. After my morning session concluded with Woods and me both breathing heavily from our sparring exertions, I'd nearly bested him twice. I hurried back to my quarters to shower and change. I had a three-hour break before my four back-to-back -back classes, and then I was finished for the day. Hunter would be gone, and I enjoyed having the place to myself for that time. I grabbed my shower kit, hit the bathroom, but when I came back, I paused right inside the door. Someone was in there with me. Quietly, I set my shower kit down and aimed for my bedroom. The door was cracked open. I knew I'd closed it. I always closed it. Carefully, I pushed it open enough that it swung inward all the way, and I stared inside. It appeared to be empty, and I started to breathe a sigh of relief when two hands reached out from the shadows and dragged me in. I summoned spirit as a shield against the attack, but an arm was already wrapped around my throat. A second one came out of the corner, and I thrust spirit outward, pushing the second attacker into the wall and holding him there. But the arm around my neck was making it hard to keep my focus. I threw my elbow back into his gut and spun around when his arm loosened, dragging that arm up and around his back. What the hell do you want? I snarled, then paused when I heard laughing laughing. They were both cackling like damned hyenas. I released the one attacker's arm and pulled spirit back into me, letting the second one slide to the floor with a thud. Ow! Damn, man! Can't you let me down nicely? No, not when you try to scare the shit out of me. The door to my bedroom closed, 
and I stared at my next two oldest brothers, Nick and Luke. The latter was a spitting image of our dad, ginger with freckles and all, though he wore his red hair a lot longer than Dad ever did. Nick, on the other hand, looked like me and Mom. We all had the same blue eyes, though. Those we got from our grandfather. You don't text me back for months, and you just decide to show up in my room. I glanced around. How did you even get in here? Does Hook know? That old geezer? Luke scoffed. No, he doesn't know. What kind of secret agents would we be if we couldn't sneak onto a damned academy campus in broad daylight? He smacked Nick in the chest, who was nodding in agreement. And you couldn't just text me back because... I asked, waiting. Their smiles fell at the same time, and Nick made himself at home on my bed. We were undercover for the past five months, investigating a very hot case. This was the first time we were able to get away, and we would have texted you back if we didn't have several questions of our own for you first. Like what? Like what happened here last semester? Luke asked, leaning against the far wall and watching me closely. I'm sure Mom could have filled you in, or you could have read the official report from Morris. I snapped hotly. They all seem to know it better than I do. Now, we want the truth, Luke stated. All of the truth. Start at the beginning, and don't leave anything out, especially about this Briar Shroud girl. Got it? I want every fact, Zachary. Every single thing you can remember. I glanced from one to the other, not remembering a time when I'd seen them look so deadly serious. What's going on? We'll tell you after you tell us. Go, Nick said. They both stared at me expectantly. I dragged over my desk chair, sat down, and started from the day I picked up Briar Shroud from the airport. Words poured out of my mouth one after the other as I talked about her that first day, including what she'd mentioned about the disappearing students. I filled them in on her orientation when she managed to connect with two elements instead of one. When I brought up the picture of her in Hook's office, they both shifted in unison, but waved for me to go on when I paused. I went on and on. Ivan and his meeting with that so-called military agent, who I swore was a necromancer, about the missing students, and Carter, who seemed to be off. By the time I got to the attack in the library, Luke was casually picking at his nails with the tip of his pocket knife, but after growing up together, I knew he did it because he was on edge. And then Hook threatened Briar and me to stay away from one another, away from Carter. Oh, and Morris. He's here to keep an eye on her. Already he said he would take her away from Academy in a heartbeat if she broke the rules, or if she wasn't progressing quickly enough. They want to use her as a weapon. That's easy enough to figure out, Nick stated. And? I waited for them to tell me all of this was just a huge mess and that I was an idiot for getting involved. Instead, Luke shoved his knife back in his pocket and nodded at Nick. Show him. Both? Both. He has a right to know. He's not a kid anymore. Nick hesitated a second longer, but then reached into a black bag I hadn't noticed on the floor by my bed and tugged out two official-looking folders. You swiped those? I asked. Don't ask questions we aren't allowed to answer, Nick said, and held them out for me. I took them and set them on my desk. I flipped the first one open, and gazed down in shock at the gruesome crime scene photos of one General Thomas Addy. Why am I looking at this? Check the second one, Nick ordered, and I slid Addy's file aside. Brace yourself. I wasn't sure what he could be talking about, but it couldn't be worse than staring at Addie's mutilated body. But then I opened the file and pushed back in my chair. Dad. This was Dad's file. His cold, dead face stared back at me. Why are you showing me this? I snapped, furious. Because Dad was murdered, Luke told me quietly, calmly. That was when he was scariest. Any second now, I expected the building to start shaking with his rage, but he'd gotten better over the years at keeping his anger in check. No, he died of natural causes, I argued. They both shook their heads. I couldn't fathom this. I couldn't process it. He was murdered. Like Addie? 
but we saw his body. He wasn't torn open. His organs were missing, Nick informed me. They just did a better job of hiding it. No, I muttered, shaking my head, suddenly feeling cold and numb. No, they would have opened an investigation, done something to try to figure out who did this. Why was it brushed under the rug? I glanced up from the file to my two brothers and sank back into my chair. You two. Us two, Luke repeated. We've been on this case since the beginning. Quietly, of course. All this time. They nodded in unison. The case was kept under wraps, need to know only, Luke went on, until General Addy was killed the same way. And then there's you and what's happening at Academy, Nick chimed in. So you believe me? Yeah, we do, because you're not the only one who's seeing the dead up and walking around. Meaning? I asked. Meaning Dad's last case before he was killed was dealing with disappearances and their ties to a necromancer cult that was rumored to be gathering followers, Nick grumbled. And since his death, there's been no progress made on the case. It was sealed and locked away. Until we got our hands on it, Luke added with a smirk. Can't keep us from that case. No way in hell. Then the undead I saw here, the necromancer. You think it all leads back to what Dad was working on. Think he found something. Makes sense, since he ended up dead. Nick said with a nod. And Addy, he also had ties to similar cases before he ended up dead in his office. Those files were also sealed and locked away. So much for this being a minor conspiracy. Dad and Addy were murdered to cover up necromancers coming back to the magic community. There had to be more higher-ups involved. No one could sneak into a military base that easily and cut out someone's organs. Even our house was heavily warded against attacks, and that was where Dad was found. This Carter guy, you say he's still here, right? Nick asked. The real Carter died in that fire. Whatever this new thing is, its aura is black and white. Perfectly black and white. I told them, and they exchanged a dark look. And it's been watching Briar about as closely as Morris and Hook. Nick got up and went to peer out the window overlooking the lawns. You need to keep close eye on her. Kind of hard to do when any time I get close to her, Ivan or one of those damned statues gets in the way. And if we're seen together, one or both of us will end up in the crypts. And Morris will use it as an excuse to take her away from here. I can't even talk to her about what's going on, because she's refusing to talk to me now. Thinks she's protecting me. But I'm worried about her, about them getting to her. Let us worry about that. Luke said. We'll send you a present. Just keep an eye out for it. In the meantime, we want to see what you can find out about these missing students you dug up, Nick added. One of them isn't missing. He's the tattooed guy. He might be that, but he does not work for the military. There's some messed up shit going on at our end, Luke muttered. Ever since Dad was killed, all we've been doing is digging up more and more secrets that were never meant to see the light of day as you have. But I lost all the files, I reminded him. The fire destroyed everything. Everything, Nick prodded. I opened my mouth to say yes, then thought of the cathedral. I asked them about it, and they just shrugged. The glint in their eyes, however, was enough to tell me exactly what I needed to know. Academy was hiding many more secrets waiting to be found out. All I had to do was look in the right places. We're out, Luke said suddenly and turned for the door. Just like that? Yeah, you've got this. We're trusting you to figure things out on your end while we run down some more leads on ours. Do these leads involve necromancers? Nick mussed up my hair as he walked by. Always knew you'd get smart eventually. Keep those files out of sight. Wait, what about Morris? Can you tell me anything more about him? They stopped at the door and had a quiet conversation before Luke turned back and said, He's on our list. List of what? Suspects? Or targets? We can't quite figure him out yet, but whatever his game, he's playing it close to the chest. Keep your eyes open, Zack. We'll be in touch again soon enough. Then they were gone. Just like that. I closed the door behind them and stared at the open files on my desk like they were going to come to life and bite me. I wasn't ready to read through Dad's anymore, so I closed it, tucked it away in a drawer for now. 
Addie's was more tolerable, once I set the gory pictures aside. The organs missing all pertain to recorded necromancer rituals. Not that anyone bothered to note that in the report. They essentially came to the conclusion it was some nut job. These murders. I checked the date of Addie's and sat back in my chair. It happened almost exactly four years from when Dad died. And those missing students. They hadn't been from every year, but there hadn't been enough time to dig through the files and see if there was indeed a pattern. Four years. What would need to happen every four years? The talk with my brothers had cost me over an hour of my break time. Now I needed to get to the library and see what else I could find on necromancer rituals. I opened my drawer to stow Addie's file away, too, when my eyes landed on Dad's. With a shaking hand, I started to pull it back out, but stopped, unable to do it. Murdered. All this time I'd come to grips with Dad dying because it had been natural. But now, now that I knew the truth, I felt betrayed even more by the world I thought I knew and trusted so well. My reality was shattering piece by piece, and I had a sinking feeling in my gut that I was not going to like whatever lay behind the rose-colored glass. My desk was cluttered with books on necromancers, books I could only get with written notes of permission from Woods. He made up some excuse about an end-of-term assignment that allowed me to get what I needed. He asked quietly what they were really for, but I couldn't say anything without involving my brothers, so I kept my mouth shut. He accepted it, for now, but eventually I'd have to give him something. It had been four days since I'd seen my brothers, and Dad's murder hung over my head like a dark cloud. I was brooding and cranky, snapping at Hunter one night until he flat out asked me what crawled up my ass. I'd apologized and knew I could trust him at least with the truth. The second I told him about my dad, his attitude shifted gears and he asked what he could do to help. Right now, keep an eye on Briar, since I can't, I'd told him. According to my brothers, Academy is no longer safe. He'd blanched at that, but didn't back down. I returned to my room after dinner, not even seeing a glimpse of Briar for the third day in a row, and I was about to call her when I noticed a black leather satchel sitting on my desk. I opened it to find six vials filled with dark, green, goopy substance. There was a note tucked amongst them that read, One gulp will last one week. This will stop the statues from tracking you at night, and at night only. Keep her close. Keep her safe, Zack. The wolves are at Academy. Well, that makes me feel so much better, I mumbled as I pulled one of the vials out. Carefully, I popped the small cork out of one, and the stench hit me like a slap across the face. It was like bad cheese mixed with rotting fish. Leave it to my brothers to concoct something that would work and have it be the most disgusting substance imaginable. I pinched my nose and choked back a gulp, gagging and shuddering when I finally got it down. I didn't feel any different, but there was only one way to find out if it worked. They said at night, but I needed to get one of these to Briar. I texted Nyala, asking if she could meet me in the stairwell so I could give her a few of the vials for Briar, but when she texted back, she said she'd meet me, but there was a problem. Grabbing the satchel, I slung it over my body and rushed out my rooms to find her sprinting upstairs already. What's wrong? I asked frowning when I saw Herbert perched on her shoulder. briar has gone, Nyala gasped. Her bag's gone. She just... she's just gone. Did Morris take her? I asked sharply, but she shook her head. She left a note and told me to let you know she's sorry, but she can't stay. I sank to the stairs. If she tried to leave, Academy itself would stop her, and then Morris would have a reason to take her away. I had to do something to stop her before it was too late. The light was dimming outside the window, signifying night was approaching, though we could never see the sunset. Herbert fluttered around my head before he landed on my knee. I stared at him long and hard, then a smile crept to my face. Herbert, I need you, I told the paper crane, and he perked up. Chapter 6 Briar after my afternoon lesson with Professor Woods, I stayed at the summoning circle, using the excuse that I wanted to meditate for a while longer. He'd let me be, and no one bothered me. 
For days I'd been planning this, and today I finally decided just to do it. With spring break fast approaching, and what I knew would be disaster day after that, I felt I had a better chance out in the real world than I did stuck here being a glorified prisoner. My bag was stashed behind the willow tree, and as soon as the lawns were clear, I was going to grab it and head for the tunnel that would lead me out of the mountain. It was a long walk to Silent Heights, and I had no money, but I figured I'd hitchhike my way back to Texas somehow. I could pick up odd jobs along the way, make it a real adventure. Was it ideal? Hell no, but it was better than being some fish in an aquarium. That's all I felt like these days with so many people watching me, waiting. It grew darker, and I watched as the last few students disappeared into the main building and the dorms. Perfect. I was worried the statues would try to stop me if I got too close to the tunnel, but I'd become efficient at using my firepower in attacks, at least against training dummies. Could I take on a statue? Eh, wouldn't know until I tried. The lawn's clear. I hurried from my bag, slung it over my body, and walked as quickly as I could for the tunnel. I'd left a note for Nyala, but when I tried to write one for Zack, no words came to mind. I'd stopped texting him and answering his calls, hoping he'd get annoyed at me, so pissed that he wouldn't be so upset when he'd found out I'd gone. I hated the idea of never talking to him again. But this was for his own good. The less involved with me he was, the less chance he had of ending up in a place worse than the crypts. The tunnel was about 30 yards away, and there was no sign of any statues on their way to stop me. I gripped the strap of my bag until my knuckles turned white. I jumped back with a curse as a white shape zoomed around my head. Herbert, what are you doing out here? The paper crane flew around and around my head, avoiding my hand when I tried to catch him. I told you, you have to stay with Nyala. I can't take you with me. But he continued to fly until he finally settled on my shoulder and Zack's voice came out of the tiny, magical bird. Stop right now. Turn around and follow the crane shroud. You can't simply leave, so before you get yourself in even more trouble, just do what I say for once, and trust me. And before you start to argue, remember, this is a message, and I can't actually hear you. Follow the bird. I had my mouth open, about to do just that, then shut it with an audible clack. Zack sounded furious. Follow the bird. That's what he wanted me to do. But where this bird was taking me was the real question. I couldn't be seen with Zack. He knew that. But Herbert was already flying away. I glanced once more at the tunnel before I gave in with an annoyed groan and started following Herbert. He led me along the cave wall that marked the boundaries of campus. I noticed a statue I hadn't seen on my way out was now standing in the center of the road, yards away from where I'd been. As I watched, it turned towards me and those eyes flared red. Briar! Nyala, what are you doing out here? I asked as she rushed over to me. I have to go. It's better for everyone. Yeah, okay, she mocked me, clearly annoyed, and handed me a small vial. Take a gulp. I stared at the goopy substance. Of this? What is it? Zack said to trust him, she reminded me, and held it out again so trust him. I wasn't sure how I felt about drinking something out of a random vial, but I did trust Zack. I removed the tiny cork and gagged immediately. Seriously, what is this shit? Just a gulp, that's what he said, she told me, cringing. Better you than me. I grimaced in disgust, but took a swallow of the crap. It was thick, and I almost threw up on the spot, but forced it down. As soon as it was in my gut, Nyala looked past me and grinned. What are you so happy about? It worked, she whispered and turned me around. Look! The statue that had been eyeing me intently was walking away, moving back to its post as if it no longer had any interest in me. What is this stuff? Don't know, but you need to keep following Herbert. She hugged me so hard I couldn't breathe and then glared at me pointedly. Don't you ever try to leave your friends again, Briar Shroud. Then she was storming away, back toward the dorms. Herbert fluttered close by, waiting for me. 
I had no idea what was going on, but it was either stress or the effects of whatever that chunky stuff was I just choked down that caused me to burst out laughing. I took a few steps after Herbert and kept looking over my shoulder, but no statues came to follow me. I picked up the pace until I was running, and Herbert was soaring, following a dirt path that led into a small grove of trees I had noticed before, but never felt the need to explore. He wove between the trees, and then passed through a small entrance carved into the stone. Herbert flew right inside, but I held back. Nothing good had occurred over the past few weeks. Why would tonight be any different? Take a chance, I whispered to myself. Just go for it. I took a deep breath and moved through the narrow opening to come out into a small cave. I heard water running, and when I came around a bend in the skinny tunnel, I saw a small waterfall in the far wall, running into a stream that disappeared beneath the ground. Dark patches of moss covered the stones, and gorgeous blue and white flowers glimmered with light all their own, illuminating the space. It was like I had stepped into a dream, a peaceful one with no undead waiting to snatch me from my bed. And standing amongst the flowers, waiting for me, was Zack. Our eyes locked onto one another, and I expected to see Hook or Morris come bursting into the cave ready to tear us apart. But nothing happened. No statues rushed in either. We were alone, together, and no one seemed to know. Shroud, he said, and took a step toward me. I swallowed hard, seeing concern warring with anger in his eyes as he took another step, and another. Look, before you say anything, I was doing what I thought was right, okay? I couldn't do this to you, or Nyala, or anyone else. I don't want to be responsible for what happens to you guys if I screw up again. Shroud. No, just let me get this out, okay? I'm used to being on my own, and I'll be fine, really. Whatever this stuff is, I doubt it'll last forever. And what happens when it wears off, huh? We'll be caught, and I'll be dragged off, and you... I don't even want to think about what they'll do to you, so just... Just let me leave, all right? I can manage. You can manage, really, he shot back, furious. You have no idea what's really going on here, and you're just going to take off? Seemed like a great plan to me, I snapped. Right, of course it did, because out there, no one would be able to protect you. I don't need to be protected. I need to keep them away from you. This is my problem. I got us into this mess, and I'm going to be the one to take the mess away. He hung his head. We're beyond that point. He was just a few steps away, and my breath caught in my throat. Do you have any idea what it felt like when Nyala told me you just up and left? Do you? No, I whispered, lifting my chin and trying not to feel guilty. You wouldn't have lasted two minutes out there on your own, he informed me roughly and took another step closer. I took one away from him. Morris and Hook aren't the only ones after you, Shroud. Did you know that? What? I gasped. If you would have waited around, taken a few seconds to text me back, I would have told you. But no, you had to act like you were alone in this world. I'm better off that way, I insisted, as my gut twisted and my heart raised. Zack, I started to say, when he reached out to me, grabbed my hand, and pulled me to him. Our lips met a second later, and after being so long apart, it was impossible to hold my emotions back. I tried to reach my arms around his neck, but the bag made it hard, and I grunted in annoyance until I managed to slip it off. The moment I did, I was in his arms, and we were kissing like we hadn't seen each other in years. I ran my hands through his hair and never wanted to let him go again. I thought I'd like Jake all those months. But never when I was around him did I feel like I was on fire. Literally. I sniffed and cursed when I spotted the tiny flames springing to life all around our feet. Zack smiled against my mouth, and we stomped them out together, not breaking apart once. How is this possible? I asked, staring up into a set of deep cerulean eyes I'd missed. I had a visit from my brothers. That stuff in the vial? One gulp lasts for a week. At night we'll be untraceable, so we can actually see one another, and I can keep a better eye on you. Keep you informed of what's really going on here. He scowled down at me. 
I smiled sheepishly. Don't do that to me again, please. What, try to leave? I thought I was saving you. From what? From being dragged down with me. If Morris pulls through with his threat to take me away for some crazy experiment, I trailed off, cringing as I glanced up at Zack's furious gaze. Shit, I didn't mean to tell you that. I already knew. Wait, how? Nyala, she told me all about your last meeting with Morris and Hook, and what they said at the end of last semester. Why didn't you tell me? He demanded. I was worried about what you would do, and like I said, I can take care of myself. A look of annoyance marred his features, and his hands fisted in my sweatshirt. I waited for the lecture, but he lifted me off my feet and was kissing me again. That was much better than a lecture. Stop trying to protect me, he muttered as he set me back on my feet. I'm supposed to be your mentor, remember? You can't deal with this on your own, trust me. And I'll be damned if I let some military bastard kidnap you from Academy in the middle of the night. I thought it was for the best, I told him, knowing I was repeating myself. Sooner or later, I'm going to up and disappear, and I don't want you to be left behind upset. He hugged me to him, and I buried my face against his chest, breathing him in. You are utterly ridiculous. I hope you know that. You're not alone, Shroud. Not anymore, remember? You've got me, and Nyala, and Hunter. We're here for you. I'm not used to having friends, I said, my words muffled against his shirt. Yeah, I know, but you have them now. You have me. I nodded, not wanting to look up at his face and see his disappointment in my actions. I'm sorry. I know, and I forgive you, this time. But there's a lot we need to talk about. His arms tightened around me. Talking was not really what I had in mind for our first official reunion, but from the way his body suddenly went rigid, I realized it was serious. Zack, what's going on? He led me over to the stream and we sat down shoulder to shoulder, our feet dangling a foot over the gently running water. It gave off the same bluish glow the stream that ran down the mountain did. Nick and Luke came to see me a few nights ago, he said quietly. It seems they've been working on a case that's got them in pretty deep, and it has ties to Academy. Really? How? He glared at the water below us, and I felt the anger on his face now had nothing to do with me trying to be stupidly brave by leaving. Remember I told you my dad died? Yeah, a bit before you started here. Turns out he was murdered, just like General Addy, and my brothers have been working on the case of his death since it happened. I squeezed his hand in comfort. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? Or I mean, I guess as okay as you can be? I wasn't sure how I would deal with that information, but he nodded, sucking in a deep breath. How did they find out? Dad's death was made to look like one from natural causes, but there were organs missing. Just like Addie, I whispered. Why didn't they report it as a murder? Cover up. And though Addie's was clearly a murder, the investigation has been stalled. My brothers only found the files because they're persistent bastards who don't give up easily. Turns out Dad was working on a case that dealt with, are you ready? Disappearances and necromancers. From Academy? I asked sharply. Not this one in particular, but yeah, after his death, the case was sealed. Addie was also working on cases related to investigating the resurgence of necromancers. And he was killed too, I said quietly. Holy shit. You didn't just stumble into a cover-up here, Shroud. You kicked a hornet's nest, he teased, but his eyes were dark with worry and anger. You know, I never thought I'd let myself get into this type of situation until after I was away from Academy. What, are you telling me you don't enjoy this? Chasing down the bad guys and uncovering some huge conspiracy that's probably going to get the two of us in some serious shit? We're already in serious shit, if you hadn't noticed, he pointed out. Nope, never crossed my mind, I said brightly. Here I thought every student was guarded by those red-eyed demons. He sighed, glancing towards the ceiling as if asking for patience. 
Do we have a plan? I'm not sure I should tell you. You might decide to go do something stupid all on your own. I held up my pinky for his. A pinky promise. That's what you're going with. What are we, ten? Take it or leave it, I said, wiggling my pinky. He pursed his lips, but wrapped his pinky around mine. What are you swearing to do? It's what I'm swearing not to do. I, Briar Shroud, will not run off into a dangerous situation alone that might get me into more trouble than I'm already in. Deal? His eyes narrowed as he leaned in close enough to kiss me and whispered, Deal. We had a lot more to talk about, but I missed him too much to waste our first night talking. I pressed my lips to his, scooting as close as I could, then laughed in surprise when he picked me up and placed me on his lap, deepening the kiss. I never had a boyfriend until Zack, and only ever made out once or twice. Those times had been nice, but with Zack, it was on a whole other level. There was real emotion between us, and after fighting off the undead together, and then nearly burning to a crisp, I felt the connection I thought I had sensed last semester ten times stronger now. The waterfall played a pleasant soundtrack around us, and I had no idea how long we stayed locked in that embrace. I had to give Zach credit for finding what had to be the most romantic spot on campus. I never thought of myself as a romantic girl, but being here with him, as we sank back into the moss and flowers, I was starting to understand what all those romantic girls were about. After so many weeks of looking over my shoulder and being tense, ready for an attack, I could finally just relax and let all my fears go, if only for a few hours. We talked in between long bouts of kissing, but our conversations had nothing to do with anything important. He told me he was proud of my spirit training and impressed by what I could do with fire so far. I only managed to do it all so well because I felt him watching over me gave me some sense of being able to focus on the task at hand. I asked about his classes, and he shrugged, telling me at this point all he wanted to do was get through the semester without one of us ending up in the crypts. The hours ticked by, and my hands were just snaking up under his t-shirt, enjoying the warmth since the cave was a bit chilly, when Herbert suddenly flew around our heads before he landed on the ground beside us. What time is it? Zack mumbled pulling away to check his watch. Shit, we need to get back to the dorms. I took his wrist, ready to tell him we had time, but then my eyes widened. Four in the morning? I glanced at him, and we both laughed before he drew me back in for one more kiss. Why does this stuff only work at night? Because it's just to trick the statues. We can't trick Hook or Ivan without doing something directly to them, and that draws attention. He got to his feet and then reached down for me. I pouted for a second, but finally let him pull me up. He hugged me close, kissing the top of my head, before he grabbed my bag and led the way out of the cave. Next time we get together, I guess we should do more than just make out, I said, tucking a stray strand of hair behind my ear. Making up for lost time, he mused, and squeezed my hand as we walked along. The lighting was still dark enough to say it was night, but soon enough it would grow lighter, and since we had no exact way of knowing what time the potion would wear off, it was better to be safe. We hurried across the lawns, holding our breaths as we neared the dorm building, just in time to spot a statue right outside the doors. As we drew closer, I expected it to come to life and turn those glowing red eyes on us, but nothing happened. I didn't let out a sigh of relief until we reached my floor. I'll see you tonight, he promised. I'll text you. It's too long, I complained, throwing my bag onto my shoulder and sighing. But at least we can actually talk face to face again. And other things, I added with a wink that had him rubbing the back of his neck as his lips curled into a grin. Thank your brothers for me. I will, don't worry. He kissed my cheek sweetly and whispered goodnight in my ear. I found I couldn't speak, so I waved. He smiled as I walked through the door down the corridor to my room. I pressed my hand against it and heard the lock click. I barely stepped inside before Nyala tackled me in a hug and dragged me over to my bed. So how was it? she asked. Did you two have a good time? Wow, I said through my laughter as I dumped my bag on the floor. I thought about lying and saying we just talked the whole time, 
but I started laughing and felt my cheeks grow hot. I completely gave myself away when fires sprang up around my bed and I had to stamp on them to put them out. Nyala cackled with delight beside me. We only kissed. A lot. For most of the time, I admitted. Not surprised. I'm just happy it worked. Now I can have my happy briar back. Mostly, I said as I cringed. I can't act too happy. Hook and Ivan will know we're up to something. But I swear I will be happier when I'm in our quarters. Good. I can deal with that. I started unpacking my bag. Nyala was clearly wide awake, and I wasn't tired at all. The day was going to suck, but I'd take a nap somewhere in there. What all did Zack tell you? She asked coyly. Everything. So you're not mad at me? I checked a shirt at her, and it smacked her in the face. No, not anymore. She threw it back at me, but I caught it and winked. You should have just told him yourself. Well, he knows now, and he's in full-on protection mode. I grinned at the notion that I'd get to see him tonight, and knowing he hadn't stopped keeping an eye on me warmed me completely. Briar, really? I cursed again, swatting the flames around my feet before I finished unpacking and fell onto my bed. Nyala and I sat up and talked until our alarms went off at seven. I was going to need a gallon of coffee to get through our first few classes. But being tired all day was well worth a sleepless night since I got to spend it with Zack. If only there weren't dark clouds hovering over us by the names of Morris and Hook. Hey, did Zack say how he saw his brothers? I asked Nyala before we left our room to hit the showers. Said they just showed up in his room. And no one saw them coming or going. She shrugged. He said they were part of a special unit, right? I really wanted to meet his brothers and see if they could teach me how to easily disappear and reappear. I was worried about Zack finding out his dad had been murdered, but he seemed to be holding up for the time being. When I got a chance to talk to him again, I'd dig a little deeper and make sure any pent-up emotions weren't going to come out at the wrong time and get him hurt. When we stepped out of the bathroom, Nyala gasped. Carter stood right in front of us, like he was waiting for us to come out. I glared at him, and he leered right back. Good morning, ladies, he said, tapping his head in salute. Morning, Carter, Nyala replied stiffly. I said nothing, since I wasn't supposed to talk to him. What, no hello from you? he asked. I shook my head, and grabbing Nyala's arm, dragged her away from him. Can't avoid me forever, Briar, he called after us and I kept my hand around Nyala's arm so I wouldn't flip him off like I wanted to. Did you see his eyes? She asked, as soon as we were back in our room. Yeah, I did. Cold, dead eyes. A shiver raced down my spine. If that wasn't Carter, then what was it? An undead of some kind? Or someone appearing as Carter? I didn't think any of that was possible. But even after all I'd been through, I was still new to this world. For all I knew, anything was possible with the right knowledge. Let's just get to breakfast, I said, as I grabbed my boots and slipped them on. I need coffee. Lots and lots of coffee. Chapter 7 Briar The second night back with Zack, I snuck up into his quarters, and the two of us, along with Hunter, went over everything we knew about what happened at Academy, as well as what he learned from his brothers. The amount of information was staggering, and I ended up getting hardly any sleep that night either. I'd seen the photos in Addie's file, the ones showing his mutilated body. Zack had snatched them away, but that one glimpse was enough to give me nightmares for the hour or two I managed to sleep before my alarm went off. I kept dreaming about undead breaking into my room, and tearing out my organs while I screamed and watched. I shuddered at breakfast two mornings later, just thinking about it again. You going to eat or what? Nyala asked through a yawn. She'd been up with us last night, too. I'd asked her to try to steer clear of it, but she insisted she was going to help because she had nothing better to do. I'd asked her about her studies, and she'd shrugged. She'd always been the good kid, never played the rebel, and now was her chance. I'd warned her how dangerous it might get, and Zack had barked a laugh at that, shooting me a look as if I were one to talk. I'd thrown a pillow at him to shut him up, 
but it bounced off and hit me in the face. That damned blocking of his. One of these days, I'd be able to tell he was doing it and break through it. Sorry, I was thinking, I murmured, nibbling at a piece of bacon. About what? If you were going to make students disappear out from under everyone's noses, how would you do it? I asked quietly. Wouldn't their friends or family ask questions? Mine would, but you said it yourself. If not for the three of us, no one would notice if you were gone. She grimaced as she said it, but I shrugged off her worry about hurting my feelings. You think they picked students based on who they were? I pondered that. The loners, ones who wouldn't be missed. But then, why was Bethany Morris taken? That is a damned good question, and one you should save for later tonight. We drained our coffee, then headed off to our first class of the day. I passed within a few feet of Zach on our way out the door and forced my head down so I wouldn't give us away. Each day it was getting harder and harder to act like I was still miserable and depressed at not being able to see him. My classes were the worst part of my days now. Not falling asleep was a real challenge, but somehow I managed to get through another morning and instead of eating lunch, snagged a quick nap for an hour in my room. Then it was off to hand to hand which helped wake me up even more, and then fire training. But when I reached the area designated on the lawns for fire, Woods was there talking to Taps. I stopped short when they both turned to me. Briar, could you come over here, please? Taps called out. I jogged to the two men and waited as they finished speaking quietly before Woods grunted in annoyance. Did I do something wrong? I asked. No, no, you didn't, Woods muttered. It appears we have strict instructions to begin your training using two elements at the same time. Really? But I can't even do that much with spirit yet. I know, but sadly the call is not up to us, though it should be. Taps snapped. His eyes flared with his own fire, and he shook his head. Damned military poking their head in where it doesn't belong. So then what am I supposed to do? You will no longer be under my tutelage. Taps explained, and my gut was suddenly in knots. Then whose? Mine. The voice made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end as I slowly turned around to discover Morris, no longer in his long military coat, but dressed in a more casual black uniform that somehow made him appear even more intimidating. I hadn't even thought to figure out what he summoned, but it was obvious now as we stared each other down. Flames appeared in those dark eyes of his. Eyes speckled with gold, just like mine. Shall we? He motioned for me and Woods to follow him as he moved towards the summoning circle across the lawn. Do I have a choice? I whispered. Woods gave me an encouraging look. When we reached the summoning circle, Morris stepped inside, and I hesitated, waiting until Woods was in there, too, before I joined them both. How exactly am I supposed to use fire with spirit? I asked. Spirit is a form of telekinesis, Morris said, clasping his hands behind his back with his feet shoulder-width apart. A true soldier. You are able to manipulate the world around you, as well as shield yourself, and in your case, astral project. For a few seconds, I pointed out. For now, he corrected sharply. If you train, you should be able to incorporate your fire into your telekinesis. Wood's lips thinned in disapproval. I frowned. I'm not sure I understand what you mean. I can already shoot fire where I want it to go. I control it that way. Why would I need to combine them? He held out his hands, and two flames appeared in his palms without any effort at all. Take the fire from my hands. At first I laughed, but his brow arched, and I nodded. I focused on the flames and stole them from his hands, calling his fire to mine and combining them in my hands. Annoyed, he huffed and pulled it right back from me, snuffing them out. No, not with your fire. Use spirit. I can't. Yes, you can. Again. Two more flames appeared in his palms. I glanced to Woods for guidance, but he was too busy glaring at Morris to help me out. I cleared my mind, easier now that I was able to spend time with the one person who was able to help me find my center. I drew on spirit. I felt it rising within me and forced it outward toward the flames. They flickered as sweat broke out on my brow from the effort, but I couldn't move them from Morris's hands. His power was too strong. 
I gasped and doubled over at the amount of energy it had taken. Again, he ordered. Just give me a second, all right? I muttered. There are no bricks, not until I say you can take one. Again, focus on the fire. I am, I said through gritted teeth. I stared intently at the fire until it was the only thing filling my vision. But each time I reached out with spirit, the flames resisted, clinging to the one who made them. I grunted in aggravation after my fifth failed attempt. I was dizzy and wanted to fall over, but Morris was ordering me to keep trying. I can't, I snapped furiously. You're not trying hard enough. Really, that's what you think. Why did you stop being such a dick about it? I yelled without thinking and slapped a hand over my mouth. Woods stifled a laugh, but the fire in Morris's eyes intensified. You are not dismissed from training until you succeed, he told me. Again. I crossed my arms. I'd already pissed him off. Why would I bother stopping now? No. No. Look, you standing there ordering me to do it is not going to make it magically happen. I can't do it yet. I'm not strong enough. I need more time. You don't get any more time. Remember what we discussed? Yeah, I do, I muttered. Hard to forget when I'm threatened. Then do it. Show me what you are capable of. I don't understand why you want me to use spirit. He closed his hands around the flames and stalked closer. I felt so small before him, but somewhere in the back of my head, a voice screamed that this man was my father and had abandoned me with an addict for a mother. I hated him, and he was not going to see how much he scared me at that moment. Spirit is a rare gift, one that can do much more than merely manipulate the world. When trained properly, you can target others' summoning abilities. You can steal them away. What? I asked, surprised. It's quite a gift. Since you are also a fire summoner, you will be able to manipulate fire that much easier, as well as steal it away and guide it. You will be able to cast it away from where you currently stand, without having to move. So like astral projecting flames? I asked, confused, trying to follow his meaning. Essentially, yes. Fire and spirit have never been combined before, and it is my job to see just what you can do with them. But if your spirit is weak, then you are not the witch I believe you to be. He lowered his head slightly, and those eyes softened for a split second, as had his tone. Then he pivoted and was back to his original spot with two flames in his palms. What was that all about? He freaking knew. He had to. Why did he refuse to say anything to me? Again, Morris demanded. I gave in. Eventually he would realize I couldn't do it and would give up on finding out what I was capable of. I ran over everything he had just explained to me, but in my head, none of it really made sense. Fire and spirit together could be powerful. How and why? They felt like opposites to me. Fire was wild, careless, destructive. And spirit? There was a strange calming sensation when it came to spirit. They clashed together inside my mind now as I focused on them both. Briar, Woods said, but I was too busy staring intently at the flames in Morris's hands to look up at him. Fire and spirit fought for control within me. Each time I felt the flames reach high, spirit would come and quench them, beating them back until it became too much and the fire spilled out around the cracks in the wall, flooding my mind. Fire and spirit, so much power and restraint at the same time. You're thinking too hard, Morris said loudly. Stop thinking and feel. You need to stop this right now, Woods demanded. Briar! I wanted to, but it was too late. Both the elements raged within me, and then I watched myself break free of my mind in a burst of flames. My hands reached out and snatched the fire from Morris's hands. Our eyes met for a heartbeat before I slammed right back into my body, staggering backward as I struggled to stay on my feet. And in my hands were two flames that I knew right away did not belong to me. Briar? Woods asked, worried, as he rushed to my side. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I started to say, then sank to the ground. Damn, what was that? That was you discovering the tip of the iceberg of your true potential, Morris answered, sounding almost impressed. Take a breath, and then we will go again. I stared at the fire still in my hands. I didn't think I could douse them. Fire couldn't burn another summoner of fire, 
but it was nearly impossible to put out the flames cast by another. The strange wet sensation of spirit started at my shoulders and washed down my arms, surrounding my hands and doused the flames. Huh. Interesting, I mused. Interesting is one word for it, Woods whispered. Dangerous is another. I still don't understand. How can I steal someone shaking the ground or moving the wind? I asked him as he helped me get back to my feet. Several groups of students stood around, watching. Figures. It's not something that can be explained with words, Woods told me. Only feeling. Emotion. That's what guides spirit. Lesson number one. I nodded slowly in agreement. I tried to think back over what I'd done to get that fire from Morris, but the actual process eluded me. The elements I'd summoned knew what needed to be done, and they just did it. I hated not having any definite answers, but Zack had told me last semester that where the elements were concerned, if any witch or warlock claimed to know exactly how they worked, they were full of horse shit. The elements were of nature and magic, not man. They were the ones really in control, and we were merely vessels of a sort. I imagined forming a shield out of flames instead of spirit, of both of them together, and grinned, liking the notion a bit too much. But hey, if the undead decided to attack again, they'd be caught on fire the second they tried to get to me, right? Let's go, Morris snapped, and two more flames appeared in his hands. Don't think, just do it. I waited until Woods stepped away, then concentrated on the two elements filling me up again. I might hate the man who stood across from me, but if he wanted to turn me into a formidable weapon, I'd be damned sure it would come back and bite him in the ass. Chapter 8 Zack You're falling asleep again, I said, nudging Briar. Huh? No, I'm good, promise, she mumbled patting her cheeks hard. Really, I got this. Bring on the coffee. There were bags under her eyes, and even as she sat up again on my bed, her back against the wall, her eyes started to drift closed again. Morris had taken over her training the past few days, and it was wearing her out during the day. Plus, lack of sleep at night so we could continue to investigate the conspiracy on campus meant she had to be beyond exhausted. I tried to convince her to stay in her room tonight and get some sleep, but she flat out refused, and as soon as night fell, she was outside my door. I knew what else bothered her. Spring break was barely two weeks away, and after that, she'd be forced to try to astral project inside another person's head again. I wasn't sure who dreaded it more, her or me. You sure? I asked again, and she nodded, going through another collection of articles on necromancers that had popped up in the last fifty years. Yep, just give me some coffee and I'll be good. I frowned, but got up to head to our small kitchenette to brew a fresh pot. Hunter was passed out on the couch, snoring, a stack of books beside him. I let him sleep, being as quiet as I could as I waited for the coffee, gurgling away in the pot. When it was finished, I poured two cups and carried them back into my room. I paused in the doorway, smiling softly at the sight. Briar was wearing my sweatshirt and had curled up on the bed her head on my pillow, sound asleep. Quietly I set the mugs down, removed the articles and books from the bed, and drew the blanket up over her, figuring I'd wake her when it grew closer to morning. Her hand reached out and snagged mine. What's wrong? I asked, but she was smiling. Nothing at all. She tugged on my hand, and I took the hint, sliding next to her and drawing her close. She snuggled against me, and I reached for my cell. What are you doing? setting an alarm. Once it was ready to go, I put my phone aside and wrapped my other arm around her securely. Her eyes were already closed again, and I yawned, ready to drift off myself when I yelped, Damn, are your toes always so cold? She laughed quietly as those ice cubes moved over my foot, and I did my best to warm them. Yeah, sorry about that. Just get some sleep, I whispered, planting a kiss atop her head. Zack? Mm hmm. She didn't say anything, and I thought she'd fallen asleep again. But when I glanced down, her eyes were wide open and looking up at me. Shroud? It's just the last few times we've, you know, and I, uh, 
I don't want you to think that I'm leading you on or something if we don't. I mean, if we wait a while longer... Damn. You know, I'm facing the threat of necromancers and undead just fine, but I can't even get these words out right. She grumbled as her cheeks turned red. I had no idea what she was trying to tell me at first. And then it clicked, and I laughed. That was the wrong move, and she socked me in the shoulder. Ouch, what was that for? Why are you laughing? I'm not laughing at you, honest, I said, catching her hand when she drew back for a second hit. But I'm in no hurry to pick up the pace with you, I promise. I'm not that type of guy. I didn't think you were, but this is my first relationship. And I don't know, guess I was just worried. That you'd what, lose me if we didn't? Briar, look at me, I said, gently lifting her chin. Those dark eyes with the gold flecks held so much confused emotion and caring for me that I was speechless for a few seconds. When the time is right, we'll know it. But until then, please don't make a big deal out of it. I'm not going to dump you over something as shallow as us not moving further along with our relationship. Right. I mean, I know, and I trust you. I just... Uh, had a weird moment there. All your moments are weird. I teased, and she punched me again. Ow, really? Who the hell is training you in hand-to-hand? -hand? You're going to start leaving bruises. Good, maybe you'll stop driving me nuts then. Why would I do that? You make the cutest damn face when you're pissed. She went to strike me again, but this time I blocked it, and she gasped as the blowback made her arm shake. She glared at me even as she smiled, and I beamed back at her. Then I was tickling her sides, and she laughed, trying to catch my hands to get me to stop. We rolled over, and she pinned me to the bed, finally snagging my hands, mostly because I let her. Both of us were out of breath, but suddenly, I was wide awake, and so was she. I ran my hands through her hair as she lowered her mouth to mine. Every kiss with her was like a new experience. She was fire and passion. And I admitted only to myself that I wished we were at that point to go a bit further. My hands found her hips, and moved up underneath the sweatshirt, then paused on her back. What? What's wrong? She asked, drawing back. But my hands were frozen in place. Zack? She was grinning mischievously at me as I blinked a few times, trying to clear the lump in my throat. I saw it clear as day in her eyes she wasn't ready for this, and neither was I. This wasn't the time, anyway. Why, Shroud, you seem to be wearing nothing beneath my hoodie, I commented. Really? Huh. I could have sworn I was. Is that so? She shrugged. You know me, always losing things. I smoothed my hands down her back as she planted another kiss on my lips, and any idea of sleeping tonight went out the window. An alarm rang shrilly, and I grunted as I tried to find it to turn it off. A warm body shifted beside mine in my bed, and I shot up, looking around. Briar was next to me under the covers, burrowing deeper as the alarm continued to go off. I grabbed for it, knowing I had to wake her up so she could get back to her room. Hunter knocked on my door and opened it at the same time. Hey man, what's with the early morning? Oh, shit, sorry, he said, closing the door just as quickly. Right, guess I'll head downstairs. See you at breakfast. She climbed out of bed. I followed her, both of us hurrying past Hunter, who stood in the hall, his face red. Bye, Hunter. Bye, he said and waved. I wrapped an arm around her waist and kissed her one final time before she left my quarters. I stayed in the doorway for a few seconds before I shut the door, turning to find Hunter giving me two thumbs up. I playfully shoved him out of the way to get back to my room. Don't get any ideas, I told him. It's not what you think. No, you're too much of a gentleman, but sure look like you two kitties had some fun. Whatever, I'm going back to bed for a few hours. Sweet dreams, he called after me. I rolled my eyes as I shut my door in his face. But I definitely had sweet dreams, to start with, at least. Briar and I were back at the waterfall, but then everything disappeared, and she was screaming as Morris dragged her away from me. I tried to reach her, but an army of undead blocked my way. They swarmed me, and I woke up drenched in a cold sweat, still reaching for Briar, her name on my lips. Damn. I flopped back down and shut my eyes when my second alarm for the morning went off. I turned off the annoying sound, 
and saw a text from Briar telling me last night meant more to her than I could imagine. I texted back a brief reply, telling her that it was honestly the best night I'd ever had, too. As soon as I sent it, I grunted at how cheesy that sounded, but it was too late now. I grabbed fresh clothes and my shower kit and went to get ready for the day. I tried to shake off the dream I'd had, but each time there was a loud noise, students goofing off and screaming or hollering, I flinched, as if waiting to be ambushed by those undead again. Hunter asked me a few times if I was all right, and I nodded. Dude, really, he said by lunchtime. You're pale. Bad dream, I mumbled, keeping an eye on the doors for Briar. And there she was, talking to Nyala and appearing quite happy. I caught myself grinning as I watched her, then sensed another set of eyes on me. I expected to see Ivan, but instead it was Carter, glaring at me from across the room. You ever notice where he goes at night? Hunter asked suddenly. What do you mean? I mean the last few times I've been on dorm duty and watched everyone turn in for the night, Carter is always leaving the dorms. It's like he wanders around campus all night long or something. Was he following me or Briar? No, we would have seen him, or he would have called us out on it by now. Got plans tonight? I asked Hunter. What did you have in mind? I think we should stalk him for a change. I glared right back at the bastard as I pulled out my cell and texted Briar. A break from the books would be good for all of us, and if it would give us more of an idea of what was going on with this Carter impersonator, then I was game for it. Briar texted me back a few seconds later, saying she was in. Well, looks like we have plans tonight, I told Hunter. Should be fun, right? Yeah, fun until he realizes we're following him, and he comes after us with ten of his closest zombified buddies. Hunter grunted picking at spaghetti that suddenly looked too gory for both of us. We shoved our trays away and settled on finishing our drinks before leaving the hall. You're wrong, Briar whispered. You've got to be. I'm not. I swear he leaves the dorms and disappears, Hunter said quietly. Then why haven't we seen him yet? She asked. I shushed them both, peering through the shrubs around the dorm for any sign of Carter. Hunter insisted he saw him leaving the dorms again and hadn't caught him coming back, which meant he was around here somewhere. Briar and I had to wait until it was dark before we could sneak out and join Hunter. For two hours, we'd been hiding in the shadows of the dorm building, just waiting. This is a waste of time, I said, sitting back on my heels. You're sure you saw him leave? Hunter mocked my words as he tilted his head back and forth. Yeah, I did. I was starting to wonder if we shouldn't try to check out the main building, when Briar grabbed my arm hard and pointed. Across the lawn, seeming to appear out of the shadows and nowhere near the main building, was Carter. His walk seemed off, like he was overbalanced. I waited for him to come to the dorms, but then he veered right, and the three of us shared a quick glance before we moved out of the bushes and followed as close as we dared, meaning we kept him just in our sights. Where is he going? Briar whispered. I thought we'd see him head into the main building, as there was a chance he was working with Ivan, or even Hook. Morris seemed a stretch, but there was always that chance. But he walked to the right of the building, and I cursed as I realized where he was going. Zack? Any bets on if he's going to head into the cathedral? I asked them both. Hunter smacked himself in the forehead. Yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. What am I missing? Briar asked. You'll see soon enough. With our research on necromancers and the murders of my dad and Addie, I'd completely forgotten to tell her about the abandoned building on campus. The one that no one seemed to know what had been there before it was deemed uninhabitable, condemned really, and closed off to students and staff. Carter kept on a straight path toward it, and we struggled to keep up and stay hidden at the same time. Suddenly he stopped, and we dropped to the ground, pressing ourselves as flat as we could. There was a bright flash of wide light, and by the time we'd gotten ourselves up off the ground again, he was gone. Wait, where did he go? Briar asked, glancing around wildly. He was just there. That light, you think it has something to do with the building? Hunter asked as he approached it slowly. I expected Carter to jump out at us from somewhere, but he was simply gone. We arrived at the cathedral without incident, and I started to reach for the boarded-up front doors. 
Briar grabbed my hands to stop me. Are you crazy? What? I want to see if it's open. What if it's booby-trapped? I grinned at her serious scowl. Booby-trapped? We're not in some hidden temple. I don't think a giant boulder is going to come and squash us. No? You ever think it could be something worse because there's magic and the undead involved? She shot back. I dropped my hand. Right. Good point. Sometimes I have those. I tried to peer through the wooden boards and the cracks of the doors, but there were no lights on inside that I could see. We walked around the entire building, well, as far as we could, since the rear wall of it was actually inside the cave wall. Every window was boarded over, and there was only that one main door. If Carter was inside, he used magic to get in there, which meant we would have to do the same. But the chances of our using magic and not drawing attention to ourselves, if there was something going on in that building, were slim to none. Should we wait around, see if he comes out? Briar suggested. We have a few hours till we need to get back to the dorms. Probably should. Let's go set up over there. He won't be able to see us if he comes back. We headed for a few trees and the overgrown bushes that had once made up a nice-sized garden in front of this building. I leaned my back against a tree and let Briar rest against me, while Hunter laid down completely in leaves. Within minutes he was snoring away, and Briar was laughing quietly as I rolled my eyes. He's impossible to sleep in the same room with. I bet. Nyala snores a bit, but it's a lot quieter than that leaf blower. You snore too, I pointed out quietly, and she tried to reach around and pinch me. I blocked it, and then she snuggled back further into my lap. I never said it was a bad thing. Kind of cute, actually. Oh, just like my pissed-off face? Something like that, yeah. I wrapped my arms around her, keeping my eyes fixed on the door to the building. Never thought scoping out a creepy old building would work as a date, she mused. Have we ever actually had a date? Officially, I mean? She laughed with me. Ah, uh -huh, that would be a no. We've had late nights in the library. Fighting the undead. And then, you know, the whole sneaking around at night and making out. But no, no actual dates, she sighed, shaking her head as she clicked her tongue. I think you're slacking there, Zachary Pierce. Sounds like I am. Guess I'll have to make up for it. I closed my arms tighter around her and wished we were doing something other than sitting on the chilly ground, waiting for Carter, who was not Carter, to come out of an abandoned building that may or may not be filled with undead, necromancers, or who knew what else at this point. I watched the doors intently, jerking my head every time I felt like I was falling asleep. I must have drifted off anyway, because Briar was suddenly smacking my arm to wake me covering my mouth with her hand. I nodded, and she pointed over her shoulder. Hunter was already awake, too, and was gazing through the bushes. Carter, he whispered. He came out a few minutes ago, but he wasn't alone. I squinted, and then cursed. Ivan, how long have they been talking? Just a few minutes, Briar told me. There was another bright flash, and then they were standing there. It has to be their way in and out. I checked my watch. It was almost six in the morning. We can't stay here forever. Can't exactly move, either, she pointed out. We'll risk a few more minutes. I knew she was right, but getting caught by Hook or Ivan was not what I had in mind, either. We'd managed not to get caught yet, sneaking around at night like this, but all it took was one slip-up. After a few tense minutes, Carter and Ivan moved away from the cathedral, and we watched until they disappeared from sight. Hunter started to go, but I grabbed his shirt and shook my head. Give them a few more minutes to get inside. He hunkered back down. Five long minutes ticked by, then we stood up. We glanced around, but we were alone. The light, however, was increasing quickly, and we had to run back to the dorm building. We were rounding the corner and ready to dart inside, when I snatched Briar's arm and pulled her back around, pushing her behind the bushes as Hunter and I continued without her and right into Ivan. Zachary, Hunter, he stated, glaring back and forth between us as his heavy brow furrowed. A bit early for the two of you to be out and about, isn't it? Practicing, Ivan, Hunter said quickly. I nodded. Practicing for what exactly? Aura reading, I told him. You know how hard this final test of mine is going to be, and Woods told me to get as much practice as I could. Best time for me to meditate and have peace and quiet 
is before everyone else gets up, right? The day was fast approaching, and any second now, the trace on Briar was going to react, and Ivan would know what was happening. We had to get him away from the door. I suppose so, he said, and started to walk toward the side of the building where Briar was hiding. I moved right into his path, heart pounding, and smiled. Would you mind helping me out? And how would I do that? Hunter's aura is honestly too easy. I'm around him all the time. But, I said, politely pulling him away from the building and back toward the summoning circle, yours would certainly present me with a greater challenge. Ivan glanced toward the circle, and I waved my hand behind my back for Briar to make a run for it. I had no way of knowing if she made it or not, and then Ivan was facing the dorms again. I waited for him to call her out, but he only huffed and crossed his arms. I don't have time for your games, Zachary. You and Hunter stay out of trouble. I'm watching you, he warned, and stormed toward the main building. I let out a breath of relief as the sky within the cave gave way to morning, and I sagged against Hunter. Too damned close, I muttered. Shit. She got inside. I saw her, he assured me. What do you think they're doing in there? No idea, but I'd say I found our new nightly routine, I grimaced, knowing how little sleep we were already getting. And we need to figure out what warding they have on the cathedral. That light we saw, I think it's a hidden doorway. Great, because that doesn't complicate our plans at all. I patted him on the back. Come on, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. Ah, that's a nice one. Really, I appreciate it a lot. So there's something else I need your help with, I told him, as we followed Ivan's path toward the main building and breakfast. Is it something easy, at least? Maybe, but it's definitely an area where you excel. I stopped him as we neared the hall. I need to plan a date for Briar and myself. He chuckled. Oh, man, are you telling me last semester at no time did you think to take that poor girl on an actual date? Not even a romantic candle at dinner together while you had the catacombs all to yourself before you burned them down? I wasn't exactly planning on being in a relationship. But now, now you are, and you realize how horrible you are at being a boyfriend. I glanced around quickly to make sure no one was listening to us. Hard to be her boyfriend when we can only see each other at night. And then we can't even be normal because we're too busy investigating some damned conspiracy. Makes romance a bit difficult. Well, my friend, you have come to the right person. I'll come up with something. I appreciate it. Hopefully when I graduate, I can take her somewhere fun to get away from all of this. I hate to be the pessimistic voice here, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, you're probably right. I sank onto a bench at a table and poured myself some coffee, sipping it as I realized our research list had just got a hell of a lot longer. Time to find a way to break through wards and invisible doors. Oh, joy. Chapter 9. Briar Spring break arrived far too soon, but at least it meant a week's break from classes and training. Or at least training with Woods and Morris. We'd found all dead ends when it came to any new information on the necromancer's recent activities, but we'd figured out how the invisible doors worked. There was no way to break in without essentially destroying the cathedral. The warding was too intense, and we all agreed Carter had not put it in place, which left Ivan, Hook, or even Morris. We have to find a way inside that damned building, I muttered one night, sitting with Zack in the cave with the waterfall. Maybe we can knock Carter over the head right before he goes in or something. They'll have a defense in case of that. How do you know? Because it's what I would do, he explained. Come on, you said you would do it. I flicked my annoyed glance at him and refused to budge from my spot near the stream inside the cave with the waterfall. What if we created our own door? Then anyone inside will know we were there. The point would be to get in undetected. Why don't we just ask your brothers to do it then? I mumbled. I texted them, but they haven't got back to me yet. Shroud, you're wasting moonlight. Do we have to? He grumbled a few choice words under his breath about stubborn and something else, and I gave in, getting up from my spot and going to join him sitting on the soft moss surrounded by those luminescent flowers. I sat down hard, sending petals scattering all around us. I watched Herbert chase them, 
refusing to look at Zack until he reached out and took my hand. You said you would try this. Yeah, but not on you, I snapped. Who else is there? I threw my head back. I don't know. I could find someone who annoys me. During training on the last day before spring break, Morris told me that he was still expecting me to astral project inside someone's mind when we picked classes back up. I'd been freaking out about it ever since, and Zach volunteered to help me out. I thought we were just going to do some intense meditation or whatnot, but no, the idiot wanted to be a guinea pig. You're not going to hurt me. Says you. I trust you. Makes one of us, I said, disgruntled. He took my other hand. What? I snapped. Stop doubting yourself for five damn seconds. You know everything you've done in your training with Morris has never been seen before, right? I hung my head as I mumbled, so what? So you can do more than you think. You just have to learn control. You know why you hurt Carter, right? He was attacking you, and you defended yourself. I, however, will not be attacking you. I blew out a heavy breath. Wishing I had his confidence in myself. I still think you're an idiot. He grinned, and those eyes glimmered with amusement. I have those thoughts sometimes myself, but this is not one of those times. Give it a try. One try, that's all I ask. If this goes badly, I reserve the right to say I told you so, I warned him. Deal. Now, clear your mind. I shut my eyes and breathed in deeply through my nose and out through my mouth ten times before my body slowly started to relax. With each breath, another muscle came loose, and another, until I was as calm as I was probably going to get, knowing what I was about to do. Is your mind clear? Zack asked softly. Yes, I said, but I heard the tension in that one word. Briar, you have to clear your mind completely. Trust in yourself. Trust me, he instructed. I'm trying. I know. Take your time. I shook out my hands, stretched my back, and attempted to think of nothing that was going to make this little experiment end badly. I wasn't sure how long I sat there before I finally felt at ease enough to continue. All right, I'm ready, I said, sounding way more confident than I felt. Kudos to me. I want you to picture your mind taking a short trip into mine, Zack said in that same soft tone, only for a few seconds, and only long enough for you to know you're there before returning to your own mind. Got it? I nodded, realized he probably had his eyes closed, and said, yep, got it. I thought about Zack, and only Zack. I wondered what he might be thinking or feeling, and knew if I could just peer inside his mind, I would have those answers but I didn't want to hurt him. I emphasized that last part to myself over and over again. This was not going to be like what happened with Carter. I was going to merely take a peek inside, just a peek, and then return to my own mind. For a few minutes, I thought nothing was happening, but then spirit welled within me, moving through my entire body like a steady stream of cool water. A lightness made me dizzy, and then I was torn away from my mind and landed in a memory that was not mine. Well, not exactly. I was in it, but this was from Zack's perspective. My pulse pounded as excitement coursed through me that I'd done it, but I was trying not to react and lose the connection too fast in case I hurt Zack. I wasn't really standing, more like floating in the background as the memory played out in front of me. It was the first night we were able to see each other again, right here beside this waterfall. At first, all I could do was see, but then words came to me, and I was thrown out of his head by the intensity of his emotions. I gasped and found myself staring up at the cave ceiling, Zack peering down at me, worry in his eyes. Can you hear me? He asked, smoothing my hair from my face. Shroud. Yeah, yeah, I'm good, I think. He helped me sit up slowly. I shook out my head, making me flinch. Ouch. You were there, he said, sounding impressed and a little worried. I felt you in my head. Oh, I was there all right, I said and laughed nervously. You threw me out. I did. How? I don't think you meant to, 
but I felt everything you were feeling, I explained. He nodded slowly as he asked, And do I want to know what you saw inside my head? I grinned as I patted his cheek. Nothing embarrassing, don't worry. You good to try again? You're really not going to tell me. I got myself resituated and waited for him to do the same. Not yet, at least. Ready? He frowned as he sat across from me, but I closed my eyes and waited until he told me he was good to go. I steadied my breathing and reached out to him, trying to understand a bit more about how it worked. This time when I left my mind, I opened my eyes at an earlier point in the projection than I did last time. I watched my astral form move next to Zack as he sat, completely relaxed with his eyes closed. I wondered if he would be able to see me or not. Gently, I reached out and pressed my hand to his temple. Instantly I was sucked into his mind and fell into another memory. No, not a memory. This was different, chaotic, and loud. There was no single image to hold on to, but everything raced around me. The emotional state was just as bad, and each time I tried to hold on to one feeling, one train of thought, I was dumped off on another, and then another. My aggravation started to grow, and then I felt myself thrust back inside my own head as Zack grunted in pain. Zack? I asked, struggling to see through the haze blocking my vision. You all right? Zack? Yeah, I'm here, I think. I blinked furiously, and he finally came into focus, lying on his back and pinching the bridge of his nose. I crawled over to him. Damn it, I hurt you. See, this is exactly why I didn't want to do this. I'm not hurt, he argued. You just left me with a nasty headache this time. I don't believe you. Blindly, he reached for my hand, and I took it. Swear I'm fine. What did you do this time? Felt you in there, but it was like you were sprinting around in circles, or driving a truck repeatedly into the side of my skull. I fell back beside him, shaking my head. Not sure. I was there, but this time, I wasn't inside a memory. It's like I fell right into your train of thought, and you tell me to clear my thoughts before I do this crap. Your mind was far from cleared. Sorry, my fault. Started overthinking a few things. A few? It was like being dumped into a blender. He chuckled. I punched him in the arm. Ouch, come on. I already have a headache. Isn't that enough? I punched his arm one more time until he caught my hand. I told you this was a bad idea. Was it? You managed to do it twice. And we're not trying it again, I stated firmly. Whatever you say, he murmured, and then I was laughing as he drew me over onto him so he could kiss me. You'll be fine next week, he promised me looking into my eyes intently. With any luck, you'll leave Morris with a nasty headache for a few days, and he'll back off. Or he'll take it as progress and push harder. I plucked at his t-shirt. On the bright side, the semester is getting closer to being over. Not quick enough, he complained. Hunter have anything to say about Carter? We'd been taking shifts looking out for him and seeing if we could pick up on what was happening inside the cathedral. So far, we'd only seen him enter and leave. No sign of Ivan or any students, but my gut told me that might change soon enough. Those fourth-year students, they were taken around this time, I reminded Zack. We'll keep a close eye on him and everyone else as best we can. He laid his head back and grimaced. Damn, you really do pack a punch, Shroud. How about we turn in for the night so you can rest your poor widow head? I cooed obnoxiously, and he rolled us over so he pinned me to the mossy ground. Just saying, don't want my fragile mentor to be hurting. When my head isn't throbbing like someone smashed me with a brick, you're going to pay for that, he said, then kissed me soundly. Come on, let's get back to the dorms. With my hand in his, we left the cave sanctuary and strolled slowly back across the lawns. You know, I noticed something the other night, I told him as we went. Might be nothing, but a few of the older books that mention necromancers all very briefly reference a text of some kind. What was it called? I scrunched my face up, but the last two trips inside his head had jostled my own thoughts around too much to remember. I jotted it down somewhere. I'll text you when I find it. Think we'll hear from your brothers anytime soon? Doubt it, but if they find something, I'm sure they'll find a way to let us know. We said nothing until we were outside my door, and he pulled me around into his arms. You'll be fine he whispered in my ear. 
trust yourself. I know, I just keep thinking of what Carter went through. Granted, though Morris is a bit of a D-bag, he might still be my dad. Is it wrong to want to cause him pain? Zack shrugged, but he was grinning as he said, I'm sure he deserves it. Get some sleep. See you tomorrow night. He kissed the top of my head and waited until I was inside my room like he always did before I heard his steps moving away. I stayed by the door for a few minutes longer, sorting through what I'd felt the last time when I was inside his head. There was chaos, but beyond that, I caught a glimpse of how worried he really was for me, and at the same time, how much he cared. I hadn't wanted to let him know I'd seen what I considered to be some pretty private thoughts, but they would get me through the next few days, knowing for certain I had Zack in my life. Morris was already at the summoning circle Monday afternoon when I arrived for my training. He was talking quietly with Woods as I approached. The night before, Zack and I agreed it'd be best if I slept through the night. So I hadn't seen him, and I regretted it. I might have gotten a full eight hours of sleep, but my hands shook with nerves, and I was filled with so much anxiety, I wasn't sure how I managed to stay upright. Ah, there you are, Morris said as he turned and spotted me. Sadly, I whispered, setting my bag down on the bench. Well, come on then, we don't have all day. He moved to the other side of the circle, and Woods and I reluctantly followed, stepping over the white stones and then taking a seat on the ground. He mirrored me, but Woods stayed off to the side. Do as you normally would, clear your mind or whatever you call it. I started to respond with a smart-ass remark, but swallowed it back and closed my eyes. I half hoped he changed his mind about today, and this was going to be just another intense session of using my spirit as well as my fire, something I had yet to get close to mastering. But once I felt myself settle into my happy place, Morris climbed to his feet. What are you doing? I asked, confused. Training you. Stand up. Why? If you're going to get inside someone's head, it's most likely you're not going to be in a calm, peaceful setting. Oh no, I snapped. You said this was going to be different. Get up, Briar, he said and took a threatening step toward me. I want you to use your astral projections as you did that day with Carter. I can't. Do you want to be dragged away from Academy? He snapped. My jaw dropped and even Woods started to protest, but Morris held up his hand and he stopped. I was backing away toward the stones when a wall of fire suddenly reared up behind me. I could have walked through it, but the heat was intense and it forced me back toward Morris. Time to see what you can really do, he said. Astral project. I stayed as far away from him as I could, but the fire spread until it surrounded the entire summoning circle. I was too emotionally unstable now to do it with a clear head, and I kept telling him that, but he came at me as if to attack, and I flung my hands out, creating a block with spirit before my fire burst to life in my hands and spiraled around him. Stop attacking me with fire and get inside my mind. I ducked under a blow he threw at me and rolled back to my feet, my hand-to-hand -hand training kicking in. But he was a general. There was no way I was going to win this. He knocked me back with a blast of fire. Why are you doing this? I yelled at him in frustration. Others are not happy with the results. You need to show what else you can do, he said, his chest heaving as much as mine as we both caught our breath. I glared at him, ready to tell him and whoever else cared about me so much that they could go and screw themselves, but I was sure I spied a hint of pleading in those dark eyes that looked exactly like mine. What was he trying to do? How did this help either of us, showing these other assholes what I could do? I didn't want to be seen as a weapon or a tool. But then he came at me without any hit of an attack, and I did just like I did with Carter. Morris's fire stilled before my eyes, and then I wasn't in my body anymore but inside his head. I braced to fall into the chaos of his thoughts, like I had with Zack, but instead I found myself standing in a crystal clear memory, almost like he wanted me to see what he saw. I lifted my hands, but they were see-through, as was the rest of me. I looked around me, and the environment slowly came into focus. We were at Academy, standing outside the main building. Morris was beside me, and in front of him was Headmaster Hook and a tattooed man. At first, I thought it was Dresden, but then he turned, and I had a clearer view of his face. Not Dresden. His tattoos were pretty close, 
but his eyes were so light blue they were almost white, and he had a black beard and mustache that hung low. They were talking, but the words sounded far away. I strained, wanting to know what was happening, when suddenly the words came at me with total clarity. What the hell happened, Hook? Morris snapped. Where is my daughter? I don't know, Hook replied, running a shaking hand through his hair. I swear it. We had no idea she was missing until this morning, and we summoned you right away. How long? Morris demanded. How long, damn it? We don't know. Your daughter roomed alone, you know that. She wasn't exactly known for being outgoing, either. We didn't know until one of her close friends finally came to us. Hook hung his head, kicking at the ground. We searched her rooms, but she's simply gone. Fire erupted around Morris's feet as he glared Hook down. What kind of academy are you running here, huh? The daughter of a general just vanishes and no one notices? I don't know what to tell you. There were no alarms triggered. I'm going to find out what's happening here, Hook. And when I do, if I find you or Ivan had anything to do with it, I'll be back for you both, he warned. And you, any leads or not? He asked the tattooed man. I assumed Morris believed he was undercover, as was Dresden but the twitchy look in the man's eyes made me suspicious of him. From the way Morris's gaze narrowed, he wasn't buying it either. But whatever was said next was lost as I was dragged away from that moment and thrown into another one. We stood in an office. I supposed it was Morris's, wherever he was stationed. He appeared to have aged, the lines on his face I hadn't seen before. But I had a feeling it was just from the worry of his daughter's vanishing. I saw papers scattered all over his desk most with Bethany's name on them. He was mumbling under his breath, sounding a bit mad, when a knock interrupted the moment. We both looked up, and he called whomever it was to enter. Better be important, he snarled. Sir, I was told to bring this to you right away. What is it? He took the sealed envelope from the soldier, but the man was already turning around and leaving. Morris harumphed as he broke the wax seal and read the letter. Whatever it said made him turn pale and sit. I peered over his shoulder to try to read what it said, wondering if they had found Bethany dead after all. But then the room faded away, and we landed in another place. Cars honked, and there was street construction. Morris wore jeans and a regular leather jacket, looking nothing like the general I was used to. He stared down at the letter in his hand, then back up at the old dirty brick building in front of us. No, I whispered, and felt my gut fall. This building... I knew it as much as I tried not to remember it. Morris took a deep breath to steel himself for what was inside, and then he was moving for the front door. I followed behind him, feeling like I was lost in my own personal nightmare. He climbed the stairs two at a time to the fifth floor, where half the lights in the long stretch of hall never worked. The air was stale, and the door he stopped at had a large number 15 on it, the numbers rusty and dangling by one nail each. He raised his hand and knocked three times. I held my breath, waiting for this to turn out to be something different. But then the door opened, and the face of a twelve-year-old girl appeared. Yeah? I choked on my surprise as my own memory of this very moment started to mix with his. Hi, Morris said, then cleared his throat. Hi, is, uh, is your, is your mom home? Why did he sound angry when he asked? Had he and Mom not gotten along? The younger version of me shook her head and started to close the door. Not here, and don't know where she is. Wait just one second, Morris said and crouched down. My younger self started to back into the apartment, then stopped, tilting her head to the side. She was studying his eyes, because it's exactly what I'd done. Are you Briar? She opened the door more. Briar Shroud. Morris seemed to struggle, trying to figure out what to say but then he hung his head and muttered, I want you to know, whenever you feel alone, know that you're not, all right? What's that supposed to mean? The girl snapped, all curiosity gone. There's going to be a time when your life is going to change, and you're going to believe you're alone in the world, but you aren't. Can you remember that? Whatever, man, go away, she said, and slammed the door in his face. Morris straightened, wiping a hand down his aggravated face, but I sensed he wasn't angry at the girl. At me. I can't tell you the truth, he whispered, 
and I assumed he was talking to the door. But when I glanced up, his eyes were looking right at me. I couldn't then, and now it's even more dangerous. Briar, your sister was taken, and if we're not careful, they'll take you too. I couldn't save you from this life without putting your life in even more danger. What are you saying? I asked, not sure if he'd hear me or not. I'm saying Academy has not been safe for a very long time. But I'm here, and no matter what you might hear, think, or believe, I'm here to protect you. You are my daughter, the one I didn't find out about until it was too late. I wanted to rant at him and scream for knocking up Mom and then leaving us both, but the pain in his eyes stopped me short. He hadn't known about me until he got that letter. However, he met up with Mom, whatever happened between them. She'd never told him. The walls of the hall started to shimmer, but I didn't want to leave. No, why can't you just tell people? I asked, trying to reach for him, but my hand passed right through his shoulder. It's too dangerous. Addie and Pierce were only the beginning. Are you in danger? His lips moved, but I couldn't hear anything coming out of his mouth. I moved toward him, but a high-pitched scream tore through my head, and I clutched at my skull, trying to make it stop. The hallway disappeared, and I heard a man yell in pain as my mind was thrown back into my own. I was on the ground. Woods was saying my name, but I couldn't get myself to respond except to blink. Somewhere, a man was groaning. Damn you, Morris! Woods grunted as he slowly helped me upright. The groaning man was Morris, and he cursed again, clearly in pain. Serves you right for pushing her to do that. Woods sounded furious. But she did it, Morris said slowly. I met his gaze, and as Woods continued to mutter about irresponsible military personnel, Morris's brow furrowed, and he bowed his head slightly to me. He was my dad. There was no question about it. His warnings and his promise raced through my mind. Then the moment was over, and he glowered at me as he got to his feet. For a first attempt, it was sloppy. You'll have to do better than that, Shroud. Much better. Do we understand one another? You can't expect her to try that again, Woods complained. Not today, no. But tomorrow, and the next, until she can do it as easily as she summons fire. Get your rest while you can. Then he was gone stalking out of the circle and across the lawns, rubbing furiously at his temples. Woods made me take my time getting back to my feet. I was woozy, but at least I was still conscious. Are you sure you're all right? he asked. Yeah, just tired all of a sudden. Mind if we call it a day? I'd say we could call it a week, but I doubt he would allow it. Get some rest, Briar. I thanked him and slowly picked up my things and made my way across campus. Several curious, even a few scared, sets of eyes followed me, but for once I had too much on my mind to pay them any attention. Back inside my quarters, I sank onto my bed and replayed the events I'd witnessed in Morris's head. I suspected it since last semester, but seeing that proof laid out before me, knowing he didn't hate me at all, but was doing his best to keep me safe, it was a lot for anyone to take in. I dug my cell out of my tote and told Zack we needed to talk again as soon as night came. Well, Zack said later that night, after I'd finished telling him what I'd seen in Morris's head. Well, what? He opened his mouth, closed it again, tried a second time, then shrugged. On the bright side, you know who your dad is, right? Yeah, and he's not that bad a guy after all. Plays the part well enough. He's doing it to keep you safe. Makes sense. Bethany, I'm assuming, has never been found, and the last thing he wants is to lose his second daughter, Zack said, pulling me close against his side. Sounds to me like he's trying to make up for not being there. A little late for that, I snapped, then groaned in aggravation. Why can't anything be easy? Ever. What do you think? He asked as I rested my head against his shoulder curling into his side and wishing I could disappear. You going to be able to handle this? Don't have a choice. I said nothing for a few minutes as I tried to think of why he would be threatening to take me away from Academy, seeing as how I was his daughter, then sat up and stared at Zack. He's not wanting to steal me away because of someone higher up. I think he wants to get me away from Hook. Then why not just take you? I started to answer, then stopped. Huh. 
Good point. Never mind. Whoever took your sister might be coming after you. They could be within our own military, and whomever your dad answers to could be in on it, which is why he has to act like he's threatening you. But if he takes you away from here, those people will have you. So he leaves me here with Hook? Zack nodded. Lesser of two evils, maybe. And here he might feel you at least have some form of protection. You won't just disappear like Bethany did. Or maybe he knows more about my brothers and what's going on here. He can't check it out himself, so he's hoping we'll keep investigating and find some answers. You know my head already hurt. This just makes it worse. Close your eyes and get some rest then. We can talk about this later. When later? I murmured through a yawn. We never seem to have time, and these nightly meetings are getting old, Zack. He pressed his lips to my head and sighed. I know, but we're almost there. Just a bit longer. We were in his room, and he tucked me under the blankets, ignoring my protests that I was awake enough to keep talking. But he was so warm, and being near him was comfortable. I found myself drifting to sleep, dreaming of that moment I've almost forgotten about until now. The day that man came to the door, the man with my eyes, and for a few seconds, a little girl without a dad had let herself foolishly think he came to save her. And that little girl had been right. The question was, was he just a little too late? Chapter 10 Briar The days following Morris's revelation of who he was to me, I had a hard time acting like I hadn't just found my long-lost dad. Well, sometimes. He was better at acting like nothing changed between us than I was. He was as rude and arrogant as ever. If anything, he'd gotten worse and I spent most evenings trying not to pull my hair out. Though he didn't get me to try to astral project into his mind anymore, mumbled something about how once was enough. For now. Nyala did her best to distract me, but we were nearing finals, and she was busy with her schoolwork. We all were, which meant for several nights that stretched into a week, and then another, none of us could keep an eye on Carter, or were able to stay up all night looking into the necromancers, the missing students, or finding another way inside that damn cathedral. I even had to say goodbye to my nightly meetings with Zack. He was worn out from the intensive training Woods was putting him through. And me? Well, I was mentally drained from everything. I was clearing off my desk one evening, readying for another long night of studying for my classes, when I came across a slip of paper with a few words scribbled on it. What is this for? Huh? Nyala asked, glancing up from her textbook. Nothing, just found this slip of paper. Oh, crap! The name of the text that kept popping up? I knew I'd written it down somewhere, but between Morris and classes? I'd never texted it to Zach. I scrounged for my cell, ended up knocking half my books and notes to the floor before I found it, and typed in the message, ensuring I spelled it the way it was written on the paper. Then I pressed send. There, maybe now we'll get somewhere. Or hit another dead end. Nyala said. Now who's being the pessimistic one? She grinned brightly as she said, Guess you were rubbing off on me. I agreed with her wholeheartedly. We were no closer to answers than before spring break. I tapped my fingers on my phone as I read over the textbook in front of me. I gave up after ten minutes when I kept reading the same paragraph over and over again. Finally, my cell dinged, and I saw the message from Zach. He asked if I was sure of the title and when I responded I was, he called me. You're absolutely sure, he asked. Yeah, unless I wrote it down wrong. Why? Nyala perked up, and I put Zach on speaker so we could both hear. Necro modis xylom. That's what you have written down, exactly? I glanced at Nyala as she picked up the slip of paper, both of us frowning. Yes, what is it? That book is not supposed to exist, that's what. It was supposedly destroyed centuries ago when necromancy was first banned. Well, then, it's not a big deal, right? If it's destroyed, maybe they were just referencing it or something. Zach, what is this book exactly? It was written by the warlock who first discovered necromancy, and if it's being mentioned in later documents about necromancers or their activities, there's a chance that book is still around. Wait, are you saying you think it's here? No, I don't know what I'm saying, he answered but I knew he was lying. I'm going to text my brothers and let them know, but don't worry about it. 
Don't worry about the necromancers possibly having the first ever written book on how to perform necromancy while there are undead wandering around and people disappearing and being murdered. I rambled. Oh yeah, sure. I'll add it to my list of things not to worry about. Silence met my rant, and I thought he hung up. But then he asked me to take him off speakerphone. Nyala whistled, but I ignored her as I did as he asked. I put my phone up to my ear. What are you doing? he asked. What do you mean? You can't lose it, remember? You know everyone is watching you, waiting for you to mess up, so whatever mental breakdown you're about to have, wait to do it when I'm around, all right? So I can make sure you don't set the dorms on fire. Please? His tone wasn't chiding, but I could imagine his scowl as if he stood right in front of me. You're right, I'm sorry. I just... I'm not sure how much more I can take, you know? Why don't we agree to meet tomorrow night, then? Can you keep it together till then? I rubbed my forehead, angry at myself for lashing out at him, when I knew he was just as stressed out as I was. Yeah, sorry. Don't worry about it. I understand. Believe me. It'd be easier if I could have a happy reunion with my dad instead of still wandering in the back of my mind if he's really with the bad guys instead of the good guys. Nothing from your brothers on him yet? I hated how desperate I sounded. Nothing. Try not to think about it at all tonight, and I'll see you tomorrow. Deal? Deal, I replied, and hung up before I bit his head off again. I tossed my phone on my desk, and then face-planted on my bed, wondering if I could keep it together for one more night. Zack squeezed my hand as we walked, dragging me to a slower pace. Briar. Sorry, this whole dad thing is throwing me off more than I expected it to. We were on our second lap around the lawns. We started at the cave, but I'd been too anxious to sit down for long. Zack suggested we take a walk so I could clear my head. Instead, I'd been ranting for the last half hour at least, with him barely able to get a word in edgewise. When I glanced over, expecting him to be annoyed, he was smiling. You think this is hysterical, don't you? I accused, tugging him to a stop. Morris being your dad? No. But you're ranting? Yes, I find that quite amusing. Hadn't realized how much you were holding back. I let my head fall against his chest, his chuckle vibrating through me as he held me close. It would just be so much easier if I could have it out with him, you know? Tell him everything I'm feeling instead of playing the stupid game of how to keep Briar safe by not letting the world know she's my daughter, you know? I said, suddenly lifting my head and almost hitting him in the chin. I think he's proud of me, too. I saw it on his face yesterday. He has the nerve to show me how proud he is of me, but can't do anything else. He hasn't even officially apologized. Zack put his hand at the back of my head and pressed my face to his chest. Deep breath before your head explodes. My head is not going to explode, I mumbled against his shirt. Just, why did it have to be now? Because life is never easy, young grasshopper. I looked up and caught him trying hard not to smile. Then he failed and started laughing and I joined him until we were cackling together on the lawn at three o'clock in the morning. Thank you. You're welcome. For what? He asked as he took my hand and we started walking again. For not thinking I'm crazy. Well, you are, but to be fair, this life of yours would make anyone crazy. What the hell are you doing? I grabbed him by the shirt and dragged him down into the bushes, then threw my hand over his mouth. He was still trying to talk until I turned his head making him look at what I saw coming out of the dorm building. We were close to it, but thankfully hadn't been spotted. Carter, I breathed, and he's not alone. Look. Mike? You know him? Zack nodded as we watched Carter and this Mike guy exit the dorms and move around the building. He's a bit of a loner, and Carter's been talking to him a lot lately. You don't think? I started to say, then stopped as we both got up to follow. I expected to hear them talking, but Carter wasn't saying anything, and Mike followed along behind him as if he was sleepwalking. I wanted to get closer and see if his eyes were open, but Zack held me back. We started a silent argument over what to do about stopping Carter from taking Mike, but then we were at the cathedral, and it was too late to do anything. There was a blinding flash of white light, and they both were gone. What do you think's going to happen to him? I asked. Nothing good. Damn it! He paced angrily back and forth in front of the doors that we couldn't get through. At least, not physically. What if I go in? You can't, remember? 
Not me physically, me mentally. I could maybe astral project myself inside. No, too dangerous. I was already moving closer to the doors. We don't have a choice. We need to know what's going on inside this building. And now he's got a student. Want to take bets on whether or not Mike will be missing tomorrow? You're not going in there. What if you get caught? Then I'll be thrown back into my body and we'll have to run. I found a soft patch of ground near the cathedral, out of sight of anyone coming out, and sat down. Zack was still arguing with me when I closed my eyes and felt myself slip out of my body. Zack's voice cut off suddenly, and when I opened my eyes, I was inside a building. It was dark, but there were flickering gas lamps hanging from the ceiling farther away from the entry. I waited, trying to hear anything, but there were no sounds. I had maybe thirty seconds if I pushed myself. Walking fast, I took in as much detail as I could, and jumped, throwing myself backward into a wall when I saw Carter. I waited for him to attack, but he simply stood there against the opposite wall, eyes wide open and staring. But no one was home. His shoulders sagged, and his jaw was hanging open, as if someone forgot to close it for him. At least that answered one question. The seconds ticked by. I moved deeper into the cathedral and came upon a staircase that went down. A strange, mournful howling started, and I considered rushing down to get a quick peek, but then I heard a man's voice up ahead, and it sounded like it was somewhere in one of the rooms. Classrooms, I'd bet. I crept closer and peered around the doorframe. There was a fire roaring in a hearth. Mike stood close by, appearing not to have any idea what was going on. And beside him was a man in tattoos, wearing a robe. They were hard to make out in the flickering light, but that was not Dresden. It was someone else. And then it hit me, and I let out a gasp. Immediately the man turned, and I pulled myself back into the hall, covering my mouth with my hands. Who's there? The man called out. Do we have visitors? Do come in. My feet started to move on their own, and I grabbed hold of whatever I could to stop myself from going into that room. Come on! I whispered to myself. Why wasn't I back in my body yet? You will come here, the man insisted loudly. My body lurched forward. Just as I was about to be tossed in the doorway, I felt myself thrown out of the cathedral and slammed back in my body, sucking in air. Are you insane? Zack yelled as soon as I started to get to my feet. Shroud! We have to go, now! He didn't say another word. Together we took off sprinting across the lawns, not stopping until we were back in his quarters. I dropped onto the couch, fighting to catch my breath as he sat down on the floor. What were you thinking? He snapped. Just because you're dealing with some shit does not give you the right to be reckless with your life. Got it? I saw Mike, I gasped. They did something to him. He wasn't really there. I saw the war on his face, debating if he should yell at me some more or tell me to go on with what I saw. Finally, he waved me on. I closed my eyes, working at remembering every tiny detail I could. Carter, he's definitely not alive, I told him. He was just standing there, like a doll. His skin looked weird, too. I thought back to his slack jaw and those eyes. They looked like beads someone glued onto his face. There is some dark magic that deals with creating humanoids out of earth and water, Zack explained. I never thought that that's what he could be with that aura, but at this point, it seems anything is possible. What else? There was a man in there, tattooed and robed, just like Dresden. Zack sat up straighter when I got up from the couch and paced around the living room. Did he see you? No, well, almost. I cringed, waiting for the lecture. Zack sucked in a breath, but the words never came. He was trying to drag me into that room. Is there something like compulsion magic? Yeah, also deemed as dark magic, since it's going against someone's free will. And there's a necromancer here with that ability? He scratched his head and thought, he must be the one controlling Carter, getting the students to go with him. And there's one more thing, I mumbled, not sure if he was going to like this or not. Tell me and get it over with. That eerie howling came to me again, and I shuddered to think what was down there. There was a set of stairs. It was too dark to see down them, but whatever's down there? It sounded like a lot of undead. Like a lot, Zack.
His face paled, and then he was pulling out his cell. I'm texting my brothers. We are not going anywhere near that place again until we hear from them. Got it? And what about Mike? Or any other student Carter takes? We'll have to hope that whatever they do to them, turning them into necromancers or undead, they won't do it until we can get in there. I hated that answer, but he was right, and I knew it. There was just the two of us against a potentially large group of undead and Carter, whatever the hell he was, and at least one necromancer, maybe two. If we tried to go back in there, we'd end up being trapped with the rest of them. And then there'd be no help coming to get them out. Message sent, Zack got up and stood before me, enveloping me in a hug. You broke your pinky promise, you know. What? No, I didn't. He eyed me with a raised brow. I sighed, all right, just a little. Just a little. You projected yourself right into an unknown situation. But on the bright side, I got inside the cathedral, I pointed out, beaming up at him. He pursed his lips as he muttered, doesn't excuse the fact you still did it. We need answers, but I will try not to do it again. Promise. I stayed safe in his arms for a while longer, until he told me I should get some sleep. Finals were only a few weeks away. And no matter what was happening, I still had to pass my classes if I wanted to stay at Academy. He walked me back down to my dorm, kissed me goodnight, and waited until I was inside before he walked away. My protector. I just hoped it wouldn't come down to Zack actually having to risk his life to save mine. It was two days after I was inside the cathedral when I was finishing up what turned out to be a relaxing spirit training session. Morris hadn't joined us and Woods had me focus mostly on meditation and fine-tuning my basic spirit summoning skills. After Woods left me, I was enjoying the nice afternoon weather, sitting on the bench by the summoning circle, when a shadow fell over me. Ms. Shroud? Morris said. I inwardly groaned. General Morris, what can I do for you today? I did my best to keep it civil, though I wanted to scream and yell at him. There are rumors circulating, he said his tone barely above a whisper. I froze. You need to watch yourself. Be careful who you trust here. The game is changing. Hard racing, I swallowed the lump in my throat and subtly nodded. Events are being set in motion that I can't stop. What's happening? Certain parties are preparing to make their play, and I need to know you'll be careful. Who can't I trust? Hook? Hook is safe. I've known him for years, and despite my anger toward him for allowing your sister to be taken, he's a good man at heart. Ivan is the unknown. Steer clear of him and that damned cathedral. I will not have a second daughter disappear on me. That's an order. From a general or from a father? I flicked my gaze to his. The gold flecks seemed to brighten with his inner fire for a moment. Both. For what it's worth. I'm sorry. He cleared his throat loudly, and the moment was gone. I'll be sure to pass your lack of progress to my peers. They will not be pleased. Right, whatever, I snapped, glancing around the lawns. No one was near us, so I risked reaching out and stopping him from walking away. Are you in danger? I whispered. His eyes narrowed slightly, and I sensed that was a yes. There's nothing you can do to make up for it, except try harder, Shroud. Like I've been telling you, I expect to see high marks on your finals, or we will be discussing your future more in depth and it may not be here at Academy. He stormed off like he did after every conversation. Except this time, his words left me wondering if I had found my father only to lose him again. Now I knew one thing at least. We could trust Hook. If Morris trusted him, then there was no reason to think we couldn't. Not that I was about to go spill everything we'd learned to Hook. He was being kept in the dark, and I realized Morris was doing it to keep the headmaster safe from whatever was happening at Academy. If Ivan was the one behind it all, then there was a chance Hook had no idea about the undead being harbored under that old cathedral. And Morris was in trouble. I texted Zack, telling him exactly what Morris told me, and he said he'd pass it along to his brothers. Whoever these necromancers were, whatever they wanted, our time was running short to stop them. Chapter 11 Zack Morris's warning regarding something about to happen stayed on my mind, as did what Briar had seen when she projected herself inside the cathedral. But no word came from my brothers, so we sat and waited, 
doing what we could to watch Carter at night. No other students disappeared. Worse, no one raised a fuss about Mike. I went to Hook's office, figuring if Morris thought we could trust him, he should at least know that one of his students vanished. I waited outside the alcove for it to open. If he was there and wanted to talk to me, he'd open it and let me in. Otherwise, it would stay closed and I would just have to come back later. Or never. I paced outside for ten minutes before the stones grumbled, and when the doorway was fully formed, I hurried through. Hook was at his bookshelf, his back toward me. Sphinx lay on his desk, her tail twitching lazily, eyes watching me intently. Zachary, what can I do for you today? I would have thought you'd be busy studying for finals. They're fast approaching, he said lightly, without turning around. Mike Growler, have you seen him lately? Hook's hand was reaching for a book, but stopped. Mike? Yeah, I saw him hanging around Carter, and now, for the past few days, I haven't seen Mike at all. It's like he just up and disappeared. This again? Hook sighed and finally faced me. The anger I'd felt from him toward the beginning of semester was gone, and now there was just annoyance. Zachary, have a seat. I planned on standing until he finally answered me, but he arched his brow, so I sat. Mike has left Academy. Wait, what? When? And why would he leave two weeks before finals? Sadly, there has been an incident at home involving his family. I wasn't given too many details, but all the required papers were in order. He has left Academy, and I'm not certain if he'll be able to return. No, that couldn't be right. None of the other students had left in such a way. He changed, I muttered to myself, sinking in my seat. What was that? Ah, uh, nothing. Sorry, Headmaster. I was just worried about him is all. You worry about everyone, Zachary. It's one of the reasons I enjoyed having you here all these years. Even these past two semesters, he added with a mischievous grin. We all get into trouble at some point or another, but I am happy to see you have turned yourself around. Even Miss Shroud is more focused on her studies. He nodded, more to himself than to me, I thought, as he clasped his hands on his desk. I know this separation has been hard on you both, but now that you're going to graduate, you two can have a chance to figure out your relationship safely away from Academy. You're not worried about her burning anything down? I asked, genuinely curious to know what he thought. No, Morrison Woods tell me she has greatly progressed in her skills and her emotional state. I believe she has matured and understands how powerful she can be if she's not careful. Now, he said brusquely, was there anything else I could help you with? No, Headmaster, that was it. Thanks, and pass along my sympathies, or if the Growler family needs anything, if my family could be of assistance. I will be sure to let them know. Good afternoon, Zachary. I got up slowly and left. The alcove immediately shut behind me. Mike was gone. As I walked slowly through the main building, I checked all the faces I passed along the way, counting off names in my head, of whom from my fourth-year class was unaccounted for. It was hard to do with everyone spread out during the day, but when dinner rolled around, I did another check and asked Hunter about three other students I couldn't find. David was sent away because he was sick with some infectious disease, Hunter told me, but the others I haven't seen since before spring break. Four total, I whispered. Carter's taken four students total. Mike might have been the last one. Or not, there's still a couple of weeks left, Hunter reminded me. I want to get inside the cathedral. Hunter glanced a wary eye around us before he said, I've been looking into breaking wards, and there's a chance that by using all the elements, we might be able to overload it. But the second we do, whoever's inside will know we're coming. We're missing an element, I pointed out. He was air. I, of course, was spirit. If Nyala came along, we'd have water. And Briar was fire and spirit. But we had no earth. Unless one of my brothers showed up, we were short. I was thinking Briar's double whammy of summoning might be enough to counteract it. We could try, I guess. Don't have much of a choice. So it's a go, then. I still wanted to hear back from Nick and Luke before we charged headfirst into what was probably going to turn into an extremely deadly situation. If there was more than one necromancer in there using compulsion, and a small army of the undead, 
The four of us would not be enough to keep it contained, let alone get in and back out again, without losing one of us in the process. We'll wait a few more days, I finally decided. See if Luke or Nick get back to me. Good call. Man, can you believe finals are so close already? Then we're out of here. I heard a familiar laugh and shifted my gaze to Briar and Nyala a few tables away. Yeah, can't believe it. I'd be graduating and leaving Academy, leaving Briar behind. If we couldn't shut down the necromancer's operations here before I was gone, she would be left to face it alone. I wasn't ready to accept that, but I doubted I'd be stationed here for my first two years. My brothers needed my help figuring out who murdered Dad and Addie. I was torn between trying to find a way to stay and needing closure and understanding on who was behind the disappearances and the murders. I already knew Briar would tell me to go. She understood. Didn't make me feel any better. She'll be fine, man, Hunter assured me. She's tough. Too tough for her own good, I mumbled, but he was right. Briar could take care of herself if the need arose. And all I could do is hope it never did. The day of Briar's finals for fire and spirit summoning arrived. They were both the day before mine. The night prior to her finals, she'd been a nervous wreck. This training was twice as intense as last semester. It didn't help that Morris was going to be overseeing both exams, and he expected her to astral project herself to wherever he directed, and then into his mind again. I found my way out to the lawns around late afternoon to watch her when her turn came. Most of the other students were already gathered out there, either to watch if they'd already finished, or to practice their summoning for when their time came. All written exams had been completed by the end of yesterday. Today was all the physical finals. There's your girl, Hunter said when I found him in the crowd. She going next? Briar was pacing back and forth outside the perimeter of stones that had been set up for the fire summoning final with Professor Taps. How could you tell? He teased. She's got this. Once she gets in there and starts, she'll be fine. Taps finished with the current student, and he left the square. Briar Shroud, Taps called out. She stepped into the square, set her stance, and tipped her head, indicating that she was ready. Fire appeared in Taps' hands, and the two began the final. Briar had been clumsy her first semester, her fire wild and uncontrolled, but today she was the most graceful fire summoner I'd ever seen at Academy. Each move of defense or offense she made was elegant and smooth. Her fire obeyed her without any hesitation and stayed well within her control. I glanced around and smirked when I saw I wasn't the only one impressed. A few students even appeared sheepish, probably thought that she would have lost control of her summoning and started a fire that would put many at risk. This was clearly not that girl. At the end, she pulled her fire back into her hands. Taps beamed proudly. I think she passed. Hunter said as he joined the other students in clapping and cheering her on. Briar looked up, surprised, but smiled and thanked everyone as she left the circle and made her way across the lawn to where Woods awaited her. Most of the students followed, watching, and more came over when Morris stepped through the crowd to stand beside Woods. Briar didn't even pause this time. She stepped right inside the stone circle and began. Morris did not make a move until Woods had put her through her paces using spirit summoning. When Woods completed those tests, he stepped aside and allowed Morris to take over instruction. I couldn't hear what he told her, but she tipped her head at whatever the instruction was, then closed her eyes. The crowd of students and professors gathered quieted, waiting. Briar's body twitched, and then several people gasped when they saw her standing behind Morris. The arms I had crossed to keep my hands from nervously fidgeting while I watched fell to my sides. Damn, I whispered. Briar had not only astral projected, but she had done so wreathed in her fire. The sight was incredible, and Morris turned all the way around to face her, then nodded in approval. She disappeared and was back in her own body again, shaking out her hands. Did you know she could do that? Hunter whispered. No, she said she'd been practicing, but no, I told him, stunned to see it in person. I waited to see if she would astral project a second time. But then Morris opened his hands and two flames came to life, flickering in his palms. He began to move them around his body, like a shield. Briar seemed to focus on those flames, and I expected her to pull them away, 
But then she was a fiery vision as she projected herself through the air and snatched them away, her physical body not moving an inch. She took Morris's fire as her own, and when she returned to her body, those flames were in her control. She extinguished them, then staggered back a step, clearly exhausted from the exercise. Is that it? Hunter asked, sounding as in awe as I was. I was more worried than awed, truth be told. She told me a bit about what Morris was having her do, but this was beyond what I'd pictured. She was going to burn out if she kept using so much power so fast. I doubt it. Look. Briar was sitting on the ground in her meditation pose, and Morris mirrored her. She's going to astral project into his mind, I whispered to Hunter. Is that safe? She's done it before with him. Guess he knows what he's getting into. The headache I had after she tried with me lasted almost a week, and it had been the strangest sensation. I'd expected it to be unsettling, having her inside my head, but instead I'd felt a weird warmth, almost like she was hugging me without even touching me. I hadn't been able to describe it, so I hadn't told her that part. Now, as I watched her, her shoulders sagged and her head hung low, Morris, on the other hand, went completely rigid. His head fell back, his jaw went slack. I wouldn't say it was pain he felt, but definitely not comforting as it had been for me. Then he started to shake. I glanced at Briar and noticed her doing the same. I was about to step in and make her pull back, worried she was going to hurt herself, but then she gasped and Morris held his head, grunting in pain. Is that good or bad? Hunter asked, confused. Briar shook her head as if to clear it. Morris unsteadily got to his feet. He grunted once, then left the circle. Briar let herself fall backward to the ground, but she was smiling. I'm going to say she passed that one, too, I said, breathing a sigh of relief. My feet nearly took me to her, but Hook and Ivan were out there watching, too, and we were so close to getting out of here without any trouble from them. I wanted to keep it that way. Nyala rushed to her instead, laughing and hugging her as they celebrated being finished with their finals. One more day of finals for me, and then it would be a few days of rest, followed by graduation. Just a few more days. Once Briar was on her feet, she met my gaze and I smiled at her proudly. As soon as this was over, I was taking that girl out on a date, one she deserved to have since we first met. Just a few more days. Just a few. Ready? Woods stood across from me in the summoning circle the following evening. Aside from Briar, I was the only student with spirit summoning, and the last to take his last final exam. I'd forgotten how many students were currently at Academy. Every single one of them stood outside on the lawns, watching. No pressure. Yeah, right. I took a deep breath in, then out feeling spirit welling within me and already spreading across my body like a second skin, waiting to be used. Ready. There was no warning before the first attack from Woods came. It nearly rocked me off my feet. I returned the favor in kind, and though our attacks weren't visible as the other elements' attacks were, each hit we landed was clear enough from our being shoved off balance or knocked off our feet. My blocking may have been impressive to Briar, but she'd never really sparred against Woods when he wasn't holding back. My shield crackled along my right arm, making me vulnerable when Woods charged at me and landed a punch, followed by a spinning kick to my chest. I barely managed to stay on my feet. I threw my hands out to my sides before drawing them into my chest and thrusting them outward against Woods. The shockwave tossed him head over heels, and I used my energy to form a cage around him before he could even rise to his feet. He sat up and tested it gingerly. When he burst out laughing, I let it drop, and he got to his feet, brushing grass and dirt from his pants. I must say, I never thought you would master that move. He held out his hand for mine. Congratulations, Zack. You will, of course, continue your training with the military, but you have become a damned fine spirit summoner. All thanks to you. No, this is from your hard work after all these years. I look forward to seeing what you accomplish next. He held on to my hand a moment longer, chuckling to himself about the student surpassing the teacher, then left me to go speak with Headmaster Hook, who was nodding at me in approval. Briar was there too, 
and she was cheering the loudest as I held my arms up and took a bow. I'd done it. I'd survived my final semester at Academy. All that remained was to walk across that stage and receive my official papers, declaring I was a certified spirit summoner. That and finding out where I would be placed for my two years of service. Now that the last final was completed, it was time to celebrate in the hall. There'd be music and food for the rest of the night, and students would spend the next few days anxiously waiting to hear about their grades, and those of us who were leaving would be notified of our placement. Hunter tossed his arm around my shoulder as we followed the crowd of students toward the main building. We're finished, completely finished with this place, he exclaimed. Can't believe it. Trisha should be proud of you. You bested Professor Flick in your final. That she will be, and she will never hear the end of it. Ready for a night of crazy fun? I spied Briar a few groups ahead of us. Hunter noticed I was looking at her. You know, I doubt Hook is going to keep up that rule any longer. I mean, the semester is technically over. Technically, I agreed. But that doesn't mean he can't turn around and make her suffer for it next semester. I can wait until later. I was more than ready to spend the entire evening stuffing myself with too much food and not having to get up in the early morning for classes. My cell vibrated in my pocket, and I pulled it out, expecting a text from Briar. But instead I saw Luke's name. Hang on, I told Hunter, and separated myself from the crowd. He followed close behind, a worried frown on his face. What's going on? It's from Luke. I opened the text and scanned the message. Shit. Shit what? Zack! Morris, I whispered, looking up and skimming the crowd. I saw almost every other professor, but I hadn't seen Morris all day. Where is he? Hunter craned his neck. Not sure. Haven't seen him since yesterday, actually. We need to find him. Now. Why? What's going on? I showed him my cell. That's why. All the message said was they were on to Morris, and we needed to find him ASAP. Hunter's eyes were wide. You don't think. I realized he was thinking exactly what I was thinking. He frowned. What are we going to do? We need to try and find him first. I'll text Briar, but we still have a couple of hours until dark. We might not be able to get together until then, but for now, the four of us could fan out and at least try to track him down. I wanted to be wrong, but my gut told me if Morris was in danger, as Luke just informed me, then there was only one place he could be. The cathedral. With Carter and whatever other villains were hiding out there. Briar texted back that she and Nyala would check the grounds while Hunter and I stayed here and scoped out the main building. I told her please be careful, and then nudged Hunter as I recounted the plan. You know, I haven't seen Ivan in a few hours either, Hunter pointed out as we moved away from the noisy hall. Morris is a tough guy, but Briar said one of those necromancers was using compulsion. Ivan could use it too, I guess, he said with a shrug. I'll check the top floors. We meet back here? Deal. He took off for the stairs, and I poked my head in every room with an open door, searching for any sign of Morris or Ivan. Their quarters were on the upper floor of this building, where all the professors stayed. Getting into that area would be far from easy, since they had the same security, if not more, than the student quarters. I was about to finish looking on the main floor when my cell went off. Shit. I stared at Hunter's message, telling me to get my butt upstairs, fast. I ran, ignoring the few curious looks I received from other students, until I was up in the professor's quarters. Hunter? I whispered, not wanting to get caught snooping around up here. He poked his head out of a door near the end of the hall from a room reserved for guests of Academy. We have a problem. What? How did you get in there? The door was cracked open. He stepped aside so I could see. I poked my head in the door and froze. The room was trashed. Furniture smashed and overturned. There'd been a fight in here of some kind. But how had no one heard? Most of the professors would have been taking care of their students today, so I supposed it was possible. Maybe. I walked in a few steps and cursed when I saw a pool of blood on the floor in the corner. We are not too late, I stated firmly. We can't be. If he was taken out of here beaten up and bloody, someone would have seen it. Well, he's not here. Ivan could have gotten him out. I almost guarantee it. 
I held up my cell to text Briar, but what was I going to say? We were in her father's room and there were signs of a struggle, and someone had lost a bunch of blood. Before I could do anything, she was already messaging me. I grimaced. Briar and Nyala found a trail of blood out on the lawns. I glanced out the window. Damn, it was getting steadily darker. Did she say where it leads? He asked as we exited the room. Yeah, the cathedral. We were outside on the lawn a few minutes later. A few moments longer and I'd be able to go to Briar. You ready for whatever we're going to find in there? I asked Hunter. You and Briar got to have all the fun last semester, right? I like to have some of my own thanks. Undead and necromancers, I reminded him. His face paled slightly, but he shrugged. Can't be any worse than Trisha on a rampage, right? I'm going to tell her you said that, if we survive. Should we get Hook? I thought about it, but at the same time I remembered how he treated Briar and me after we told him the truth of what happened in the catacombs. He hadn't believed a word, and if I went in there and told him right now that General Morris was in trouble, he wouldn't let us put ourselves in danger. He'd call in more military for backup, and by that time, it could be too late. Or worse, he'd tag along and we'd lose him too. Ivan was still an unknown as far as who he was or what he was capable of. No, we'll go in there, find Morris, and get the hell out. Sure, sounds simple enough. Yeah, it does. You know it's not going to work, right? Just start walking. I shoved him along so we could meet up with Briar and Nyala as soon as night officially fell over Academy. Chapter 12 Zack Briar grimaced. This is not going to end well. That's what I said, Hunter noted. I punched him in the shoulder. What, just green with your girlfriend? None of this sounds like a good idea. What else did you have in mind? I asked them both, as Nyala smirked. The second we burst through, they're going to know we're here. And then what? Are you ready to take on an army of undead? Briar asked hotly. Are you? Morris was her father. She might hate the bastard right now, but she was not the kind to wish someone dead. I reached for her hand felt it shaking, so I squeezed it tighter. She had proven time and again how strong she was, and I had faith she would use that strength to get through whatever came after us the second we were inside. I really hate zombies, by the way, she muttered. I kissed the back of her hand. Then let's get inside, find Morris, then get out. With any luck, the undead army will give chase, and then Hook will see what Ivan's been doing under his nose all these years. No one seemed to agree with my sentiment about being chased by the undead, but there was no use standing around out here all night. I was ready to tell them to start the attack when the ground began to vibrate beneath my feet. Zack, Briar said quietly, looking around. What is that? I don't know. A strange humming sound accompanied the shaking. Before I could tell them to back away just in case, there was a bright flash of light. A sharp ringing in my ears cut off everyone else's yelps of surprise. I blinked a few times, trying to clear away the black spots left over from the flash, only to discover we were standing in the foyer of the building we'd been ready to break into. Well, should we thank the necromancer for bringing us into his house of doom, or start screaming and running for our lives? Hunter asked quietly. Flickering light from gas lamps hanging overhead was the only source of light down a long stretch of hall. Doors ran along each side, and two more halls branched off, disappearing into voids of complete darkness. He was down there, Briar told us. The necromancer was standing just right here when I was here last. So was Carter. He's not now. I wasn't sure if I could have handled seeing Carter's form standing there, waiting for us. Stick close together, move quietly, and Hunter, for the love of God, Do not scream at every little thing. Why do you point me out, huh? I didn't answer him as we started forward down the main hall. I focused on creating a shield surrounding my body and felt a short burst of wind, letting me know Hunter was preparing himself for an attack too, just in case. Briar was walking in lockstep with me, and we crept past each open doorway, peered carefully inside, and once we saw it was clear, moved forward toward the only doorway that had some light filtering out of it. We were a few feet away when Nyala screamed. We turned around, but she was gone. Just gone. 
and her scream trailed away down the hall. Nyala! Briar shouted, starting to go after her. You don't know what grabbed her, I argued, tugging her back. She pulled on my arm, trying to get free. We'll find her! Hunter? He'd been standing right beside me, but now there was no one there. I stared at the floor, squinting, trying to see anything, a trail to follow. The dust was disturbed, and there were drag marks as if Hunter and Nyala had been knocked off their feet and yanked away. I held tightly to Briar's hand as we stood back to back, me facing the front doors and her facing down the hall. We stay together. I'm not letting them take you. She was trembling, or I was, probably both. A chilling cackle resounded down the hall, surrounding us. What is that? Briar's voice shook. A shuffling set of steps accompanied the cackle. Several sets, actually. Zack? I don't know, I whispered. I couldn't see anything in the darkness. It's too dark. I can set the hall on fire, she suggested, and her hands warmed in mine as she drew on the fire. Just as I felt the flames ready to burst to life, she was torn away from me, screaming. I tried to run, but something held my feet, keeping me right where I stood. Briar! I thought I heard her yell, but then nothing. No sound at all. I'd always enjoyed being a spirit summoner, but what I wouldn't give now to have control of some flames to light up this entire place, top to bottom, and burn out the undead. I grunted as I yanked on my feet and fell forward, flat on my face, as soon as whatever had held me suddenly let go. The cackling started up again, high-pitched and crazed. Did we owe Zachary fall down? Carter, or at least the thing made to look like Carter, mocked. Here, let me help. His booted foot slammed into my stomach and flipped me over onto my back, knocking the air from my lungs. I gasped at the pain struggling to create a shield to block some of his attacks, but then another kick threw me into the stone wall, and I thought I'd be sick from the dizziness and pain of my head hitting it so hard. Concussion and broken ribs. This was a hell of a way to start. You're gonna fail, you know, he whispered against my ear. Might as well give up. I spat at him in reply, unable to do anything else, and he yanked me up by my shirt slamming me into the wall again and again until I couldn't see straight. Sadly, I'm not the main event. Oh no, not for you, Carter informed me with that same high-pitched voice that grated on my ears. I'm just the opening act, he sighed, pouting like he was a kid who hadn't gotten his candy, and then threw me as if I weighed nothing. I tumbled head over heels down the hall until I finally came to a stop. Jackass, I muttered, poking at my sides, giving up on seeing if anything was broken, and struggling to get a shield in place instead. I finally managed, little good it would do me now, and debated whether I should get to my feet or stay right where I was a few minutes longer. I expected Carter to keep up the attack, but when I finally lifted my head and looked around the hall, my heart sank and my gut twisted in agonizing knots. No, I whispered staring at the paintings on the walls, the dark carpet under me, and the runner that my brothers and I had hated with a passion when we were kids. I'm home? My head told me it wasn't possible, but my other senses screamed that I was home, and this meant trouble. The lights were dim, and when I called out, no one answered. Using the wall, I pulled myself up and limped down the main floor hall of the house. Dad's office was at the far end, so he could have a full wall of windows to look out over the lawns and his greenhouse. Light pooled on the carpet from the open doorway, and I heard his voice. My heart jumped at a sound I'd become accustomed not to hearing. But that was Dad, his deep, booming voice as he spoke with someone on the phone. Dad is dead, I whispered to myself, stealing my nerves to face whatever nightmare this was. I was halfway down the hall when a shadow peeled away from the others and slunk toward the open doorway. It wore a robe, and when the figure hit the light, I spied the tattoos covering his head and the beard on his face. No! No! I shouted, running forward as fast as I could. Dad yelled. I heard the struggle, but by the time I reached the doorway, the lamp had been shattered, and a body lay on the floor in the middle of the office.
The white curtains billowed from the wind rushing in through the broken window. I knew what I would see. My eyes locked onto my father's open, dead eyes. Dad, I whispered, and fell to my knees beside him, fighting back the pain of seeing him dead all over again. I'm sorry. I didn't know. That's because you are a failure. I flinched at the harshness of his voice, but the man before me was dead. Zachary, the weakest of my sons. You. I knew you would never amount to anything. Slowly, I turned around. Lightning flashed outside, lighting up the office and the pale, dead face of General Christopher Pierce. I gulped, trying to get rid of the lump in my throat, but that only made me choke until I was coughing and trying to speak at the same time. You... <laughs> you're dead, I whispered. And whose fault is that? I wasn't home. None of us were. That is no excuse. You. This is all because of you, Zachary. Did you ever wonder why you were the only one in our family with spirit? Did you? What are you saying? I asked, confused. He reached down and wrapped his hands around my neck, strangling me as he pulled me to my feet and pushed me into the wall. You are not my son. My eyes widened in shock as his hands squeezed tighter. What? I gasped. You with your spirit summoning and your lack of drive to make anything of yourself. You are no son of mine. I should have killed you long ago. But I'll remedy this failure here and now. His hands tightened impossibly more, and black spots filled my vision. I kicked against him, but it was like he was numb to my attacks. My lungs burned as they failed to get air, and I saw my life ending right here and now. At the hands of a father, it seemed I might not have known all along. Chapter 13 Prior The second the hands released me, I had two fires in my palms, ready to attack. But I was in a room, all alone. A door slammed shut somewhere behind me, leaving me in utter darkness, except for my small flames. I urged them to grow larger, but fear messed with my summoning, and they flickered, almost going out instead. Get it together, I whispered to myself. You got this. You are not going to be scared of whatever's in here. You are a fire and spirit summoner. You are an unbreakable wall of strength. Oh, please. You, my dear Briar, are nothing. No, I muttered, shutting my eyes, scrunching them closed as tight as I could. She's not here. She's locked up. She is not here. Well, now, is that any way to talk to your mama? You act like you don't love me. Why should I? I bit off, still not looking, not wanting to see whatever grotesque figure was going to be standing in front of me. Hot breath on my face made me flinch backward, the air reeking of booze and vomit, a smell I grew up around. You're not real. Oh, I'm not. You know, that mouth of yours is going to get you into trouble. What do you care? Not like you ever acted like a mother to me. A slap sent me falling backward, and the fire disappeared from my hands. My face burned, stinging from the hit I hadn't seen coming. I shook out my head in time to receive a second one, striking my other cheek just as hard. You ungrateful little bitch, she snapped. You do not speak to the woman who raised you in that manner. Why the hell not, huh? I yelled back not about to break down. What did you ever actually do for me? Another slap had me spinning all the way around. I was blind in this room, and each time I tried to summon a flame, another hit was there to throw me off balance and stop the fire from forming. I focused on my breathing, taking the shots as they came while listening closely, trying to pinpoint where she was coming at me from. There was the sound of a slide of a foot across the room, and I ducked at the last second, feeling her hand just miss the top of my head. She screamed in rage, but the sound was not human. 
whatever this thing was, sounding like the mother who hadn't wanted me. It was not her. I repeated that to myself each time I started to second guess, and with each time I felt my fire and spirit growing stronger within me. She got a few more hits in, but I dodged and spun out of her reach, until finally two large flames engulfed my hands, lighting up the room. What do you think, dearie? The figure before me said, the voice that had been Mom's turning into something much darker, filled with malice. Do you like your present? I spun in a slow circle, shaking so badly the flames threatened to go out on me again. You are strong, I said, even as the figure, pale and sickly, clearly one of the undead, started to laugh. And then the ten others or so, all surrounding me, joined in. You are an unbreakable force that does not bend, that does not give in. You are a weak, pathetic girl who has nothing, the undead spat. I ground my teeth and shut my eyes, not wanting to see them any more. I am an unbreakable force. I will not break, and you will not defeat me. Zack, Nyala, and Hunter needed me now. I couldn't stand here and do nothing. The fires grew larger and larger until they encompassed my entire body, and spirit grew with them, covering me in a fiery shield that pushed the undead back with terrified shrieks. I opened my eyes, and the undead drew back further, scrambling over one another to get away from me. The one who had the nerve to try to act like my mom was frozen in fear, and as I drew closer, I saw my flame-filled eyes glaring back at her. Smirking, I held my hands out. Who's up for some barbecue? I let my flames soar through the room, starting with that first undead. She screamed as the fire consumed her, but she wasn't the only one. The flames spiraled around my body, reaching out for every single undead in that room, setting them on fire. They ran and screamed, but all it did was feed the flames until they were falling over, nothing but burnt heaps and shells of what they had been before. When the last one fell, I pulled my fire back into me and cursed as a wave of weakness overtook me. Falling to my knees, I fought to stay conscious, pinching my arm until I was good, and then clambering upright. Zack, I whispered. Tripping over piles of bones and ashes, I felt my way around the room until I reached a door. The hall outside was dark, but I recognized it as the main one we'd walk through. The urge to call out for my friends bubbled up until I realized whoever set up this nice little trap might not realize that I'd broken free. I could only imagine what everyone else was going through. I walked faster as my strength steadily returned, though I wasn't sure I'd be able to call on my fire any time soon. I paused when I passed by the dark abyss that led downstairs to what I assumed was the basement. The cathedral was too large to search every room. If I was the necromancer in charge, where would I take the other prisoners? To the basement. Wasn't that how all evil people thought? Yeah, this is good, I whispered to myself. Just gonna walk down a set of dark stairs with no idea what's at the bottom. Probably lots of undead, but hey, could be worse, right? At least it's not dragons or goblins or something else. Oh no, it's just zombies. I moved down the stairs one at a time, attempting the entire way to bring a flame back to life in my hand. But all I managed were a few sputtering sparks. Eventually I found the bottom and tried to hold onto the wall to guide my way around. But then my hand stretched out into nothingness. I stumbled backward, wanting to keep the stairs close by at least. Then I lost them, too. I froze, not wanting to take another step. The shadows closed in around me, pressing on my senses, muffling sounds and tricking my eyes, thinking I was seeing people standing in front of me. I opened my eyes as wide as I could and realized there were people standing in front of me. Nyala? I risked whispering. Nyala? Hunter? I took a few shuffling steps forward, holding my hands out in front of me. 
A lot of good that did me. I tripped, not sure over what, falling to my knees against the concrete floor. My hands felt the arm of someone lying on the floor, and I pulled back with a sharp cry, scooting backward away from it. Now, how about that? A man said, sounding genuinely impressed. I hadn't expected you to break free so soon, if at all. I am impressed. Who the hell are you? I snapped. What did you do with my friends? Your friends? They're here. Fear not. Would you like to see them? Or perhaps you'd like to see the poor person you just found on the floor. I didn't want to see anything right then, but something made a snapping sound, and then one by one, torches burst to life around the room. When firelight hit Niallis and Hunter's faces, I got up and rushed toward them. Guys? I waved my hand in front of their faces, but there were no reactions. Nothing. They can't hear or see you, the man told me. He was close, so close I could have reached out and touched him. Don't worry, soon enough you'll join them, and then you'll either be like me or not. He snapped his fingers again, and more torches came to life, showing me what stood at the other end of the room, and how many. They leered at me with their cold, dead eyes, and I did the only thing I could think of in that moment. I screamed. Chapter 14 Zack Through my gasps for breath, I heard a scream. Prior! How could she be here in my house? She couldn't be here. My undead dad would kill her, too. You're not at your house. This isn't real. I blinked, and the room around me shimmered in and out of focus. I thought it was because I was losing consciousness. But then it did it again, when a second scream pierced my ears. My dad was dead. He'd been dead for four years. And he knew, just like I knew, that I was his son, and he was proud of me. This man, this was nothing more than an imposter. No. This man was a monster. I pulled my legs back, and this time, when I kicked with full force, the enraged man released my throat and fell backward over the desk. I pulled air into my lungs, flinching from the burn, but not stopping. Briar needed me. There was no time to recover. I had to get to her and the others before it was too late. You are not my father, I snarled and clutching my fists together, delivered a hefty punch that sent the man reeling backward. You are nothing more than an undead monster. I hit him a second time, and he sailed through the air, hitting the bookcase. Except it wasn't a bookcase. It was the door, and he burst through it, shattering the illusion around me. I was no longer in my house, but back inside the cathedral. The undead figure no longer looked like my dad and it didn't get up again. I stepped over it and the broken door, waiting for a shout, scream, anything to tell me where Briar was. I moved down the hall slowly, expecting another attack to come at me, but then I passed a doorway with a set of stairs that led down. Briar had said the undead were down there. She'd been sure of it. And if the necromancer was going to take them, where else would he go except the basement? Making sure my shield was back in place around my body, I hurried blindly down the stairs. Light reached up about halfway, flickering as if from candles or torches. When I neared the bottom, I stopped, trying to peer around the wall to see what I was about to face. What the hell? My arms slammed to my sides, and my feet moved all on their own, taking me away from the only cover I had and straight into a scene from a nightmare. And our last unexpected guest of the evening has finally arrived. I glared at the man standing in the center of the room, holding his hand out toward me, the necromancer who used compulsion. His beard was dark and long, and his bald head was covered in tattoos, as Dresden's was. I shifted my eyes, taking in every detail I could. I forced myself to a sudden halt when I saw Briar, Nyala, and Hunter. 
They were lined up on one side of the room, unmoving, their eyes staring blankly ahead. They were breathing at least, but whatever he had done to them had them trapped in their own bodies. Nope, you are not quite there yet, the man said, and my feet jerked forward, not stopping until only a few feet away from him. There, that's better. I wanted to get a good look at you. All of you, really. Who are you? Ah, yes, this is the part where you expect me to do what? Divulge my plan? Sorry, kid, he sighed, patting my cheek as if I were a child. I'm afraid you're not the hero of this tale. Only another victim. Now behave and stay quiet. I was not going to be turned into an undead. I frantically fought against his hold, assuming he had to keep his eyes on me to make it work. But I discovered I was wrong when he turned his back and I couldn't move a muscle. All I could do was look around. To my left was Briar, Nyala, and Hunter. When I glanced to the right, that was where the real sense of defeat set in. In the center of the large open room was a chalked-out symbol, one used in necromancer rituals for summoning but I wasn't entirely sure about the details. Candles formed the outer circle, but it was the unconscious figure inside that drew my attention. General Derek Morris. His chest rose and fell, so he was alive, but I doubted he would be for much longer. His shirt was ripped open, and some crude symbols in red had been painted on his skin. Beyond him, standing in perfect rows, five or more deep, were undead. I'd expected there to be ten, maybe twenty. Wrong again. I stopped counting at fifty. The necromancer walked to a stone altar, flanked by two braziers that had been set up at the farthest wall of the room. A book was perched on the altar. He ran his hand down a page and started to chant. The words were guttural, and the air grew hazy and dense. Zack. I blinked like someone was poking around in my head. I shook it hard, but then I heard it again. Zack, I'm not under his control. Briar. She was inside my head. The necromancer still had his back to me, so I chanced to glance her way. Her eyes were shut. She was astral projecting, but it wouldn't last long. Please tell me you have a plan, I thought. No, maybe? I'm going to try to break his control over you. Just hang on. Before I could ask her how she was going to do that, my head felt like it was on fire. If the necromancer hadn't forced me to keep quiet before he turned around, I would have been screaming at the top of my lungs. I expected smoke to be pouring out of my ears. Suddenly, Briar's presence was gone. My head pounded, but my fingers twitched. She'd burned away the compulsion magic. I was going to have to ask her later how she knew she could do that without melting my brain in the process. From the guilty look I caught on her face as she opened her eyes, she didn't. I scowled at her, widening my eyes in annoyance, and she shrugged. Shrugged, like it was no big deal. It was obvious that move had weakened her greatly. She tilted her head toward Nyala and Hunter. I turned toward them and smiled after they both winked at me before returning to their dead-eyed stare. At least the four of us were free. Now the question was, how do we get out of here in one piece? Briar was doing something with her hands, and I frowned, shaking my head subtly. She rolled her eyes, then mimed a square, and pointed at the necromancer, who was still chanting away as the air grew hazier. I could have smacked myself in the head when it finally hit me. A cage. She wanted me to put him in a cage. I was weak from the attack of the undead upstairs, but capturing the necromancer would be ideal. I looked around again and shrugged one shoulder, mouthing Carter's name. Briar pointed upstairs. Why would he be upstairs while we were all down here? Briar pointed quickly, her face paling, and then she fell back into her statue stance. I did the same just as the necromancer turned back around, still chanting, holding a black bowl in his right hand and a silver dagger in his left. 
he stepped into the circle and set the bowl beside Morris's body. It was now or never. I took a deep breath and pulled as much spirit as I could hold within me. It coated my forearms, readying itself to be used by my hands. The necromancer brought the blade up high over his head, eyes shut, confident that he had not just been bested by us. I could not wait to make him eat that notion. The dagger flashed as he brought it down, ready to stab Morris in the chest. My hands shot out at the last second, surrounding it and the necromancer, preventing him from following through. The dagger bounced off my shield, and his arms vibrated with a blowback, just like Briars always did when she tried to get one over on me. He snarled in fury, but the spirit surrounded him quickly and formed a cage, just as it had done with Woods only a few hours earlier. It wasn't going to hold him long. Whatever dark magic he used in this place had soaked into the floor, the walls, every inch of air, and it was working against me. The undead across the room fidgeted, coming to life, shuffling their feet as if waiting for their chance to attack. Not much time, I yelled. The necromancer opened his mouth to respond, but I hadn't been talking to him. Briar, Nyala, and Hunter charged across the room. The necromancer's jaw dropped. What, you thought we were just mindless students? Please, Briar snapped with that sharp attitude of hers that had so grown on me. How long can you hold him? Not long, I said, gritting my teeth from the strain. I was getting weaker by the second, and the undead were becoming more agitated. I'll be free, the necromancer promised, and as soon as I am, you four are dead. He might not be wrong, Hunter murmured, focused on the undead. The air changed as he raised his hands, moving them in a circular motion, preparing for a defense. Nyala stepped up beside him, though where she was going to draw water from I hadn't the slightest idea. It wasn't like fire that came to life. It had to be pulled from a source. She shut her eyes and held her hands to the sides, palms up. Drops of water began to appear on her fingertips. I stared in awe as she drew water from the air in the room. It wouldn't be a lot, but it could be enough to make a difference. Briar was beside Morris, patting his cheeks hard, and then she hauled off and smacked him across the face. He grunted, but his eyes remained closed. We're going to have to carry him, she told me. Got it. Hunter swirled the air in his hands and guided it toward Morris. With Briar's help, they got him to his feet, still unconscious, and Briar draped one of his arms over her shoulder as Hunter took the other, leaving Nyala as our only defense against the undead. Let's go, Hunter bellowed. I kept the necromancer in his cage as I walked backward, following them toward the stairs. He sneered at me, biding his time. This had been easier than I thought. And a second later, I knew why. Hunter and Briar yelled. Suddenly we were all hitting the ground in a heap. Carter had been waiting on the stairs. He threw himself into us. As soon as my hands dropped, the necromancer was free, and I felt him trying to place that compulsion back on us. Carter had Hunter on the ground, punching him repeatedly, until Nyala jumped on his back and wrapped her arm around his throat. She used the water she'd collected as a whip, wrapped it around his neck, and tugged him backward. If Carter had actually needed air, needed to breathe, it might have worked better. All it seemed to do was piss him off. She yelled as he threw her off his back. The necromancer pounced on me, that dagger slashing toward my face, while unfamiliar, strange words tumbled from his lips. I raised my hand to form a shield, but his compulsion stopped it from getting all the way up, and I had to hit the floor so the dagger didn't end up in my shoulder. I rolled to the side, swiping my leg out at his feet. He tripped, but then he flung his arm toward the undead, and their heads shot up in unison. Kill them! The undead started toward us. I yelled and threw myself at the necromancer, managing to knock the dagger from his hand. It skittered across the floor. Grabbing his head, I bashed it into the floor until he was dazed and bloody. Zack, move! Briar yelled, fire in her hands. I took off running to get behind her. 
Seconds later, she shot fire from her hands to hold the undead back. They shrieked and retreated. Briar's arms sagged from the intensity of the flames licking at the ceiling, almost reaching the far wall. She was on her knees, struggling to maintain them. Hunter and Nyala fought with Carter, dragging him between them. I hurried to help them, shoving Carter as Nyala and Hunter let him go. Carter fell forward into the flames, screaming, swatting at himself to try to put them out, but they covered his body, melting his form, affirming that he wasn't even human. I cringed as his arms fell to the floor, followed by chunks of his face, and turned away before I made myself sick, and ran back to Briar's side. Leave them, we'll run for it, I told her. A good chunk of the undead were on the ground, nothing more than heaps of bones and ashes, but more than half were still ambling around, trying to get to us. The necromancer was getting up, and we were out of time. I grabbed Briar's shoulder and pulled her back with me toward the stairs. You will not escape, the necromancer screamed. You think fire will stop them? The more Briar drew back from the flames, the weaker they became, until the undead walked through the streak of fire that rose barely a foot off the floor. They picked up speed, and I knew we weren't going to make it. I created a shield to block them from us, as Briar fought to create another blast of fire. The undead bashed on my shield, forcing us backward. Just go, I ordered them. I'll hold them off. We're not leaving you, Hunter yelled. I felt a whirlwind behind me that shot outward, throwing a line of undead back. But another group of undead was there just as fast, ready to replace them. They beat against the shield, and through their bodies, the necromancer smiled. But then his smile faltered, and his tattoos grew darker as his skin paled. I had no idea what would scare him like that. Morris suddenly stepped between me and Briar, fire dripping from his hands, his eyes filled with flames of pure rage. The undead weren't bothered by his presence. They should have been. Briar's and my defenses fell at the same time, but the undead barely made it an inch before Morris thrust his hands out and an inferno burst to life, taking down everything in its path. The undead tried to flee, but ropes of pure fire lashed out and dragged them back, scorching them until there was nothing left. Not even bone. Morris stepped forward, the fire moving with him, but he started to falter. Briar reached out and grabbed hold of his right hand, and immediately the flames burned with new life. The entire room filled with flames, and the necromancer was backed into a corner next to the altar, yelling those strange guttural words. Briar and Morris continued to walk forward at a steady pace, a firestorm surrounding them, until all that could be seen were two darker forms within the firestorm's center. I never saw the necromancer again, but I heard his scream as the flames devoured him, robes, tattoos, and all. The fire began to ebb, and then with a deafening, whooshing sound, the flames were sucked back into where they'd come from. Morris and Briar stood side by side for a second. Then simultaneously, both of them hit the floor. All three of us raced over. Morris was barely conscious, and Briar struggled to keep her eyes open. Proud of you, Morris mumbled. You're foolish, but I'm proud. Be happy I came to save your ass, Briar replied. Morris gave a coughing chuckle. Hunter and I pulled him to his feet, holding his body between ours, as Nyala helped Briar. There were no more undead in the basement. The altar and necromancer were gone too. Once again, the proof had been burned away. But at least we had Morris, and he was alive. And it's what counted. I hated that we didn't save Mike or the other missing students. I clung to the small chance they hadn't been amongst those torched as we headed upstairs, back toward the main hall of the cathedral. When we were at the doors, we all leaned against the walls, taking a breather. I pushed at the front doors, surprised when they opened. The wards must have faded when we killed the one who cast them. What's the plan? I asked, glancing down at Morris, who was slowly getting his strength back. 
Morris had just opened his mouth to speak when the ground rumbled beneath our feet. The walls quaked next, and we ran to get out of the cathedral as it started to come down around us. I was the last one out, pushing Morris ahead of me as the floor cracked and fell in on itself, as though an earthquake was rocking the cathedral. We dove for the grass, turning around just in time to see it completely fall in on itself, burying anything which might have been left behind. I looked around, searching for who might be responsible, and spied the tail end of a robe disappearing from sight around a grove of nearby trees. Dresden. I'd bet almost anything it had been him. Sneaky bastard. You should get out of here, I told Morris quickly. He looked ready to argue with me. I shook my head. Let me deal with the fallout from this. I'm sure the last thing you want is to have everyone know that you were captured and nearly killed, especially whoever is doing this to you, right? He's right, Briar told him. I can't let you two get in trouble for this. Eh, it was an old building anyway, right? Do you want Hook left in the dark or not? The second he knows what happened to you, he becomes involved, and probably a target, I said. Besides, the trouble from this can't be any worse than when we set the catacombs on fire. He hesitated and reached for Briar, but she stepped away. Whatever moment they'd shared down in the basement was over now. He swallowed hard and nodded. I told him to hurry. The noise of the cathedral collapsing was bound to draw attention. Morris took off, running along the cave wall and staying out of sight as the four of us stood there, bloodied, bruised, and exhausted. One by one we plopped down in the grass as the first few panicked yells met our ears. What's our story? Hunter asked. It was all my idea, I said simply. I wanted to see Briar. We snuck out here, broke in, and then the cathedral just started coming down around us. Think they'll buy it? Hunter said, whistling as he observed the damage. Who's to say otherwise? It's my fault too, Briar insisted. I shook my head. She scowled at me. Why the hell not? It's my last week here. You have to come back in the fall, remember? I can take the heat, trust me. I scooted closer and kissed the top of her head as I drew her in against my side. I shuddered, remembering what I'd seen in there and wondering what everyone else had gone through before we all ended up in that basement. Who was that necromancer? Hunter asked. I shrugged. I don't know. Didn't recognize him. I did, she whispered, from Morris's memories of when Bethany disappeared. He was here? Yeah, he was the one talking with Hook and Morris about her going missing. But I only saw a few minutes of the conversation. They never said his name, and I guess now it doesn't matter. He's dead. Thanks to you and your dad. She shrugged. Whatever, it just... it just seemed like the right thing to do. A few curious students appeared first, and then came the professors, and finally Hook. As soon as he spotted the four of us and the destroyed building behind us, his jaw dropped, and his eyes narrowed, first with worry, then in anger. You four! Are you all right? He demanded when he reached us, leaning in to inspect our various cuts and bruises. No serious injuries, I told him. We, uh, had a minor incident. Minor? He snapped dropping his worried tone as soon as he knew none of us were too badly hurt. The entire cathedral has collapsed! What happened, Zachary? What? It was my fault, I explained. I told him some story about how Briar and I wanted to see each other, and I figured this building would be a good bet. It was empty, and though it seemed unstable, we went in. Nyala and Hunter came along, just to hang out, and we went to the upper floors exploring. While we were there, part of an inner wall fell, and then everything else just went with it. I waited for him to call me out, or to try to blame Briar, but he sighed heavily and pointed at the four of us. You are to get yourselves to the infirmary immediately, so Maggie can check your injuries. And you too, he added, looking at Nyala and Briar. Know that when you see a restricted zone on campus, it is there for a reason. You have three more years here, and I would hate to see you in another unfortunate incident like this. 
Zachary, honestly, you should have known better. Sorry, Headmaster. Don't apologize to me. You could have gotten someone hurt or killed. Off with you now. We did as he said, and I thought for half a second I was going to get away with no real punishment. Until Hook called my name. I told Briar to go ahead and waited as Hook walked toward me. Headmaster, though I can appreciate your need to see Briar and believing the semester and therefore your time at Academy to be over, you are still under my roof and my rules. Once Maggie says you are released, you are to report to the crypts and remain there until graduation day. Do I make myself clear? My hands curled into fists at my side. I'll do as you say, sir. Good. You cannot go through life without being held accountable for your actions, Zachary. Remember that. He waved me off. I heard him talking to the other professors that it was about time to rebuild the cathedral, now that it was just a pile of rubble. Briar had waited for me a few yards away, and I quickly brought her up to speed on my punishment. Seriously? But you're finished, she complained. It's fine and it's just me. Let it go, please. She scowled. I should take the blame, too. You're not going to suffer in the crypts alone for almost a week. You think Hook's going to have us down there together? I took her hand to stop her maddening pacing. Look at me. She tilted her head back and forth before those dark eyes finally settled on mine. What? I grinned, and that just made her angry face even cuter. She punched me in the arm. I grimaced, rubbing the sore spot. It's a win, Briar. Morris is alive. The undead on campus are dead. And the necromancer is gone. That necromancer is gone. But what about Dresden, or the rest of the undead, and missing students? I'll be able to do something about that soon, I hope. Speaking of which, I guess I should text my brothers and let them know we made it out alive. I was reaching for my cell when she wrapped her arms around my neck and pulled me down for a kiss. I started to pull back and then remembered I was going to the crypts anyway. Might as well make the trip down there worthwhile. I kissed Briar until we were both out of breath. Chapter 15 Briar Zack spent almost no time in the infirmary before Maggie cleared him and then Woods was there to escort him down to the crypts. I was angry with him, really. I should be down there, too. But he refused. He wanted to suffer alone. Hunter was released the following morning with minor cuts and bruises. Nyala was let go the following afternoon. Each morning I woke up with a headache, and Maggie would cluck her tongue at me in worry. Maggie, you're killing me, I pleaded. I'm fine. You are not. You look like you haven't slept. The wound on your arm still needs time to heal, and your consistent headache is starting to make me concerned for what you did to yourself. She stared me down, but I crossed my arms and kept my lips shut. Fine, keep your secrets. But until your head stops hurting, you are not leaving my sight. I slumped against the pillows, ready to endure another day of boredom, when I heard a furious woman's voice yelling outside the room. Maggie frowned at the door, but after five minutes of the voice getting louder, she huffed about inconsiderate people and stormed out. I spotted Hook and a woman I didn't recognize before the door closed again, cutting off my view. I picked at the bandage on my arm, knowing it was overkill, but since this was my second time in here, Maggie seemed to treat every tiny cut like it was going to kill me. The door opened again, and I expected it was Maggie, so I didn't look up. Did you tell them off? I asked her. Tell who off? My fingers froze on my bandage, and I lifted my head. General Morris, what are you doing here? His face was far from the hardened man who had visited me in this very room last semester. Briar, I wanted to see how you were holding up. I know the past few days took a lot out of you. Yeah, so? Please don't make this any harder than it already is. I laughed harshly. Seriously? You have the nerve to say that to me after all this time? You're the one who knocked Mom up and then left me, I hissed quietly. Did you know she was an addict? No, you don't understand. Your mother was a kind, loving woman, he said quietly. 
The woman I found you with was her sister, not your mother. She died, giving birth to you. I blinked at that information dump and felt my heart plummet. What? I was away on a mission, no contact with anyone for over a full year. By the time I came back, all I knew was your mother, Meredith, had died and had been gone for several months. I hadn't... I hadn't even known she was pregnant. I'm so sorry, he whispered, wiping at his eyes. No one seemed to know except her sister, and she took you away. She never liked me, and since I didn't know, she assumed I would never find out. But when you found me, why didn't you take me back? I sounded like that younger version of myself, pining for a father who never came. Or who did, and left me there anyway. I wasn't around enough to raise you or to introduce you to this world. I saw the strength in you that Bethany had, that your mother held on to. I had faith. That's it. You simply knew I'd be fine? He opened his mouth to say more, but the door opened, and Maggie stormed back in. All right, that's it. First people yelling in the hall, and now you. No more harassing my patients. Out, General Morris. Briar needs her rest. Of course. See that you listen to Maggie, he instructed me. I smiled, completely fake, of course, and waved. He lingered for a moment longer, but I turned away from him, fighting back my own tears at knowing my real mother was dead, that I'd never even had a chance to meet her, and that the horrible woman who raised me was an aunt who couldn't have cared less about me. Maggie tucked my covers in and told me to sleep. I didn't expect to, but learning that new information wore me out, and I fell asleep. Is that her? I heard a woman say and opened my eyes. Ah, good, she's awake. Really, this is quite inappropriate, Maggie was saying. What's going on? I asked as I rolled over and sat up, staring at a woman with a face pinched in anger. This is Mrs. Pierce. Maggie said, sounding uncertain. She said she wants to check on her son's girlfriend while she's here. But if you don't want to talk to her... The smile Zach's mom gave me was far from friendly, but I sensed she was not going to go away easily. Yeah, it's fine, I told Maggie. It'll give me a break in the monotony of being here. Maggie frowned and glanced at the clock on the wall. Ten minutes, Mrs. Pierce. Not a minute more. I'll give you two some privacy. She walked to her office and disappeared inside, closing the door firmly behind her. For a long moment, we simply stared at each other, Mrs. Pierce and I. So you seem to have stolen Zachary's heart? She started, and the forced, far-from-friendly smile fell. I'm not sure I'd go that far. We're just dating. I said, proud of myself for not snapping at her. Yet. We like each other, and we hang out and all that. I'm not sure what the problem is. The problem is that Zachary was an exceptional student at Academy until this year. And? I asked, bristling at her tone. I think you know exactly what I'm going to say. What, that it's my fault? I shook my head. Unbelievable. Why is it my fault? You are responsible for the fire in the library, not Zack, she hissed. And you are the reason he's currently in the crypts. Master Hook told you two to stay away from each other, and you refused. Now my son is suffering down there, alone, while the real culprit in all of this lies in the infirmary. I gripped the blanket in my fists to stop myself from accidentally astral projecting inside her head. That, or setting her hair on fire, I couldn't decide which would be better at this moment. You can think what you want, but I don't have to explain myself to you. I don't want to hear it. I came to tell you one thing. Stay away from my son. Your son is an adult. And I am his mother. You stay away from him. You are nothing. No family name. No connections. You can only bring Zack down. 
I almost let slip that General Morris was, in fact, my father, but bit it back just in time. I can't promise you anything. You will do it. Or what? You can't do anything to me. You don't scare me, lady, so get over yourself. Maggie! I'm warning you, Ms. Shroud. I'm very high up in our government, and I will make your life hell when you graduate from here if you do not stay away from him. She threatened. Maggie rushed out of her office. I think we're done, I snapped. Right then, out you go, Maggie said without any hesitation. Remember what I told you, Mrs. Pierce added, before she stomped out the door, slamming it shut behind her. Well now, that sounded like a nice visit. Briar, you all right? Yeah, fine, I mumbled, and hunkered back down under my blankets. I'm going back to sleep. I heard her bustling around the infirmary for a while as I tried to get to sleep, but it wouldn't come. Zach's mom was right. Everything he'd been through this year was my fault. I did this to him, and I wasn't anyone special. It was just me, the forgotten daughter from Texas that no one wanted. By the time sleep finally did come, I had tears streaming down my cheeks, and I'd stopped bothering wiping them away. I managed to make Maggie think I felt better, and she released me, telling me to get some more rest. Instead, I was headed to the crypts. Since Hook lifted the ban on Zack and my being able to see each other, on account that Zack ended up in the crypts, and Morris vouched that I was stable in my abilities, I didn't care who saw me heading for the entrance to the crypts. My head was killing me, but I gritted my teeth against the pain and stormed through the main building, ignoring the curious stares I received from the other students. Where I would usually turn to the right to head to the hall, I made a left and walked down a narrow hall that led to an even narrower set of stairs. The gas lights turned to torches down here, and the cold of the mountain sank into my bones. But I didn't care. I was going to see Zack. He would get out tomorrow for graduation, but Hook refused to let him out any sooner, which meant he would go to the ceremony straight from being in that horrible, cold and dirty place. I was angry at Hook, but I was furious at Morris for going along with Zack's plans to take the fall for what happened, and being the only one punished for it, when we'd almost been killed. Again. All to keep me from getting in trouble and ending up in the crits or worse, or from the real bad guys figuring out who I was to Morris, or that Morris was not playing by the rules of their game anymore. Though I had a feeling Morris was nowhere near letting anyone take me away, not after what we did together in the basement of the cathedral before it crashed down around us. At the bottom of the stairs, a hallway opened up into what was known as the crypts. Rotting dead bodies lined the walls and filled every little pocket alcove running underneath the entire campus. Zack could be anywhere down here, and no magic worked past the doorway. A doorway that wouldn't let me pass, since I was not supposed to be down there. Zack! I bellowed, my voice bouncing off the stones and bones. Zack! I yelled and yelled, waiting each time to hear if he was coming or not. My voice was starting to go hoarse when I finally heard him yell my name in return. I stopped yelling long enough to hear footsteps, and finally, a bouncing torchlight appeared in the darkness, lighting Zack's face. His blue eyes were bright from the fire, but he did not look happy to see me. What are you doing down here? It's freezing, he said, stopping short of the doorway. I was coming to check on you. Maggie finally let me out of the infirmary, I told him checking over his bruised face the best I could in this light. You know, we really should stop ending each semester in that damned infirmary. You're mad, he noted. I scuffed my boot along the stone floor. What gave you that impression? Briar, it's only one more night, all right? And then that's it. I'm out of here. Yeah, I know, but I should be down here with you. You have any idea what this does to your reputation now? He shook his head and looked at me like I'd suddenly sprouted a second head. Why do you think I care about my reputation? Briar, I did this to try to make your next three years here better. 
we all almost got killed again. All I care about is that you make it out alive. I can take a few days down here. Maybe I care about your reputation. Did you think about that? I picked at the bandage wrapped around my forearm, wishing he would just let me be angry, even though, in truth, I wasn't furious with him. Shroud, look at me. I huffed and shook my head. Shroud, he said softly, and that made it worse. I lifted my head and hated the tears I felt burning in my eyes. It's nothing, really. Morris finally told me about my mom. My real mom. She... she died. And he never knew she was pregnant. My spiteful aunt stole me away. Not what I expected to hear. Briar, I'm so sorry. I longed for him to wrap me up in his arms and hold me. Is that what you're mad about? I shrugged, not sure if I wanted to bring up the other issue that made me so upset. He frowned, started to ask me what was going on, then hung his head. My mother's here, isn't she? Yeah. And let me guess, she cornered you and told you to stay away from her son. Is that it? I wouldn't say she used quite those words, but yeah, something like that. He came as close to me as he could until the invisible barrier stopped him. He lifted his hand and pressed it against the shimmering blockade. Come here. I did as he asked and raised my hand to his. It's fine, really. She has to look out for her son. She had no right to say whatever she said to you. Maybe she's right. I mean, I'm not exactly the best person to be around. And with Morris being my long-lost dad, I have no idea what's going to happen next. I do, he stated sternly, and my eyes locked onto his. I am going to graduate, and then I'm going to be off with Nick and Luke, hunting for our dad's murderer. When I'm not doing that, I'm going to be visiting my girlfriend in Silent Heights and taking her on actual dates while making sure she doesn't get herself taken away by necromancers or the military or whoever else thinks they can get to her. The confidence of his words touched me, and I wished I was strong enough to burst through this barrier and get to him. Do you believe me? he asked. Always, I replied without hesitation. I'm sorry, I just... I care about you a lot, you know? And if anything happens to you because of me... I was going to get dragged into this with or without you, he reminded me. But as awkward as it might sound, I'm happier with me in this. Me too, I said, sniffing hard to hold back the tears that wanted to fall. Someone has to look out for your ass, right? Keeping you from doing something stupid because you're always running off getting yourself into trouble. He laughed with me for a moment, and the tension in my shoulders faded. Just have to get through one more day, and then I'll be out of here, and we'll figure out something for the summer. Your mother is not going to let me stay with you. Who said I have to stay with her? He said. I have plenty of money saved up to get a place for a few months. Like, what, move in together? I asked, surprised. He laughed again. Unless you wouldn't want to. I never said that, I said in a rush. I just, that's a big step. You sure you can deal with me 24-7? His smile was warm, and he pressed his hand harder against the barrier. I'll manage. Get back up there where it's warm. I'll be fine down here for one more night. Got plenty of friends to keep me company, he said with a grimace. See you at the ceremony, I promised, and after a few more seconds of gazing into his eyes, I managed to turn myself around and head back up the way I'd come. Hey, Shroud, he called out. I glanced over my shoulder. Don't set your feet on fire without me around. I rolled my eyes and turned back around, knowing Zack would be the only guy I'd set my feet on fire for. I laughed to myself the rest of the way back to the main floor and on toward my quarters. Chapter 16 Zack Hook came down to the crypts an hour before the graduation ceremony was to start and removed the barrier. Go get cleaned up, he told me without so much as a friendly shake of the hand. The ceremony will start in an hour, with or without you. Thanks so much, Headmaster, for everything. 
I said with the brightest smile I could muster, then jogged all the way to the dorms. They were empty, and I took a two-minute shower, threw on my dress pants, matching shirt, and snatched up my shoes. I was sprinting down the stairs, grinning at the look that would be on Hook's face when he saw I made it on time, when I ran right into a warm, soft body. She yelped and then wrapped her arms around my neck. I smiled as Briar kissed me. I returned in kind until we were both breathless, and she was pressed up against the wall. I was just coming to check on you, she said when we broke apart. I've got five minutes. Perfect. I kissed her deeply, but we had to get going. With her hand securely in mine, we hurried out of the dorms and across the lawns, where the chairs and the stage had been set up for the graduation ceremony. Good luck. Briar stood on her toes to kiss my cheek. I'll see you after. I watched her find a seat beside Nyala, and then spotted Hunter, waving his hand wildly over his head, to get my attention. He pointed to the empty chair beside him. I hustled over, squeezing my way down the aisle of other students, and sat. He leaned over and took a whiff of me until I shoved him away. What? Had to make sure you didn't smell like rat. You know, I meant to tell you, I think I found you a new girlfriend down there, I told him. A few of them, actually as long as you like naked tails and sharp, nasty teeth. Just my type. Is it now? I'll be sure to let Trisha know, I said. He smacked me upside the head. What? Not funny, man. She's here, too. He spun around in his chair, and I followed his gaze. Trisha laughed as she watched the both of us. He turned back to me. At least we survived to make it to this day. Did you doubt us? Oh, man, you have no idea, he said. We both quieted down as Hook took to the stage, Ivan behind him, all our professors, as well as a few of the usual generals. Surprisingly, Morris was not amongst them. Good afternoon, friends, families, and of course, our students and staff, Hook announced, starting the ceremony. It brings me great pleasure every year to announce the names of our graduating class. They have all strived throughout these last four years to make it to this most historic moment in their lives, and I'll be the first to say the journey of your lives is far from over. His gaze lingered over the students before it landed solidly on me, and I stilled in my chair. The true adventure is just about to begin. Are you ready? I held his gaze. I was more than ready for whatever came next. Now then, our summoning professors have several awards they wish to hand out. And we have a speech from General Higgins and Master Bellevue, who has been so gracious as to come to our graduation today. Hook stepped away from the microphone, and the boring part of the ceremony began. But as each person came up and said their piece, Hook's eyes continually found their way to mine. And each time, I met his eyes, glance for glance. Two and a half hours later, I had my diploma in hand, stating I'd graduated as an official spirit summoner and aura reader, and I would be moving on to a two-year service with the same unit my brothers served in, the Talons. The eagle seal was printed in the bottom right-hand corner, and I ran my fingers over it, knowing Dad would have been proud to see that. I'd hoped Luke and Nick would have made it, and after we were dismissed by Hook for the last time, I followed the other students out of my row and came face to face with both of them. They looked at me long and hard, then Nick whooped and pulled me into a bear hug. Luke followed right after. Finally, our little brother is all grown up, he teased, pinching my cheek. You ready for the real fun to start? Nick asked, leaning in close. We've got a few leads, as we needed to start checking them out. And by the way, nice job rescuing Morris. Killing a necromancer in the process. Couldn't have done it better myself. Thanks. Are we leaving right away? I searched the crowd for Briar. No, you've got a few days, but we'll be calling on you soon. I'll be ready, I promised Nick, then inwardly groaned. Mom came over and hugged me tightly, kissing my cheek with a loud smack. Hi, Mom. I'm so proud of you, she exclaimed, wiping a tear from her eye. Even after the mess you made of this last year, 
You managed to graduate at the top of your class and are part of the Talons now. Your dad would be thrilled. Nick and Luke made faces behind her back, and I assumed they'd either overheard her scolding Briar, or she'd told them herself. The old me, who believed everything was right in the world, wouldn't have said anything. But times had changed, and I was not that Zack anymore. The mess I made, I said slowly. What's that supposed to mean? Oh, you know, sweetie, we talked about this, she said, trying to laugh it off as she brushed imaginary dust off my shoulders. If you're talking about Briar, I'm going to ask you to be really careful if you ever want to talk to your son again, I warned. She froze. What did you say to her, huh? You're so naive to think this is all her fault. Everything that happened? She laughed nervously, louder this time. Zachary, really? It's just a phase. She's not the right girl for you. I think I'll decide that for myself, if you don't mind. It won't matter anyway, she said quickly when I started to walk away. You're going to be with the Talons for the next two years. There won't be time to keep up a relationship with her. I'm not worried about long distance, and neither is she. Zack, please, I'm only trying to look out for you, she insisted, grabbing hold of my arm. That girl has been nothing but trouble since she was assigned to you. I almost told Mom right then, almost spilled everything we'd found out about Dad's murder and the undead, the necromancers, the fact that Briar herself was the daughter of a general. But I couldn't. Nick and Luke said they did not want Mom involved. They were worried she'd end up dead next. Gently, I pulled my hand from hers, and I said I'd see her at the house when I came by to pack up my things. I hated to see the hurt in her eyes, but she should understand better than anyone that we didn't choose who we fell in love with. And I knew how much I cared about Briar. That wasn't about to change. Hey! Briar jumped into my arms to hug me when I met up with her and Nyala. I'm so happy for you. Can I see it? I showed her the diploma. I'll officially be assigned to my brother's unit. She traced her fingers over the pattern. When do you have to go with them? She asked without looking up. Not for a few days at least. Maybe more. I assured her. Good, that's good, because you owe me a night on the town, remember? Yeah, and I need a few days to find a place in Silent Heights. Actually, I didn't get a chance to tell you before the ceremony started, she said, and reached into her black tote bag, revealing a large manila envelope. Open it up. Tell me what you think. I opened it and pulled out several pieces of paper, but there was something heavier in it, and I dumped it out in my hand. Keys. Just read the letter. It was handwritten and short, but it got the point across loud and clear. General Morris had set up an apartment for Briar in Silent Heights, paid in full for a year so she would have a place for the summer and winter breaks, and whenever she needed a weekend away from campus. All he requested was she meet him there tomorrow afternoon so they could talk. I held up the keys and jingled them as she cringed. You have to go, Shroud. I know, but you're coming with me. I will, but I'm not getting in the middle of whatever you two have to say to each other. I tucked the keys in her palm and shoved the papers back in the envelope. Come on, there's cake in the hall, and you look like you could use some cake. And ice cream, Nyala announced loudly, taking Briar's other arm. I grinned as Briar relaxed a bit. And ice cream. What do you think I am, a barbarian? I said. The three of us, my brothers in tow, went to try to enjoy a normal evening for once. Chapter 17 Friar The apartment building was next to the diner on the main drag through Silent Heights. The building was cute, all brick and stone with ivy crawling up the sides. From the looks of it, there were only four units, and they were pretty decent size. According to the papers in the envelope, I now had access to a two-bedroom, two-bathroom apartment with a full-sized balcony. 
It had been recently upgraded, and under normal circumstances, I would have been jumping for joy at having my own place. Shroud, Zack said quietly behind me. You going to go in or stand out here all day? I'm getting there. It's starting to rain, he pointed out. That's thunder rumbling overhead, too. All right, all right, I murmured and moved toward the inner courtyard of the building. Two sets of stairs flanked it, and I glanced around for my apartment number. It was the one to the left, and after another deep breath, I walked toward it, my bag on my back, with everything I owned in it. Zack was a steady, comforting presence behind me, and the only thing stopping me from turning around and bolting. You sure I should do this? I asked when we reached the door. Zack handed me the keys in answer. He wants to talk to you. I think you can give him that much, right? Sometimes I hate you and your voice of reason. He jingled the keys in front of my face again, and I took them. Hands shaking, I put the key in the lock and opened the door to my new home. My home. All mine. The door swung inward to an open floor plan with tons of natural light streaming in from the wall of windows and the sliding glass door. The kitchen was tiny, but not a galley at least, and it was already furnished. Not exactly my taste, but then I'd never really had a chance to figure out what my taste was. I took a few steps in after a gentle nudge from Zack, and froze the second I saw Derek Morris, my father, standing in the center of the living room. Briar? His smile was shaky. I was worried you weren't going to come. I almost didn't, I confessed, and dropped my bag on the floor by the wall. So what is this supposed to be? The apartment? Yeah, you know, I didn't ask for anything from you. I know, which is why I'm doing what I can for you, since... since I wasn't there before. I nodded slowly. And you think an apartment is going to make up for you not being in my life? Or for all this shit you put me through this last semester? Shroud. Zack whispered from behind me. But Morris raised his hand. No, she's right. I deserve all your anger. And I don't expect you ever to forgive me. In his official military uniform, he fiddled with the beret in his hand. All I wanted was for you to have a space of your own. A place you could come and feel safe. A location where I know you'll be looked after. What's that supposed to mean? I know the woman who owns these apartments, he explained. She promised to help me watch over you. I was pissed at him, but hearing that, knowing it meant he wasn't going to be around on campus next semester, made my chest tight. I rubbed at it absently. Right, you have to go back to your headquarters. This case is far from solved. If anything, it's only going to get worse. I want these bastards to know they failed in their attempt to kill me. A Morris doesn't go down easily. Are you sure this is a good idea? I asked, worried. He was my flesh and blood, after all. You never said who snagged you at Academy. I never saw a face. I opened my door and a figure in a robe rushed in. We fought, and then the next thing I knew, I was waking up to an army of undead, trying to kill my daughter. He shook his head sadly. I was not going to watch you die he added in a whisper, and I won't leave you unprotected. Well, you trained me, right? I can look out for myself, I assured him, annoyed at myself for seeking any sort of praise from this man. He smiled lightly, but it didn't last long. I know you can. It's why I pushed you. Your sister was exactly the same as you, by the way. Bethany. She was a rebel, a fighter. She never gave up either. And then, he struggled to speak, and I said it for him. Then she was gone. I wish I could stay and tell you more about her, but I'll visit as soon as I can, if you want me to, of course. Seeing me is not a requirement for you to have this place. Yeah, no, that'd be nice. We awkwardly shifted on our feet, neither one of us able to meet the other's eyes. After a few minutes, he set his beret on his head and squared his shoulders, all general again. Right then, I'll let you get settled. My contact information is on the kitchen counter. If you need anything, Briar, please call me. Should I start going by Morris? 
I asked as he walked past us to the door. My question stilled him, and he sniffed loudly, not turning around to face me. As much as I would love to tell the rest of the world you're my daughter, I fear it would only put you in even more danger. I'll check in with you soon. Zack, he said, and shook his hand. Look after her when you can, too. I will, sir. You have my word. Then Morris was gone, and I was left holding two sets of keys to an apartment I never expected to have. I guess the woman who owned the building let Morris in. Slowly I walked around the open area and let out a huge sigh of relief. That could have been worse, I suppose, I muttered, flopping down on the oversized black couch. It's a start, and this place is pretty nice. Yeah, not too shabby. Thunder rumbled outside, and rain pattered the windows lightly. Outside this apartment, my life was about to become even more of an unknown than it was when I first stepped off that plane and met Zack. When I started my first week at Academy. Next semester, I'd be without Zack, or my, without Morris, to watch over me. I'd be left with Hook and I then. At least Carter, or whatever had been Carter, was officially dead and buried. I'd expected some fallout from his disappearance. But Hook told us he dropped out for personal reasons. Whoever ran this conspiracy knew what they were doing, covering their tracks. Too bad for us. We could use a slip-up from them. What are you thinking about? Zack asked as he walked over. I held out my hand, pulling myself up with his help. Too much, but I've decided something. Oh, shit, now what? He teased. I picked up the second set of keys, took his hand, and laid them in his palm. I want you to hold on to these. I can get my own place, he started to say, but I shook my head. You said you were cool with moving in together. There's two bedrooms, two bathrooms, and this way, whenever you're around, we have a place to come to. Our place. After sneaking around all last semester, I think we both deserve this, right? He set the key down on the kitchen counter and wrapped his arms around my waist. Yeah, yeah, we do. I rested my head against his chest, listening to the steady beat of his heart, mixing with a continuing rumble of thunder as the storm rolled in. Together we walked to the patio door to watch the huge dark thunderclouds coming in and blocking out the snow-covered peaks of the mountains. With each strike of lightning and answering call of thunder, I felt our time to be together growing short. And not just that. A fight was coming one that was worse than what we had to deal with so far. I held on to Zack for a long, long time, content to see the rain run down the windows and pool on the patio. Too damn soon he'd be gone, and I'd be alone. Would they try to come for me then? Was I really as strong as they all thought? Strong enough to keep myself alive? Guess I'd just have to wait and find out. And waiting was the worst part. End of Book Two This has been Cathedral, Academy of Ancients, Book Two. Written by Avery Cross. Narrated by Jack Ainsworth. Copyright 2018 to 2020 by Avery Cross. Production copyright by Avery Cross.